Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 1 Two years had passed since the end of the Fourth Great Shinobi War. This war was aptly named the World War because it was devastating in both material and human terms. Indeed, villages and cities were completely destroyed, resulting in the death of thousands and even tens of thousands of people. The world was thus subjected to an outpouring of violence and destruction to satisfy the ambitions of people who claimed to be able to bring only one thing, peace. But what was this much-desired peace? A reality? A dream? A utopia? Was it not a tacitly approved masquerade between leaders and nations? To give people the illusion that all was well, that they were safe and could prosper without fear. Didn't the powerful of this world wave the banner of peace to camouflage the corruption and fraud that plagued their internal operations? So that they could acquire even more power, at the expense of the weakest? How many small countries were crushed by a larger one in order to keep a certain stability in the eyes of other even larger countries? One thing was certain, the world had known peace because war had taken place, suggesting that peace was only a state of rest, of latency and preparation before the next conflict broke out. After all, it was said, who wants peace, prepares for war. When the Fourth Great Shinobi War came to an end with the cancellation of the Mugen Tsukuyimi the Eye of the Moon plan, the nations directly involved felt the sense of peace that is characteristic of the end of armed conflicts. This feeling was even more intense because for the first time in the history of the ninja world, the major elemental nations had joined together under one banner, the Grand Shinobi Alliance. But was this true peace? Was it really the same on a global scale? In reality, only those who had been on the battlefield had any idea of the ins and outs of this conflict. So it only concerned the shinobi of Hai no Kuni, Mizu no Kuni, Kaminari no Kuni, Kaze no Kuni and Tsuchi no Kuni. But for the rest of the world, it lived as if life had never stopped. The Eye of the Moon plan had only plunged those affected by the technique into a paradise of eternal illusions. And in the meanders of their sleeping minds, some malicious individuals had discovered what a life of vandalism, debauchery, brutality, rape, and pillage could be, a life where they were the masters of the world. For some daimyo, they were probably able to return to the Muromachi period, where all the provincial wars had been won by their military and economic power, crushing all their opponents. This technique was a real danger because the border between reality and illusion was very thin, so much so that many people did not know the difference when they woke up. Some bandits had gained a lot of self-confidence, letting their brains define a utopian scenario that they were sure they could implement. But all of them ended up being disillusioned by the return to normality, to a daily life where they were far from living what their mind had wanted them to believe. But for how long would the world remember this conflict? As for the civilians, they could not fully understand the horrors of the war because it did not reach them directly. The battle that had just ended was so brief, like a blitzkrieg, that it was difficult to compare it to previous great wars that had lasted for years. Ordinary citizens did not have time to grasp even a fragment of why there was a shinobi alliance. The shinobi were the ones who would remember the conflict best and the lessons that could be learned from it. But how long would it last before it was forgotten and relegated to legend? Human beings are capable of learning from their mistakes, but few are wise enough to learn from the mistakes of others. This generation and the previous one had known misery, suffering, fear, famine, betrayal. They knew the meaning of sacrifice. But will it be the same for the next generation? This last one who will never have known all this pain and will want at some point to discover it. If it was proposed to all the people who had known the horrors of war to affix a seal of finjutsu to them so that they would no longer feel the emotional suffering caused by the conflicts. What would they do? They would accept and be more than gratified for making their lives more pleasant. But only because they didn't want to go through all that horror anymore and because they had learned from it. But what about the next generation? The one that had only known peace and had the same seal affixed to it. They would turn against the government, saying that it controls their emotions, their feelings, their free will. This would lead to a revolt of the people which would inevitably lead to war. This pattern is nothing but an endless circle that will always lead to hatred. That is why, although the shinobi world was currently at peace, it could not be final. 
It was as fragile as Madara Uchiha's eternal Jinjustu, because it was based on a lie. Two years earlier, Hagoromo Tsutsuki, also known as Ricket Senmin, was sitting cross-legged and levitating one meter above the ground in his white kimono. He watched with pain as the two young men went off to fight once again, perpetuating the cycle of hatred once more. After a slight sigh of fatigue, he turned to the other two people who were equally distraught at the knowledge that their comrades were going to fight. I'm sorry my child that you had to witness this, the old hermit said as he made a graceful hand movement towards Sakura's chest, right where Sasuke had stabbed her with his rinnegan a few moments earlier. A soft glow of green chakra came out of it, soothing the pain that the previous technique had caused. Kakashi Hataki, please come closer and lie down on the ground please. Kakashi didn't dare contradict the man and obeyed. Despite his injuries he lay down on the ground with difficulty and as soon as he was settled he felt exhausted. He could not determine the reason for this sudden feeling, perhaps it was the result of the fatigue accumulated during the last days, or the adrenaline which simply did not work anymore. Perhaps it was related to his new acquisition of the Sharingan and its excessive use lately, or even a combination of all these reasons. Whatever the reason was that was hitting Kakashi, it was making his eyelids extremely heavy. Moreover, the peaceful voice and words of the wicked Senin had the same effect as a lullaby. Don't worry about your student's young Hataki, history keeps repeating itself and I know that Naruto will convince Sasuke to back down. As it was the case in the past with my sons, Hagoromo reassured him as Kakashi sank into unconsciousness. At the same time Sakura sat up with a sigh of relief. Even though the pain was noticeably lessening, she couldn't help but put her hand to her chest and massage the site of her old injury as the flow of chakra stopped. Thank you Atsutsuki-sama, Sakura said as she bowed her head respectfully. No my child, it is I who should thank you and I apologize for all that the reincarnations of my offspring are once again doing to this world. Perpetuating once again the cycle of hatred, continued the sage without moving anything but his lips. The latter looked dejected, as if the weight of the world's consequences rested on his shoulders. It's not your fault or your children's Tsutsuki-sama. It's the fault of Madara Uchiha and Black Zetsu, they are the ones who caused this war. The Kunoichi quickly replied, defending body and soul this legendary being of ancient times. This spontaneous reaction of Sakura made the hermit smile inwardly and ask her. And who do you think created Black Zetsu? Madara, she said quickly, sure of her answer. And why do you think he created it? He insisted out of curiosity, pushing the young woman's impulsiveness to the forefront. Because. Because he wanted to destroy the world Tsutsuki-sama. Did you see where he took the ninja world? All these deaths, all this violence, we wouldn't be here if he hadn't wanted to destroy humanity. And he just created a life form that would be in his pay to help him accomplish his dark plans, Sakura was still under the pressure of the latest events. This answer would have suited the hermit well if it was the reality, but it was quite different. So it was with a very tired voice, almost extinct, that the old man continued. Alas no my child, Madara is not the one who created Black Zetsu, he was even abused by him. Zetsu is only the result of the last strength and will of Kagaya Tsutsuki, my mother. Sakura could not help but widen her eyes in amazement at the hermit's first words. She didn't know this part of the story and considering that all the horrors she had just gone through were finally the result of this zetsu, it provoked in her a certain bitterness that could be summarized as, all this for this? But she remained silent to allow Hagoromo to continue. Throughout his existence, zetsu had only one idea in mind, to resurrect mother so that she could recover all the chakra that had spread over the earth. He manipulated both of my bloodlines, mainly attacking the Uchiha bloodline. And for over a thousand years he devised every possible strategy to once again create the conditions for the divine tree to be invoked. Why didn't you prevent this? You intervene here. Then why didn't you destroy Zetsu yourself if you knew all this? Sakura shook her head at such revelations. Because I only understood it now. And I tell you again my child, the reincarnations of my sons were going to clash again, the cycle of hatred going on and on but I had time to analyze and to understand things better. Whether or not Madara was abused, Zetsu still didn't influence him to create his Moon Eye plan. Didn't he? Sakura asked uncertainly. 
Having observed Madara during his lifetime, he is a very proud man who was not manipulable, not as much as Zetsu would have thought. And even if he was considered crazy in his ways, Madara Uchiha was without context a visionary. What? A visionary? Sakura choked in fright at the words. How was he a visionary? He wiped out thousands of people. Started the Fourth Great Shinobi War. Attacked Kanoha twice with the Kaibi. My best friend lost his parents because of this individual, Naruto had a miserable life, because the world took him for the Kaibi. The man I love probably lost his whole clan because of his actions and his evil Sharingan. And on top of that, now that I learn that he was manipulated by an entity coming from your own mother that I myself just sealed with Naruto and Sasuke, I don't understand that you can think that about him. Granted, Zetsu acted as a sort of guide for Madara when he was left for dead at the Valley of the End. But he is in no way the instigator of all the things the Uchiha accomplished in his life before that event. But I will concede this, Madara is responsible for the decimation of the Uchiha clan. Nevertheless, in all his madness, he succeeded where no one else had succeeded before him. What do you mean? He succeeded where all others failed. History will remember the five Kage putting aside their grudges to unite against a common enemy and create the Grand Shinobi Alliance. But the truth is that it was Madara Uchiha who united the elemental nations under one banner. He was one of the first people to want true peace. He just used the wrong method to achieve it, Hagoromo explained as Sakura looked down at this revelation. Long minutes passed as Sakura absorbed the information from the Rikid Senin. She could not help but recognize that he was partly right, if not totally right. History was written by the victors, the details were quickly forgotten and only the result was remembered. And even though it had only been a few hours since they had defeated Kagaya Tsutsuki, the sad truth was there, it had been possible because Madara had hatched this plan and allowed the elemental nations to unite in an attempt to counter it. A warm hand came to rest under Sakura's chin, drawing her gaze to the old hermit. Tell me my child, what would you do if you had the opportunity to be present the day Black Zetsu met Madara for the first time? Asked Atsutsuki while holding out his second hand towards the girl, palm up. Would you kill Zetsu? And let Madara bleed to death? To illustrate his words, the Rikid Senin made a sphere the size of a large plate appear in the palm of his hand. He deliberately chose a fragment of a scene he had seen in the past, Black Zetsu was standing over Madara's slowly dying body. Blood was pouring out of his body, especially from his torso, when suddenly a person who looked strangely like Sakura stepped in and punched Zetsu in the face to get him away from the Uchiha. Or would you guide this man? The scene in the sphere continued showing the pink-haired woman kneeling down to do her Irio ninjutsu. Then this vision dissipated to reveal another place, a man and a woman were standing, each dressed in war armor atop a wall overlooking a valley. They were only visible from behind, one with long black hair and the other with Sakura's typical hair. I'll get rid of Zetsu and let Madara die, that would save thousands of innocent lives, the Kunoichi answered without hesitation as the sphere slowly disappeared from the Rikid's hand. Are you sure? He asked insistently. Of course I'm sure. Without him, there would have been no attacks on Kanoha, there would have been no great shinobi wars. And... And, Sakura began before stopping for a moment, the hermit's words coming back to her. She held her mouth open without a sound coming out, she had just realized what the consequences of such a decision would be. She then blew all the air from her lungs in a sigh before continuing with a disillusioned voice. But there would have been no Grand Shinobi Alliance and the world would probably be in political tension across all nations. Perhaps some of the smaller nations such as Tetsu no Kuni would have been assimilated. That's right, Sakura, perhaps another large shinobi village would have suffered the same fate as Yuzushio. So my child, know that sometimes the actions of a single person can bring about a radical change in the world, Tsutsuki added wisely. But what does it change anyway? We won. If what you say is true, Naruto will succeed in bringing Sasuke to his senses and the peace we fought so hard for will be ours, Sakura said, raising her voice in excitement. However, she didn't get any answer from the old man except for a deep look. He seemed to be judging her with his eyes, as if he was probing the bottom of her soul. We finally have peace. Don't we? Pleaded Sakura, 
who was becoming increasingly worried by the Creator's silence. For how long? Excuse me? Asked Sakura surprised by the meaning of the question. For how long do you think this peace will last? How long before another conflict arises? How long before old grudges resurface? How long before a diplomatic incident arises and recreates tensions throughout the elemental nations? How long before the new generation comes along with ambitions of conquest, war, and new and ill-founded ideals? Asked the old hermit with a harsh tone. So you are saying that all this will have been for nothing? Did all these people die in vain? Shouted Sakura as tears appeared in the corners of her eyes and a lump formed in her throat. The truth is always hard to hear and even harder to accept, said the ricket Sennin. At that moment Sakura started to cry silently and the characteristic sound of leather crumpling was heard as she clenched her hands into a fist. Tsutsuki waited a few moments for the young woman to calm down before continuing, allowing her to sort out her moods and emotions. What is the proof that in the future, Orochimaru Densetsu no Sanmin will not do an experiment that will then be uncontrollable for the world you know? That this same creation will not destroy the entire shinobi world? What is the right solution in this case if it is just a perpetual restart? From what you say, it seems that no matter what man does, history just repeats itself, she concluded in disgust. Some choices can change everything and I'd like to make you a proposal Sakura. I don't expect you to answer right away, but I would like to present you with three possibilities. Whatever you decide, I won't judge you, just take the time to consider them all. I'm listening to you Atsutsuki sama Sakura said, wiping the tears from her cheeks. If it were humanly possible, this is your first choice, you find yourself at the moment when Zetsu saves Madara. You eliminate him and let the Uchiha join the world of the dead, thus allowing for a totally different future. Second choice, you stay here and live in your temporary and illusory peace until the next war. Or if it were humanly possible to return to the past, I would still eradicate Zetsu while saving Madara, Sakura deduced by process of elimination while interrupting the old man in his words. Correct, confirmed the Rikid Senin, satisfied that she herself had formulated the third possibility. But why? Why should I save this man who is only a despicable and bloodthirsty being? Madara is responsible for the eradication of his own clan. Why would I want to save him from death when that's what he deserves? Why should you do that? To guide him to fulfill his destiny, Hagoromo calmly revealed as if it were obvious. What destiny? To bring peace. True peace. The one he has always wanted to bring to the world since he was a child. I am very rarely wrong and I can see when someone is capable of tipping the scales, the sage announced before his gaze was drawn in the direction of the valley of the end. And you are that person Sakura. Large explosions could be heard in the distance reminiscent of the sound of thunder. Chakra residue was also visible to the naked eye. There followed a huge flash of color that flooded the sky for a few seconds, the fight between Naruto and Sasuke was raging as expected from the two reincarnations of the children of the Rikid Senin. Sakura looked in that direction for a moment, worried for the lives of those two people she loved, then she turned her attention back to the hermit still at her side. Atsutsuki-sama. Why me? She asked, doubting the qualities the hermit seemed to have found in her. How many women are able to pursue the man they love all their life despite the bad choices he makes? Asked Atsutsuki without looking away from the explosions. Many women do it because as soon as a woman is in love, she is ready to do anything to follow the man her heart has chosen, answered instinctively the rose. So, but then how many women continue to love the man they have chosen even though he has tried several times to kill them? Sakura was confused. She clearly felt that the man was talking about her and her own life. But after all, that wasn't so surprising coming from someone like him. A few, I suppose, Sakura conceded in a less determined way. And of those few remaining women, how many allowed Kagaya Tsutsuki, the most powerful being since the world began, to be sealed again and thus save humanity? Only one. Sakura finally agreed in a whisper. Hagoromo Tsutsuki hadn't chosen her lightly or just to flatter his ego. And it only takes one person to tip the scales in the right direction, the old hermit concluded. The fighting in the distance seemed to have stopped a while ago, 
the sun's rays had given way to night and a silence settled between the two people present. After a while, the sage of the six paths took out a small leather scroll case from his sleeve and held it out to Sakura. I am not asking you to make a decision right now. But no one thing, two of these three choices will cause you to give up your life completely from here. There will be no turning back. The scroll inside this case will be gone in two years, and remember, no matter what you choose, I will not judge you. I don't think I can, Sakura said in a small voice. She was thinking about her present life, her potential future with Sasuke and the possibility of finally having a happy life with him. Don't underestimate yourself Sakura. However, if you ever agree to go back in time, I advise you to take advantage of the two years I'll give you to prepare yourself. Life in Madara's time is merciless. He then turned to Sakura, a slight smile on his face. He may have been a man from another time, but he was still a man. He knew that what he was going to suggest to her afterwards would make her react strongly, but he had to give her as much information as possible so that she would make the best choice possible. Sakura, you should know that Madara unfortunately never had the chance to know a woman. The kunoichi remained blocked for a few seconds while her brain analyzed the words of the old man. Wasn't he finally senile to dare to suggest such an ignominy to her? Are you really suggesting that I should make this being? This. This monster, fall in love with me. Interpret it any way you want my child, but I also give you this warning, grow up, be more mature, tougher, colder, or Madara will crush you. He has never seen women as beings of interest. Only Mito Uzumaki, who was a special person at that time, had a minimum of his respect. You know you're not selling your business very well Tsutsuki-sama, Sakura said with difficulty containing her sarcasm. Not only had the old man just suggested that she go back in time to change the world, but he was recommending that she make a misogynist fall in love with her. She would still have to find some sentimental interest in this individual that she hated from the depths of her guts. And the idea of having feelings for someone other than Sasuke disturbed the young woman, so much so that she repressed a shiver of embarrassment. It was another time my child. Unfortunately women in those days were considered a mere bargaining chip between clans. It was a way of easing tensions and hiding behind an illusory peace. So that's why I insist, you will have to strengthen yourself, train hard, learn more assiduously, understand the history of Madara and his time, as well as the habits and customs of that period to always be one step ahead of him. You speak as if I had already made my choice. And then. Do you honestly expect me to guide one of the most powerful shinobi of all time? To bring peace to the world? Sakura raised her voice. She was now on her feet and her arms were accompanying her words. How do I know that my choices are the right ones? And how can I convince this man? Because, let's be honest for two minutes, Madara was not the kind of person to listen to anyone but himself. So why would he listen to me? I have a better chance of getting Tsunade-sama to admit that she is old and hiding behind her Jinjutsu is not the answer than getting anything good out of this man. She had come out with this whole tirade without taking the time to breathe, she was currently in a phase of panic and fear. And that was completely understandable, because what was potentially resting on her shoulders was scary and would have scared more than one away. Sakura knew she had to choose between the future of the world or her own death. If you were to face Madara at his peak, I wouldn't even suggest that option. But when you meet him in the valley of the end, he will be at the most vulnerable stage of his life. He will have lost his family, his friends, his clan, his honor, his pride, and most of all, he will be dying and well aware of this reality. While he was saying all this, Atsutsuki gently put his hand on Sakura's shoulder. What will this man see when you appear? A powerful woman, able to kill a being that would have potentially finished him off, a woman who will take the time to save his life. How do you think he will react? He. He'll feel indebted, Sakura conceded, and when confronted with such arguments, she gently grasped the case in her hands. Exactly, and Madara is known to have some principles. In fact, one of his favorite sayings at the time was, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He is an extremely unforgiving man who does not forgive, but the opposite is also true, he always paid back his debts. As the Rikid Sinin finished speaking, the first light of the morning was appearing in the distance. Atsutsuki-sama. If this piece is false. 
What is true peace? Sakura finally asked in a thoughtful voice. Hagoromo didn't answer right away and the young woman saw a gesture she didn't expect to see from the man. He began to stroke his thin beard while deep in thought. Did he himself know the answer to this question? Or would history repeat itself endlessly no matter what one did to change it? It can be obtained in many ways, the old hermit finally answered enigmatically. Atsutsuki-sama, did you? Send me back in time. What you have given me a glimpse of, is that what I will have to accomplish? Sakura asked in order to know what to do or for him to give her a sign on what to do. Answering you honestly might change your choice. What I have shown you may be a mere possibility, an illusion, or even your own future in the past. But if so, won't that create a time paradox? Or an alternative universe? Because if you change the past, the present could never have existed? And so the question would arise how to send you to the past to change this vanished future? So I'm sorry Sakura, but these are questions I won't answer. You have to find out for yourself. If you choose to go to the past, of course. By the way, it's time for us to leave, your teammates need you, he concluded. All right. Don't forget your sensei with you, he will wake up soon, the old hermit added before Kakashi actually started to groan, then to open his eyes. How long was I asleep? The Jnin was astonished as he sat up with some difficulty due to the fatigue of his body. You slept what was necessary for you Kakashi, Tsutsuki said as Sakura approached her sensei. Kakashi sensei come, lean on me, Naruto and Sasuke need us, she announced firmly convinced of the truth of her words. Indeed, it had been a while since there was no sound from the valley of the end and Sakura was caught by the reality of the moment, the two young men had surely finished fighting. What had been the outcome of this confrontation? Sakura then placed her arm on her teacher's back so that he could position himself well. Just before leaving, she turned to the legendary Rikid Senin. I have full confidence in you Sakura Haruno, no matter what your choice is, he said one last time before disappearing entirely into nothingness, like a memory. It only remained for Sakura to make the choice that seemed right to decide. Chapter 2 At first Sakura didn't want to believe it. For all his wisdom and experience, the Rikid Senin was probably wrong. Yes, it was even obvious, the world was currently at peace and the people were only getting better. They were licking their wounds, burying their dead and no trace of hatred was visible on the horizon. The first days were the most emotional. At the same time, they were full of joy, due to the fact that they had won the war, but also very hard to face the harsh reality of the victims. The losses of the Fourth Great Shinobi War were overwhelming. Thousands of dead were now on the hands of the living. Comrades, friends, families, loved ones, all mixed up with the enemy. Initially, each country had wished to recover their dead so that they could have a decent burial, respecting the customs of each country. But this became too difficult a task as many of the bodies began to show signs of decay, increasing the risk of disease. Moreover, it was not only the bodies of the shinobi that had to be dealt with, but also those of civilians. Indeed, many villages and entire towns suffered the consequences of this war. At the same time, the economy of the countries had to recover, life had to resume as quickly as possible so that the balance of the elemental nations did not collapse. Consequently, mass graves began to be erected at the sites of major battles. No matter which country they belonged to, the bodies were piled up and burned in a matter of days, sparing the world from a possible pestilential pandemic. Only the greatest combatants had the privilege of having a grave in their home country. A memorial stone was placed in each hidden village, bearing the names of all the victims of the Fourth Great Shinobi War, so that everyone could remember that their sacrifice had led to world peace. One month was the time Sakura had set for herself to come to a first decision. Whether she should truly value the words of the old sage or choose to live her life. With this in mind for the future, she began to learn about the politics of her village and country. And as an apprentice to Tsunade Dentetsu no Sanin, the current Hokage of Kanoha, she was able to study the content of the daily shinobi missions, many repairs, construction aids, food distributions, bandit management, and patrols. For the most part, these were a large number of D and C rank missions that any ninja could perform without major difficulty. However, she saw very few diplomatic missions between nations. 
Each country and hidden village seemed to mind their own business and ignored their neighbors. The peace achieved and the good understanding between the nations did not mean that one should be busy and interfere in the affairs of others. After all, this was close to what his master had taught her, if you don't take care of yourself first and die Sakura, who will take care of saving the lives of others. Currently in the Godame Hokage's office, Sakura was sitting on a red leather couch watching the day's missions. A lot of banditry, Sakura whispered to herself before letting a long sigh escape her mouth. She turned to her master who was behind his desk filling out various papers. The last war seemed to have made Tsunade Senja more diligent in her work. Of course she still drank sake on the sly, but you could tell that she had taken her role as Godame Hokage very seriously. Nevertheless, Sakura had been analyzing the situation for several days to see if it would improve. But against all odds, it only got worse. The banditry kept increasing due to a flagrant lack of manpower. Because yes, because of the last war, the shinobi troops were not enough to deal with brigandage and civil crime. Some C-rank missions had even reached B-rank due to large gatherings of people. Tsunade-sama, Sakura called in a weary voice as she looked at her sensei. She straightened her head as she heard her student speak her name, interrupting her activity with a focused face. Yes Sakura? Is this? This going to sound like a weird question, but... There are no stupid or weird questions Sakura, there are only questions, Tsunade encouraged wisely before the sound of the quill could be heard in the room again. Do you think this piece will last? Tsunade was ready to hear any topic that might have concerned her apprentice, but she was 10,000 miles away from such a question coming from her. She was so surprised that she stopped writing again to stare at the young Kunoichi. Why such a question Sakura? Tsunade questioned, needing to understand why her apprentice was expressing such concern when the last war had only just ended. I just wonder if the man will be able to avoid repeating the same mistakes, the young woman explained sincerely. She grabbed the bundle of leaves she had placed on the couch in her hands before straightening up and heading towards her master's office. Unfortunately, Sakura, you can't stop this sort of thing from happening, you can only anticipate it. Very few humans accept criticism and even fewer accept being wrong, so asking them to learn from the mistakes of others is even harder to do. The blonde said as she leaned back in her chair, which made a slight creaking noise from wear and tear. Tsunade Senju watched her student carefully before reiterating her previous question, what brings you to ask such a question Sakura? I've been coming here every morning for almost three weeks to observe the routine of the shinobi missions and aside from the S-rank missions you don't allow me to study. There are some things that are working on me, Sakura admitted as she gently placed the documents on the wooden desk. Share your observations with me, the Sanin said as she placed her pen on the cabinet before crossing her arms over her ample chest. Banditry and vandalism are increasing exponentially, crime is at an all-time high in the civilian world, some nuknin have even joined gangs. They know we're short of manpower because of the last war, so they're taking advantage of it. It looks like they didn't learn anything from that damn war. Besides, I haven't seen any diplomatic missions to any of the shinobi villages, even your mail doesn't have any official seals from the other nations, Sakura snarled as she explained her reasoning. You've grown, Sakura the older woman remarked proudly. The war forced me to grow up. Life experiences make every human being grow, but even more so when faced with war. Anyone who had survived the last conflict was bound to have grown in their outlook. Sakura was no exception, she had been at the front, she had seen the horrors of war. How many of her fellows had she treated? How many had she saved? How many had she lost? Tsunade could only notice the change in the young woman's attitude and look, yes, she had changed. She was no longer the self-doubting teenager, hiding behind the power of her teammates. The war had inevitably left its mark on the pink-haired Kunoichi. To answer your concerns, I can tell you that they are well-founded and understandable. Our military system has lost a lot of troops and that's one of the reasons why banditry is so prevalent. But the majority of bandits are just civilians who can be easily managed. So why don't we take care of it right away sensei? Sakura snarled at the thought of innocent people being killed after all they had been through. Because we can't be everywhere Sakura. Hai no Kuni is big and not just Kanoha no Sato. Besides, there are other problems to deal with at the same time, 
we have to rebuild our homes, get our economy going again properly, refill our supplies. Because a famine is one of the worst things that could happen to us right now, and that's one of the reasons why being Hokage is so difficult, because I choose to make sacrifices for the welfare of the many. Tsunade swiveled her wheeled seat towards the windows and stood up. She walked towards the windows, folding her hands behind her back as she looked towards her village. As far as diplomatic relations with other countries are concerned, I would say that everyone is handling the situation internally. A trust has been built up so that everyone leaves the other alone. Besides, nobody would be stupid enough to start a new conflict now, especially with the current generation. What would we do if someone... Sakura began before being interrupted by her master. We still have many S-rank ninja in the village, including Naruto and potentially Sasuke, even though he's in prison for his treasonous acts against Kanoha, the Godame added reassuringly. However, as soon as her master finished speaking, one of the Rikid Senen's phrases took on its full meaning for Sakura. And it kept repeating in her mind, for how long? Sure, Naruto and Sasuke were probably the two most powerful ninjas of their time, but they weren't immortal. There was no guarantee that they wouldn't suffer from the aftermath of their last fight. And even if they both recovered from their injuries, the day would come when they would leave this world for the realm of the dead. Though she wished that day was as far away as possible, immortality was not programmed into humanity and the two ninjas would not escape it, powerful as they were. Sakura realized then that she finally had to take the hermit's words seriously. She had to prepare herself to eventually go back in time. But to do what? At the moment, she hadn't decided what to do with Uchiha Madara. The memories of the war were still too fresh in her mind and her resentment towards the individual was far too strong. She looked at her master before deciding to speak, her decision was made. Tsunade-sama, I would like to make a request of you. Hmm. I would like to. Well, how can I put it? I know it sounds bad and selfish of me, but I would like to have the opportunity to visit the world. To be able to help as many people as possible, to give support to those who don't have it, she finally said after a slight hesitation. Tsunade didn't give an immediate answer, the minutes that passed became heavy for Sakura as her master considered her request. The medical department should be fine without her as there was a noticeable decrease in the number of very seriously injured. The old woman pondered what could possibly justify the denial of this request. When she couldn't think of anything, she turned back to her desk. She quickly took out a beautiful sheet of parchment that she only used for important occasions. After a few minutes of filling out the document in an official manner, the Godain grabbed her wax warmer and dripped a small amount onto the bottom of the page. She then applied the Hokage's seal to it, making the document unquestionable and authentic. Haruno Sakura, for your acts of bravery and heroism to the nation of Hai no Kuni, as well as to all the elemental nations, I accept your request. It is difficult for me to lose someone of your caliber, but I can understand your motives and approve of your choice, Tsunade finished, holding out the rolled-up scroll to Sakura. Sakura couldn't help but smile, even as a phrase kept running through her mind, for how long? And it was from that day on that Haruno Sakura decided to take matters into her own hands. She only had 23 months left before she left for the past. 12 months. It had been 11 months since Sakura had traveled the elemental nations to set her plan in motion. She still hadn't found the answer to what she would do in front of Uchiha Madara, but she had no intention of standing idly by in the time of the shinobi gods. Her journey through all the countries made her realize that despite the peace, misery was still present. Many villages did not have access to the basic necessities to get by properly. Some places were starving because of racketeering by thugs, while others had to relocate because their homes had been destroyed during the war. Some were in desperate need of medical care and Sakura was happy to offer her help and knowledge. Only two months into her journey did Sakura realize something important, the world depended on money. Money was the solution to all problems. Regardless of the category of the population, money was the main concern. Those who did not have money were looking for it, and those who already had money were also looking for more. Everything was a pretext for financial transactions. How many times had Sakura seen village or town leaders pay their neighbors to even buy food to feed the people? How many times had she also seen money used to solve other problems, like local banditry? 
It was enough to pay mercenaries to deal with the troublemakers. Even if she knew that this was nothing new in the way the world worked, being directly confronted with it opened her mind and modified her thinking to be less obtuse and intransigent. So money was the solution. With this in mind, Sakura decided that if she was going to join the Sengoku era, she would not arrive with empty pockets. She decided to take advantage of her fame as a war heroine and her privileged status as an apprentice of the illustrious Tsunade Dentetsu no Sanin, to amass a lot of money herself. She traveled to the various elemental nations to take out very large loans. This was possible because Sakura understood that in order to convince the financial institutions to grant her the huge sums requested, she had to sell them a huge project that generated huge profits for the bank itself. And it didn't matter if the project was viable or if it had any necessity for their country. Money called for money. And by dint of loan after loan, Sakura had managed to amass several million rios. She had become one of the richest people in all the elemental nations, but at the same time, the most indebted person in history. Sakura had hardened herself and had no qualms about appropriating the wealth of the countries she had traveled to in this way. She had made the choice that she would return to the past when the time was right. This decision allowed her not to worry for a second about how she would repay her debts, since the world as she knew it would no longer exist. However, all that money was taking up space, a lot of space. And it would have been unfortunate for her to be looted if it became known that she had such large sums with her. Fortunately for her, Sakura was an intelligent person and her training with Tsunade had allowed her to find the solution to many of her problems, the finjutsu or otherwise called, the art of seals. Sakura was not just a doctor ninja with immeasurable physical strength. On the contrary, the young woman was very intelligent and Tsunade taught her the finjutsu related to medicine without going into the details of this art. She showed her the useful formulas to be applied on localized areas of the body in order to obtain a precise effect. And until now, the pink-haired Kunoichi had only learned them by heart without really understanding how to apply them. It was certainly practical, but extremely dangerous. During the war, Sakura had discovered that some of her colleagues had mastered much more than the little formulas she knew. They were able to create them on demand, or rather, for every medical case that required the use of a seal. It was then that she became more interested in this ninja art. And it was a revelation, because for her, it was only mathematics mixed with the twelve ndra that every ninja used to perform ninjutsu techniques. She was still far from claiming to be on the level of the late Jiraiya Dentetsu no San Nin, even further from the Yandame Hokage or any self-respecting Uzumaki at their peak. But Sakura didn't despair of ever reaching their levels and so she bought the few books she could find on the subject, in order to improve herself. And so, thanks to the finjutsu, Sakura was able to hide all the money she had collected without anyone suspecting that she had so much. Seven months. During her travel, Sakura rarely returned to the hidden village of Kanoha. If she did, it was only for specific reasons, such as the ceremony of the Rokudame Hokage, Kakashi Hitaki, taking office. And that day was more than enough reason to come back and kill two birds with one stone. So Naruto, not too disappointed that you didn't manage to take the hat from Tsunade-sama like you said you would? The two of them were currently at Ichikaru Ramen having a nice time together. The young woman then noticed that the blonde had grown up a lot, he seemed calmer since Iruka-sensei had taken over his teaching. Ma. It's alright Sakura-chan, Kakashi-sensei and Iruka-sensei are preparing me to be the next one, so it'll be twice as much fun to take it, Naruto answered with a wide smile. And you Sakura-chan, are you planning to finally stay in the village or will you continue to travel? I'm thinking of staying for a few days. In fact, the main reason I'm back in Kanoha is you Naruto. Me? The Uzumaki was surprised that his sister at heart could turn her attention to him. Don't go imagining things Naruto, I need you to teach me something, Sakura corrected before her blonde comrade got the wrong idea about her intentions. What can I teach you? I remind you that of the two of us, you're the smart one. Do you remember when we were on the battlefield against Abito and Madara? Sakura asked as the sound of noodles being sucked up was softly heard from Naruto's side. Too well unfortunately. I need to know more about how you managed to regenerate Kakashi-sensei's eye. I know you gave me a brief explanation that day, but it wasn't enough for me to understand. 
Sakura grabbed her pair of chopsticks before dipping them into her bowl and taking a few bites of her own ramen. It wasn't her favorite food, but it made for a nice moment with her friend. You can thank our teachers, because thanks to their lessons I think I'll be able to explain it to you more easily than in the past. Tuchi Gigi. A second bowl of miso please. The blonde man shouted as his first bowl was barely finished. It's working Naruto. Replied the old man who since the end of the war had seen his clientele grow exponentially. I think my regeneration technique is a bit like the Infu and Kai, breaking the seal added to the SC says, creation and renewal of Tsunadebachan which are considered kenjutsu. Naruto explained while keeping an eye on the chef who was preparing his favorite bowl of noodles. Tsunade-sama never wanted to teach me her second technique saying that it might kill me in the process, Sakura confessed. Unlike Tsunade-bachan who forces her own cells to multiply rapidly to repair her vital organs or any other injury, my method is safe. I use a part of the person. One or two cells is enough and from that I will use the surrounding chakra through Senjutsu to trigger the mitosis process. This will not use the patient's chakra, nor their physical energy, thus avoiding a decrease in their lifespan, the blonde detailed with precision. Sakura was impressed with her friend's knowledge, she had to admit that the body little boy she had long considered stupid was no more. He had become a calm and thoughtful man. He had acquired complex notions and was able to reproduce them. Naruto was truly preparing to become the next Hokage, and he would have made a fine Kage, she had no doubt. But she didn't let her mind drift to those thoughts, she needed answers for her future project. Do you think it would be possible to do this without Senjutsu? She questioned since she didn't know how to use the hermit's technique. At that moment, Naruto frowned as he crossed his arms. He remained in that position for a few minutes and even when Tuchi placed his new bowl of ramen in front of his nose, he didn't come out of his reflection. Yes. That can be done, he finally replied with conviction. At these words, a slight smile appeared on Sakura's face and she suddenly felt a rush of hope come over her. How? She asked hastily. The blonde looked at his friend a little surprised by her reaction, but he was so happy to see her and spend a moment with her that he continued his explanations with gusto. What makes my technique safer than the one used by Bachan is the fact that the Senjutsu Chakra, once mastered, is the very essence of nature. So a balance is made in the patient's body so that the cells regenerate without affecting their lifespan. So to compensate for this in the absence of Senjutsu, you should be able to separate the cells you want to use for regeneration before reattaching them to the patient. This would be done so that the rest of the human body would not be affected, however, it would require an unusual level of chakra control. But, how can you regenerate a whole eye with only two cells? The composition of an eye is extremely complex and consists of millions of different cells, the young woman wondered. I'm sorry Sakura-chan, I'm not as advanced in the subject as you are, so I can't explain it to you in detail. I see it this way though, when I use Senjutsu, the chakra regenerates the eye by itself, as if the body remembers how everything should be placed. As if. Ah. As if we had a formula inside each of us to make us, Naruto tried to explain. DNA. She murmured as he barely finished his attempted explanation. No idea what DNA is, Sakura-chan, he admitted spontaneously before more seriously and greedily reaching for his still steaming bowl of ramen. Meanwhile, Sakura's brain was racing with theories. The evolution of scientific knowledge had made it possible to discover that the basic structural unit of any living being was the cell and the existence of the genetic code. This code simply allowed the functioning of the human body from the moment a child was conceived. Indeed, it was the expression of the genetic code that allowed cell division, as well as the differentiation and specialization of these same cells. These cells then became tissues, then organs, and so on until the whole body was formed. Remembering this very fact, Sakura began to find her own solutions to the questions she had been asking herself for some time. Thank you Naruto, I think I understand the principle. However, I think that in order to compensate for the Senjutsu Chakra, the person attempting this regeneration will have to do it step by step. Glad I could help you Sakura-chan, Naruto replied with a bright smile without really understanding how he could help his friend, but it was enough to make him happy. Naruto. Can we take a picture of the two of us together, please? 
the young woman asked with a soft, fragile voice. Of course. I am Nietzschean. Can you please come? The blonde man bellowed in his usual way. Four months. Name no Kuni, the land of waves had changed a lot in ten years. Since the construction of the great Naruto Bridge, it had managed to recover from the tyranny of Gado. So it was with a heart full of nostalgia that Sakura headed towards Tazuna's home. The house hadn't changed much, except for a few small improvements here and there. She just hoped that the carpenter hadn't moved in all these years. But her concern ended as soon as she heard the familiar voice of the occupant after she knocked on the door of the house. Tazuna opened the door and stood for a brief moment speechless before the lovely pink-haired young woman standing before him. Her face was soft and the smile she had took his breath away. Hello Tazuna-san, long time no see, she said softly with a hint of nostalgia. Sakura. Sakura, is that you? Asked the man who wasn't too sure it was her when he saw the color of her hair. But when the young woman nodded her head with a beautiful smile, his doubts vanished. My god Sakura, how you've grown. You've grown into a beautiful young woman now. The concerned girl couldn't help but have a slight blush at the compliment. She wasn't used to receiving compliments on her looks from men. Besides, she merely gave the old carpenter another, slightly more shy smile. Come on in. What brings you here? Naruto and Sasuke aren't with you. He asked as he opened the door wide and invited the cherry blossom to enter with a wave of his hand. The interior of the house hadn't changed and it brought back sweet memories as she followed Tazuna to the dining room. They sat down around the table after the man had put down some refreshments. The young woman began the conversation to avoid any awkwardness between them. I need your services, Tazuna-san, she stated clearly. I need you to design me plans for a house, but not just any style of house, she clarified so that the carpenter could take down his recommendations. And what style do you want your house to be? I want it to be in the style of the Sengoku era and built in the manner of the time. I would also like you to imagine and make me the interior of the house with furniture of the period. Furthermore, I would need you to prepare all the parts of the house ready to be assembled once the plans of the house are completed. Berm. Don't you want us to build your house? The carpenter was surprised by the young woman's rather peculiar request. No, I intend to have my house built far from here. I come to you because of your reputation, Tazuna-san, and because I know that you will be able to satisfy my request, she explained calmly. The man nodded and smiled out of pride that she had thought of him for this project. Well, what are the deadlines? You have less than four months to prepare everything, no delays will be tolerated. Put as many people as you need in the realization of my order and if it is a money problem, I am ready to pay three times the price normally expected for such a project. I'll have to put some of my building sites aside then. But I think it is feasible. How long are you staying? Just long enough to get some sketches of the house plan, then I won't be back for another four months. Three days. Sakura was doing a final check to see if everything was in order before she left. She was making sure that everything was properly sealed and in its proper place. Because yes, the young woman was taking a lot of stuff with her. Not just money, furniture, or even the materials needed to build her future home. She carried a lot of books, whether they were on medicine, politics, history, or finjutsu. Sakura had accumulated a great deal of information for her projects in two years of travel. And with these kinds of resources, she could face the first, second and third great shinobi wars. But the most important thing for her was her photo album. She had spent the last month taking lots of pictures of her friends, teachers and family so that she would never forget them. Sakura had admitted as she got closer and closer to the deadline that all the people she cared about would probably never exist when she went back in time to change the fate of the world. That's why she felt it was important, even vital, to spend time with each of them. She had gone out with her best friend Eno, with whom she had talked at length and gone shopping. She had spent a few evenings with her beloved master going to the casino and drinking sake. She had also enjoyed her best friend Naruto and her sensei by going out with them a few times. She wished she could have spent time with her love Sasuke, but he stayed in prison for a long time before he was finally released. And when he was free, 
he decided to leave the village to travel the world. Her thoughts were interrupted by the arrival of a messenger bird. It was easily recognizable and the small ring on its leg only confirmed its origin. She gently took the message before letting the bird fly away. Haruno Sakura The current situation obliges me to order you to return to Kanoha no Sato village immediately, for the safety of the country. Rokadame Hokage At that very moment, the words of the old sage swirled once more in her mind, for how long? So she hurriedly packed all her things before heading towards Kanoha. Perhaps one last piece of evidence would reassure her that she was about to do the right thing. Last day. He knew all along, Sakura muttered to herself. After returning to her village, Sakura had gone straight to her kage to find out what was going on. And that was when she saw that the cycle of hatred was repeating itself once again. This time the world was threatened with extermination by Tonori Tsutsuki. He planned to have the moon crushed over the world for the acts committed against Kagaya Tsutsuki. The Rokadame Hokage wanted her to leave with a small team to find the heiress of the Hyuga clan who had been kidnapped by Tonori. But she arrived at the village too late and the team had left without her. Sakura's orders were to join them and help them in their task. However, she didn't head towards her comrades, but rather towards the valley of the end with a goal in mind. So this is where it all comes down to. Sakura stood at the top of the waterfall at the Valley of the End, positioned between the two half-destroyed statues of the two greatest ninjas of the Sengoku era. She had no more doubts or fears, her decision was made. So she took out the case that the wicked Senin had given her two years ago before opening it to extract a magnificent scroll. I'm sorry Naruto. Unfortunately I won't be there to see you become Hokage, Sakura whispered before opening the scroll. Then nothing. The scroll was empty, there was no writing, she felt no chakra around her, the scenery didn't change. Did I do something wrong? She asked herself before a voice she didn't think she would hear again came from behind her. You didn't think that a simple scroll could take you back to the past, did you, child? The legendary Rikudo Senin said humorously. Atsutsuki-sama. She exclaimed as she turned around quickly, completely taken aback to find him there. This scroll was only meant to make me come back to you when you've made a decision and here I am, the old man explained with a certain form of malice as he approached her. So. Have you made a decision? Sakura turned her gaze to the moon that had been moving dangerously close to the planet for the past few days. She thought about everything she'd learned in two years and the cycle of hatred coming back into focus. Yes, you were right all along, it's just an eternal beginning and the cycle of hate is here again. Sakura looked into the eyes of the man in front of her to read his determination before continuing. I accept your offer to go back to the past and change things. Chapter 3 Known as Rikid Senin, this being was standing at the top of the waterfall in the valley of the end with Haruno Sakura. The hermit's six black orbs slowly began to spin in a large circle around the two protagonists present. The necklace around his neck made of six magatama began to glow softly. The same symbols on his kimono also began to glow, as did the top of his gutama staff. His eyes were currently closed and an extreme concentration could be read on his face. Gently, he touched the water in front of him with his staff. As soon as it came into contact with the water of the lake, the energy concentrated at the end of gutama mixed with it and everything started to happen quickly. A maelstrom formed in the center of their position before becoming as large as the lake in a few seconds. Sakura was initially frightened at the thought of being sucked in, but she didn't let the feeling affect her. A slight hissing sound could be heard before it became intense, even painful to the ears. The unpleasant sound made Sakura look up from the ground to discover where it was coming from, the black orbs that had been spinning slowly around them at first, had started to accelerate until they were no longer visible to the naked eye. Their rapid movement gradually created a dome of translucent chakra, encompassing them both. Sakura's eyes widened at the power of the wicked Senin, the power of a god, able to change the course of things with his very thought. The shores of the lake began to be sucked into the maelstrom, then it was the turn of the forests before seeing the mountains suffer the same fate, before finally it was the turn of the sky. Only the stars remained in a sea of black as far as the eye could see, lit only by the glow of the dome. 
What started out as a maelstrom sucking in all around him turned into a whirlwind of chakra and Sakura didn't dare make a move, lest she do something stupid and end up in limbo. Time stood still and no one could say how long they were here, minutes. Hours. Days. Perhaps a lifetime. There was no sign of time passing, no landmark. The constantly rotating maelstrom slowed down, again and again, before finally stopping its movement. Then it began to rotate again, but this time in the opposite direction, and all that was now being sucked and began to be slowly expelled from the center of the maelstrom. The water reappeared, the trees and mountains were back in their place, and the blackness of the space surrounded by stars was replaced by the color of the sky. Gradually the orb slowed down until there was no longer a dome. The outburst of chakra beneath their feet quietly dissipated as everything slowly returned to normal. With her senses alert, Sakura heard the unmistakable sound of a waterfall again, the chirping of birds lulling her ears, the feel of the wind gently caressing her skin sending a chill up her spine. Her gaze wandered around to see what had changed, the two half-destroyed statues of the shinobi gods were gone. Welcome to the Sengoku Sakura era, the old hermit said before letting out a deep sigh of relief. He had, after all, just accomplished what everyone else considered impossible to do, time travel. Atsutsuki-sama, ho how. It was. It was. Sakura stammered as she couldn't find the words to describe what she had just experienced. It all seemed both unreal and unbelievable, and as she looked around she couldn't find any residue to indicate that they had just crossed space and time. This was what I call a wormhole, a shortcut through space-time. To represent it, you can represent space-time not in four dimensions, but in two, so that they are all at a definite point. The hermit paused when he saw the young woman's confused face. He tended to forget that mortals did not have his knowledge, so he thought for a moment to find a more simplified way of explaining what he had just done. Visualize a sheet of paper. At the top of the paper you draw a point A which is the past, and then you draw a point B at the bottom which is the future. Then fold the paper. This process allows point A and point B to touch each other at a single point. And it is at this precise moment that a passage can be made to return to the past, a wormhole. It was unthinkable, Sakura had seen it and experienced it, but she still had trouble quantifying the power needed to do this kind of feat. If you're able to wield such power, to bend space and time to your will, why can't you go back? To accomplish such an act on the scale of the universe, I had to exterminate all life existing in your time to convert it into chakra. Without that, I wouldn't have had the energy to perform this distortion of space and time. Sakura's eyes widened and she felt the taste of bile in the back of her throat, she suddenly felt the urge to vomit. Her choice. Her decision, had just killed millions of living beings. If I were to take us in the opposite direction, would have to use the life essence of all life in the past to go into the future. And as a result, we would arrive in a future completely devoid of life. Did they suffer? Sakura asked softly as her brain absorbed the information that going back was impossible. No, because the moment I started the process, time froze without them being aware of it. I understand Tsutsuki-sama, is today the day Madara and Hashirama are going to fight? Sakura questioned as she tried to keep her mind focused, not to think about the loss of her world. Or rather, its outright destruction. No, I decided to bring you back a month early, so you'd have time to settle in and acclimate to your new time. Thank you Tsutsuki-sama. Before we part, I would like to give you a present. No matter what choice you make regarding Madara, this gift will serve you well in the future. The old sage rose from his sitting position before walking the short distance between them. He gently placed his hand on Sakura's forehead at her seal. In less than a second, Sakura could feel the hermit's chakra seeping into her helplessly. It was an intrusion, but she felt no aggression, it was almost comforting. Perhaps the wicked Sennin felt her pain and was trying to soothe her with his chakra. Yet she understood once again that the man in front of her could kill her with the snap of a finger. That's it. As soon as the old man withdrew his hand, the feeling of warmth and comfort disappeared as quickly as it had appeared, the pain slowly returning to her soul. What? What did you do to me? Sakura asked, feeling no difference in her body. I just improved your frontal finjutsu seal. 
For you see, I've been watching you for the past two years and this is my way of rewarding you for what you're trying to accomplish. Your seal now allows you to resist the Genjutsu made by the Sharingan at all times. You will still be affected by other Genjutsu that are produced in different ways, but no Uchiha will be able to put you into an illusion, including the Tsukuyami that Madara knows. Sakura was completely stunned by the hermit's gift. He had just made one of the greatest ojitsu obsolete against her, at least on a genjutsu level, with a simple movement of his hand. By the way, I really enjoyed your conversation with Naruto Uzumaki about the way to be able to do regeneration. What you are planning to do is very dangerous. So I'll give you a hint, chakra is composed of physical energy provided by the body, while spiritual energy is created by the intellect. Manage to distinguish the two and you should be able to detect what is physical energy in people. How can you do this? Through meditation. Will I be able to replicate what Naruto did in time? Sakura hoped so, after all, the possibilities of such a healing method would be endless. Not entirely, let's say that over a long period of time you'll be able to restore a blind man's sight without endangering him. You'll never be able to make an eye grow back with a snap of your finger like Naruto did. You'd have to master Senjutsu to do that, and few people can, the Rikudo explained as he slowly began to disappear. Atsutsuki-sama. I'm scared. She admitted as her body shook as she realized that the last person who had tied her to her former life was about to leave her in this unknown world. Do you regret your choice, my child? Tsutsuki asked gently. I don't know, the young woman confided in a weak voice. How could she answer it right away? Her mind had to absorb the irretrievable loss of an entire life. And she also had to assimilate the fact that she was now in another time that was totally unknown to her. As if he had perceived the despair of her being, a comforting hand was placed on her shoulder and the rickets and mean gave her a warm smile. Don't forget my child, that no matter what your choice is I will not judge you. Know that I am already proud of what you are trying to accomplish. The Rikid Senin's words were much appreciated by Sakura who felt a small rush of pride rise up inside her. Then he turned and walked in the opposite direction, slowly disappearing. Atsutsuki-sama. Sakura called out. Yes. He asked, turning around one last time. Will I see you again? An enigmatic smile appeared on the Rikudo's face before he said. Who knows? Then the creator of all things disappeared with the breeze. Atsutsuki-sama. Sakura cried in despair as she saw that she was now all alone with her things. Sakura was a strong person with a lot of character. She had seen the horrors of war, seen people die, some of them close to her. However, she had not been prepared for what was overwhelming her heart, grief. She felt it contract as if a vice was pressing on him. Her breathing became faster and faster. Panic was overtaking her because of an overload of emotion, at the realization of what she had just done, sacrifice. Everything she had fought for was gone. Everything that had mattered to her had been destroyed by her actions, by her choice. The feeling of being responsible for the disappearance of those millions of living beings, plus the realization of loneliness made Sakura cringe. The emotion that was building up inside her needed to escape, to get out. So her eyes began to fill with tears in silence. Then, without warning, the dam at her eyes broke. She fell to her knees and began to scream, pounding her fist on the floor. Why did I do this? Why did I do this? Sakura screamed. Naruto. Images of all her good times with the blonde, ramen fan and future Hokage of Kanoha, appeared in her mind. She remembered his bright smile, his boundless kindness, his golden hair. She told herself that she would never again have that feeling of being loved by someone like a sister. Sasuke. Her thoughts then turned to the love of her life, the man she tried for so long to seduce. She would never again be able to hear the sound of his voice, to feel the thrill of his presence alone. She would never again see the man of her life for whom she would have done anything. All she had wanted all her life was to be his wife and to fill him with happiness. And as she thought about this, she felt an additional tear in her heart. Eno. Her best friend, the one who was the first to believe in her, to help her become the cherry blossom she was today. She had just lost someone who understood her with a single glance, 
who knew when to take her out of her work to take her mind off of things. Sensei. Even though he was always late, she already missed his lame excuses. He who so often managed to make her laugh when he was with Mado Guy. He who had taught her so much during his life while protecting her. Master. Her master who had been a model, a teacher, and a confidant. She remembered their evenings drinking sake together after a hard day of work. She who was like a second mother to Sakura. Mother. Father. She could never again feel the gentle embrace of a mother or father. The feeling of security in their arms, she would never again feel the love of her parents with a hug. She cried for a long time, asking herself over and over, why? She screamed so loudly and for so long that her voice broke. There was nothing feminine or delicate about it anymore, it was just screams of agony. All she wanted was to get all that pain out of her heart, to no avail. The constant use of chakra forced Sakura to move to the edge of the shore before sitting against a tree with her arms crossed over her knees. She had no taste for anything, worse, she didn't even want to live. All she wanted was to find her friends, her family, all the people she loved, and she thought that maybe they were all waiting for her on the other side. Was it all worth it if she was all alone? Did world peace deserve such suffering? It would be so quick. Her own sentence was like an electric shock to Sakura as she realized the thoughts she was having. So she slapped herself hard in the face to get her thoughts back in place. No Sakura. You're better than that. You're not going to end your life here. Think of all you've sacrificed for this chance. Don't make their sacrifice in vain. The Quinochi encouraged herself before wiping the tears from her eyes in rage. She untied her red scarf that served as a ninja headband. It was a gift from her mother for her success in becoming a leaf chunin. She grabbed a kunai from her back weapon pocket to cut away the metal symbol on it. She watched the symbol for a few moments before sealing it. She reattached her red scarf to her head and was now Sakura Haruno, affiliated with No Shinobi Village. I have one month. She exclaimed into the wind to give herself the strength to accomplish what she had come for. So it was a determined Sakura who took off with her chakra. Her search into the future led her north, to Ta no Kuni, the land of rice fields. It was a territory on the border of Hai no Kuni that had no military force in the Sengoku era, or at least no shinobi. Moreover, the border of this country was only thirty minutes away from the valley of the end. She had a month to be ready. Three days later. It had been three days since Sakura had been in the past. Her eyes were reddened from crying over the loss of her loved ones. Much of her time was spent finding a suitable place to build her house. She wanted to be near a village without being too close to it, and after the third day she found the perfect spot. It was high up with a view down into the valley and from here you could see all the rice fields below the mountain. There was a village only a kilometer away from her position. It must have contained about fifty people at the most. So it was with a heavy heart that Sakura headed there. The village was quite basic, workers could be seen in the distance planting rice, wearing rudimentary linen clothes, straw hats to protect them from the sun, and saddlebags containing plants. Children were running down one of the streets playing tag, and one could even make out a house that was just finishing being built. However, in her bright red cotton outfit, plus the large scroll of parchment on her back, Sakura did not go unnoticed. The first to see her was a boy who was running to see his mother. Look mum, there's someone over there, he said, pointing. Go and get your father quickly, darling. The woman's face showed concern. After all, very few people came to this area of Ta no Kuni, especially dressed like this. Her walk described an important person who had received an education, her clothes probably cost a fortune to make because of the red color. But what surprised the woman the most was the color of her hair. It was the first time in 42 years of life that she had seen someone with hair like that, pink. So it was with fear in her belly that she walked towards the stranger, perhaps this person was coming to kill them all. She made sure that her emotions did not show too much on her face before approaching her. Hello stranger, what brings you to this remote valley? Hello ma'am, my name is Sakura Haruno and I'm currently looking for a home. The stranger's name confirmed the peasant's doubts, she must be a noblewoman to have a family name. 
why come to our village? No offense, but you look like nobility from the way you're dressed, so you'd probably be more comfortable going to the city further north. As she asked this question, the mother saw that the young woman's eyes were reddened, filled with sadness and pain. I'm looking for asylum, madam, that's why I came to this region. I was hoping you could offer me a chance to start my life over. Despite her grief, Sakura did her best to appear friendly, but the sadness was still too fresh. There shouldn't be any problems, my husband should be here any minute. I'm Hitomi, the lady introduced herself and felt a weight lift off her chest as she realized that this woman meant them no harm. It is a pleasure to meet you. I understand you are seeking asylum, is everything all right Hirono-sama? Hitomi asked, not forgetting to add the formulas of respect that her father had taught her. Let's just say I've seen better days Hitomi-san, and please, no, Sama with me, we're equals. The surprise could clearly be read on Hitomi's face as she had never met a noblewoman as humble as this young woman. It was her husband who snapped her out of her shock. Hitomi, is everything all right? Yes. This woman is seeking asylum and would like to move to the area. Let me introduce myself, I'm Sakura Haruno, a doctor and I would like the opportunity to move to the area. The head of the family was a little taken aback by the beauty of the young woman. She was exotic and looking into her eyes he had only one desire, to protect her. There shouldn't be any problem. You say you're a doctor. Sakura nodded. Well, I'd like to say you're welcome to join us, if there's anything we can do to help. I was wondering if you had any builders in your village. For you see, a friend of mine has drawn up plans to build a new house. Of course, I will pay for the construction. Every time Saruka made a request she bowed very slightly. It was really surprising to see a person of nobility bowing respectfully to people who were just common peasants. Yes, we have some builders among us. I will go and tell them, if you will follow me. The village headman turned to the gathering of people who had formed around them. Everyone get back to work, I'll make an announcement tonight to introduce our new resident. And so Sakura began her new life. Twenty-seven days later. It had been almost a month since Sakura had moved to the outskirts of a small village in Tano Kuni. Her house was built in three weeks with the help of the villagers who were all very kind to her. Hitomi was the one who tried the most to get close to her by trying more than once to make her smile. She did smile at times, but you could tell that something precious had been taken away from her. The builders were very surprised, even impressed with the construction plans. It was extremely detailed and far beyond anything they had seen or done in the past. Sakura tried to fit in and offered her services as a village doctor. This was greatly appreciated by the people, and one day she gained the respect of the entire village. For they saw her using what many thought was a myth, the ninja arts. Indeed, for many it was a story in a legend that some human beings were able to do magic, to create fire, to manipulate water or to heal people. One day, as she was walking through the village, a cry of pain echoed through the streets. With her warrior instincts still present, Sakura reacted quickly and ran towards the voice. The village hunter seemed to have cut three fingers while handling a cleaver to cut up the deer he had just brought in. People were running to him because of the cries of pain. Put your hand on the table. Sakura ordered in a commanding voice as she walked towards him. Do you have any alcohol? Ah. Yes, the bottle on the top shelf. Arg. The hunter was in pain and a steady stream of blood was pouring out of his wound. Sakura grabbed the bottle and quickly uncorked it before putting her nostrils over it. One inhale and she identified that the alcohol was of poor quality, but it would do. This is going to hurt. Even though Sakura warned the man, he couldn't help but scream louder as she spilled some of the contents onto his fingers. She grabbed his hand and placed the severed ring finger on it. A soft green light appeared and it shocked everyone present. Even the hunter forgot that he was in pain when he saw it. The bone fixed itself where it had been cut, the tendons repositioned themselves, the blood vessels also returned to their original place before the wound closed. Only a long red line proved that the finger had been previously cut. Sakura ignored the whispers and gasps behind her before grabbing the second severed finger to repeat the process. Then came the turn of the last finger, which she replaced with ease. Sit. 
Sakura ordered the hunter after she had finished her reimplantation work. He didn't try to argue with the woman's order, she had just saved him the use of his hand. Bend your fingers gently and tell me if you still feel pain other than the scar. No, I don't feel any pain. Is there any discomfort when you bend your fingers? No. It's a miracle what you did there. How? Sakura didn't answer, instead she rolled up her right sleeve where a seal was placed. In a puff of smoke, a clean bandage appeared in her hand and this caused more whispers behind her. She applied the said bandage to the man's hand with efficiency and speed. You will stop work for the next three days as you have lost a lot of blood. You should also eat a piece of fruit or two before you get up. In addition, for the next few days I recommend that you eat meat at all your meals to compensate for your blood loss, fish would be ideal. I will also come tonight to bring you a balm for your scars as well as a decoction for the hemorrhage you suffered. Thank you very much Hirono-sama. No, Sama with me, I just did my job. Thanks to this event, Sakura gained the respect of this small village of Ta no Kuni. Today was the day that everything would be decided, the day that Madara and Hashirama would face each other. But for now, Sakura sat on a chair inside her living room while reading a book on the anatomy of the human heart. The unmistakable sound of rain pelting the house could be heard as she made occasional notes on a scroll beside her. Which part of the heart will be affected? Sakura murmured to herself as she thought about Madara's fight. Because after all, depending on where the blade would be lodged, the surgery would probably have to be done there. Will it be the vena cava? The aorta? One of the ventricles? Will she have to stop his heart in order to stop the blood loss while it is being treated? These were the kinds of questions Sakura was asking herself in the early afternoon. Her reading was interrupted by a small tremor from the ground, as if a small earthquake had been triggered for a second before a distant thud was heard. It was the sound of a loud explosion that could be mistaken for thunder. The battle of the shinobi gods has finally begun. Sakura returned to her reading, after all she knew where and when to find Madara. Besides, her bag was already packed so she could join him when the time came. The bangs blended well with the sound of the rain. To the people of the village it was simply a thunderstorm and the flashes of light just confirmed their theory that it was lightning. It lasted all afternoon with moments of calm, before picking up again. And it was finally late in the afternoon that Sakura decided to move despite the fact that she still didn't know what decision to make. During the ride, her thoughts focused on what Madara Uchiha would become and what he would do in the future. She reached the top of the waterfall and hid behind a large rock that towered over it completely. She continued to hide her presence and her chakra as she had been doing for the past ten minutes before looking down. Madara was dying in his own blood unable to move, his armor was shattered in several places and a piece at the top of the breastplate was completely gone. Hashirama Senju was standing a meter away from his former friend, his back to him. I had such high hopes for you Madara, Hashirama said with anger and hatred. The man he had once called a friend had attacked his home, his people. So it was with pain that Hashirama left, knowing that Madara would succumb to his wounds before long. Sakura waited, she didn't have to act right away, Zetsu hadn't appeared yet and it was hard to make out anything at the moment. Visibility was reduced due to the rain and the falling night. Pathetic, Madara said to himself. He was one of the greatest shinobi in history, he was dying and there was nothing he could do about it. He had tried to stand up, but that sword that had pierced him through and through had done so much damage. He could no longer give order to a large part of his body and felt himself slowly leaving. A presence was felt beside him and Madara turned his still open eye in the direction of the newcomer. It was a creature unlike anything he had ever seen and he wondered if he was going to be eaten by this thing. Then suddenly, another spike of chakra was felt. Except this one was completely different from the first being. Madara barely blinked and a woman appeared at the creature's side in an attack position, her arm cocked back. The woman's fist was so charged with chakra that it was visible to the naked eye. The chakra-laden blow hit Zetsu in the face before he could even react. Sakura felt an immense pleasure come over her as she felt the bones of her enemy's skull shatter under her fingers. The impact was so violent that a shockwave was created and Madara didn't feel the rain falling on his body for two seconds. 
The monster's body was violently thrown against the cliff which was about 10 meters away and the impact created a crater inside it. The Uchiha tilted his head slightly to the side to observe what happened next. The black thing didn't seem to have a chance. He shouldn't have expected a surprise attack and that first punch would have killed almost anyone. As Sakura charged Black Zetsu to finish him off, she thought back to everything that Monster had already done and what he was going to do. About his plan to bring Kagaya Tsutsuki back. All the death caused by his fault. And it was with undisguised rage mixed with hatred built up for too long that Sakura struck. Shinaro. The second blow was fatal, she had put so much chakra into this gesture at the cliff broke in two for nearly 200 meters and an even more violent shockwave was felt on impact. Black Zetsu was no longer destroyed by Sakura. Who is she? Madara asked in a whisper. His eye was slightly wide at the titanic strength of this woman. She had just broken a cliff in half, which was no small feat. Why had she just killed this being? Madara didn't have time to ask himself more questions as the woman turned around. She walked slowly in his direction, her fists clenched as she considered what to do. Was she going to leave him? Or would her hatred for this man be too strong and she would kill him? Sakura stood beside Madara Uchiha who was unable to move. He felt vulnerable in front of this dangerous woman, who had just killed a being with extreme violence. Her green eyes were looking at him, her gaze was hard, cold, filled with hatred and rage towards him. If a look could kill, Madara would probably be dead right now. Her thoughts were so filled with hatred that she unconsciously charged her right fist with chakra. She thought of all the things this man had done, all the things he would do, all the deaths he would cause in the future. And at that very moment, Sakura had a brief thought. It would be so easy. Chapter 4 The Cycle of Hatred Sakura was experiencing this cycle firsthand. She now understood why the shinobi world had been ruled by it since the world was a world. She put herself in the shoes of all those people who had killed in the name of hate for revenge. She could even imagine that entire cities or civilizations could be decimated for the simple reason of wanting to make amends for a wrong they had suffered. The young woman knew, however, that hatred was a dangerous emotion when left unchecked. Not only did it give a certain power to the one who felt it, but it could also cause the one who let it guide him to commit the unthinkable, before paying the consequences. Sakura had seen Sasuke plunge into the cycle of hatred, blinded by it to the point where he had evaded the truth. He had allowed his thoughts to crystallize and focus only on the certainties he had been willing to consider. In a way, hadn't she too just given in to the cycle of hatred by exterminating that abject scumzetsu? But Sakura was too wrapped up in her own emotions to realize this truth. Indeed, she was fighting her own hatred inside. It was growing so much that it could be seen in the features of her face, the tensing of her limbs and the fury in her eyes. She wondered if quenching her thirst for revenge would be so serious. Could reducing this monster to nothing be considered as perpetuating the cycle of hatred? Or, on the contrary, undoing it? After all, he would only get what he deserved for leading to the loss of everyone she loved. But despite all her rage, one thought still managed to make her see reason. I'm better than him. After all, if she killed the person responsible for all her suffering, wouldn't she be lowering herself to his level? And this idea did not please the young woman at all, even if it was only to calm her ego. She was brought out of her thoughts when she saw the person responsible for her hatred suffer a slight coughing fit. He was drowning in his own blood and if nothing was done he would die. This was the signal for Sakura to break out of her trance and prove that she was different from this man. She knelt down in front of him before concentrating chakra in her fingertips to form a scalpel, as the Uchiha looked on in concern. With precision she cut away some of the straps from his half-destroyed armor. Once the straps were cut, she quickly ripped off the top of his armor and threw it away. Madara let out a groan of pain at the action. Sakura grabbed the linen top at the base of his neck before cutting through the blood-soaked garment, revealing the bruised trunk of the brunette. Numerous cuts were visible, all of which were benign at the moment. But by his jerky breathing in the hard shrug of his chest, Sakura knew that one of the lungs was probably punctured or at least damaged. Who? Are? You? Madara asked with great difficulty. 
He had many questions in his head as he watched this person above him. Her actions seemed to show that she wanted to help him. But why? After all, he had seen the rage and hatred in her eyes. So why did she want to help him? The pink-haired woman placed her bag on the ground and began to look for something inside, finally pulling out a stainless steel rod and a cannula. She placed the object on Madara's bloody torso before placing the rod on the front of his neck, at the level of the trachea. She aimed between the second and fourth cartilage rings, well below the vocal cords. Save your breath. Sakura said with authority as her face showed great concentration. Madara had never seen such gestures in his life. Medicine was not something that was common in those days. As a result, many small wounds were easily fatal. Nevertheless, perhaps it was the loss of blood or the fact that he had nothing left to lose that made him act obediently. He took a breath as best he could and blocked it. He felt a slight pain in his neck before he felt something being inserted into him. Keep your head up, release your breath in three, two, one. As she counted down, Sakura completely blocked the entrance to the second lung and a simple press of her fingers to the right of the cannula was enough. Sakura had just performed a tracheotomy, allowing Madara to breathe artificially with his left lung while the right one was in stasis, gorged with blood. The doctor then took a canteen out of her bag and hastily opened it to pour a large dose onto the victim's chest. Unfortunately, the rain was not sufficient to see the wound properly. Once the wound was clear, her expert eye, due to her knowledge and preparation, saw in a second which part of the heart had been hit in the fight. Shit! Sakura swore before straddling Madara. Leaning forward, her body acted as a barrier to the rain so that the water would not undermine her work. She concentrated her chakra in her index finger and it began to glow a green color. She placed it at specific points around the location of Madara's heart. Each press of her finger caused the dark-haired man to grimace. Don't look, she intimated harshly. Normally this kind of surgery was done with a sleeping patient, and that's why she advised looking away, because not everyone could handle such a sight. Sakura placed her hand flat again to perform her Chakura no Mezu technique, creating a chakra scalpel once more. Positioning her hand so that it was perpendicular to Madara's torso, she made an 8 cm long opening at the heart. Despite the woman's instructions, Madara was watching what she was trying to do, save his life. He had never seen anything like it, it was done with such confidence, such precision that he was sure this was not the first time she had done this. Strangely enough, he no longer felt any pain in his chest, as if she had cut off the information to his nerves. Where did this woman come from to do this kind of thing and, more importantly, who taught her? I'm going to have to stop your heart for now. Sakura announced as she saw all the blood escaping from the organ. She was extremely surprised to see the man still alive with such a wound. Only his willpower seemed to keep him going, or maybe it was his pride. Upon hearing this announcement, Madara looked up at the young woman's face right above him. She had pink hair, it was the first time in his life he had seen hair that color. And her eyes were green, turning slightly turquoise. Her face was soft and pleasant to look at, and the determination in it reminded him of his late mother. He felt the discharge of chakra through his body, a sign that his heart had just been stopped. In this state, Madara knew very well that he would die in a few seconds. So he took advantage of the soft green glow from the stranger's hands to look at her. The seconds passed and slowly his visibility diminished. He wanted to cry with rage at not being able to achieve what he had so longed for, peace. He saw life flash before his eyes before he was brought back to reality by another pulse of chakra in his body. It was so strong that his body arched and a grunt of pain came from his mouth. His thoughts returned as quickly as they had disappeared and in that moment he knew that he had been dead for a few moments. Blink if you're back. When she saw the Uchiha blink, she felt a great wave of satisfaction wash over her that she had just succeeded. While still straddling him, Sakura leaned forward to see if there was any damage to his skull. She meticulously lifted his head with one hand while feeling his skull with the other for any injuries. Seeing none, she put his head back down gently so as not to hurt him and disturb the cannula in his neck. Pulling the hair out of the Uchiha's right eye, she could see that it was closed and that a large amount of blood was coming out of it. Open up. Sakura ordered. 
the patient complied and a completely white eye was revealed. His retina was completely altered, he would never be able to see again. The technique he had used had doomed his Sharingan. Why? Help. You. Me. Speak as little as possible. Close your eyes. Sakura was in a hurry as she placed her hand on the damaged eye. The soft green glow emanating from her hand soothed the Uchiha. She was able to ease his pain, and Madara, who had never seen Iryo Ninjutsu in his life, thought it was a Kekiai Genkai. Sakura straightened up and began to make a series of signs with her hands. Finjutsu, Titai, Sakura said before placing her hand on the side of the damaged lung. A couple of seals inscribed themselves on Madara's chest, stopping any further blood flow into the lung. Once this was done Sakura got back on her two legs, satisfied with her work. Okay, can you move your body parts? If you can't, blink twice. Sakura saw the dark-haired man's right arm move, but that was all the movement Madara could muster and as she looked at her patient's eyes, she saw that he blinked twice. Shit! The sword must have done some damage to the vertebrae, Sakura observed to herself. She realized that Madara was paralyzed and that only his right arm and head were still valid. The Uchiha on the other hand had completely different thoughts. How did she know that a sword had pierced him? Had it been there from the beginning of his fight? Was she that good at seeing that such and such a wound was made by such and such a weapon? Or was it something else? Well. I'll have to carry you. Madara didn't think this day could get any worse. He had just failed in his goal of peace, lost his fight with his rival, died for a few seconds, owed his life to a woman, and now he was being carried like a bride. And besides, how was this woman herself able to carry him with such ease? Let yourself sink into unconsciousness, it will be better when you wake up. Now that she said it, Madara felt a great fatigue come over him, probably related to the loss of blood. In any case, Madara had never lowered himself to the level of a woman. They were only useful for bearing children and serving as a bargaining chip between clans. He was a man forged for war, for killing. A man who had always been guided by his pride and his will alone. He had never burdened himself with a woman except for the pleasure of the flesh to satisfy his needs. But Madara never thought that one day he would meet someone like this stranger. And at that moment when he was most vulnerable, he spoke a word he never thought he would say. Let alone to a woman. The. Thank. Then the dark-haired man sank into unconsciousness as his last strength left him. Sakura walked the route back to her house deep in thought. Had she just done the right thing? Was this really what the Rickett Senin wanted her to do? She turned her gaze slightly to Madara's face as she jumped from branch to branch. As he slept, his facial features had relaxed, revealing a graceful and delicate face that looked innocent. Despite this, Sakura saw this man as a mass murderer and nothing more. Her parents had told her that no one was born a murderer, but that one learned to be one. Human beings managed to survive because they were able to adapt and evolve. So the immediate question was, could Uchiha Madara change? It was with this last thought that Sakura finally arrived at her home. She hurried inside and made her way to the main room. It was a spacious room, a coffee table was set in the center with cushions around it. In the back were numerous bookcases and cupboards as well as a desk full of scrolls. Not liking futons because of their hardness and uncomfortableness, she had beds installed in her house. A large bed was on the left side of the room with a view of the outside. She settled her patient on it, ignoring the water and blood that stained the floor and the sheets. Quickly throwing her belongings on the floor, she rushed to light a number of candles in order to see more clearly. Her first task was to remove the rest of Madara's armor. She cut what was left of the straps attaching the armor to his body. Then it was his clothes' turn, she tore off his linen tunic before removing his sandals and trousers, leaving him in only his underwear. Many would have enjoyed the sight of the man, but Sakura had always been impeccable at her job. No one managed to disturb her, not even Sasuke when she'd had to nurse him back from the Fourth Great Shinobi War. No other visible wounds on his legs. As she carefully inspected Madara's body her eyes fell on something that made her frown. His left arm looked. Lifeless. 
She then began to channel Chakra after placing her hands on his arm. It took her a good minute to figure out what the problem was, his Tenketsu. Probably a Jutsu attack or a technique that was too greedy. His Tenketsu as well as his Chakra system were destroyed, damaging his blood flow. And if she didn't do something, he might lose the use of his arm. She quickly ran to her desk and grabbed her inkwell and a fine brush. Over the next hour Sakura drew numerous seals all over Madara's left arm. These had the function of simulating a chakra network allowing blood to circulate until she could fix the internal problem. Well. Now for the tricky part, Sakura encouraged herself before fetching a large container and filling it with water. She returned to Madara's bedside and placed the large bowl on the bedside table. Repeating the same process as at the Valley of the End, she used pressure points with her index finger to anesthetize the area to be operated on. This awakening was brutal for Madara who asked himself many questions because of the pain he felt. What had happened to him? Where was he? Why did it hurt so much? Then it all came back to him at once. His attack, his defeat, his death, this woman saving his life. His eye turned to her and the scene he saw shocked him, or rather impressed him. She seemed to be operating on him once more. Her right hand was on a large wound in his lung which glowed green. Her left hand was in the air, a large water bubble attached to it, while a trickle of water and blood connected the bubble to his lung. She seemed unaware that she was awake, so he decided not to say anything for fear of making her lose her concentration. The minutes passed and Sakura didn't move an inch. The blood from the lung was getting thinner and thinner before it was finally drained. She finally lowered her arm, not without a sigh of relief as she released the bubble of blood into the bowl. She then gently placed her hands on the rest of Madara's superficial wounds, closing them quickly, and that's when she sensed another problem. What the? There, in his stomach, was a foreign source of chakra that didn't belong to Sakura, let alone Madara. Making him vomit was out of the question because of the cannula at his throat that allowed him to breathe. So she applied pressure points again which drew a slight grunt from Madara. Sakura looked up at the man and saw that he was awake. Sorry. Try to go back to sleep. Sakura once again used the Chikura no Mezu technique to cut open his stomach. There was blood everywhere from the old bleeding and it was in the middle of it all that Sakura spotted the foreign body. A small lump of flesh that Sakura quickly removed and put into a small container. Sweat was beginning to show on her face from the repeated use of her chakra for almost three hours now. Madara's body was now stabilized and out of danger. The only injury she hadn't touched yet was the one in his vertebrae that seemed to be paralyzing him, but it was going to need some rest. Of the many things Sakura brought back from the future, she was glad she had brought medical supplies. A look of total confusion settled over Madara's face as he watched his rescuer stick a needle into his arm that was attached to a strange tube. It was attached to a translucent water bag, which was itself on a metal stand. Sleep, Sakura said before placing her hand on the Uchiha's temple and he felt a tremendous amount of fatigue come over him at her touch. Sakura's chakra forced him to fall asleep, but not without one last thought. Who is she? Sakura then collapsed into a seat beside Madara, exhausted. She was very proud of her work and allowed herself to close her eyes for a few moments, a few minutes, or even the whole night due to exhaustion. Day 1 The rain had stopped during the night and the sun's rays were able to land on Madara's face. The warmth gently penetrated his body and when the rays reached his still valid eye, he slowly awoke. His eyes darted around, he didn't recognize the place and his mysterious rescuer wasn't there. He spotted his belongings lying in a corner, blood still on them. Everything was there, his armor, his clothes, and even his gun by was leaning against the wall. He felt. Strange. He tried to look at his body, but forgot that there was still something in his throat. A grunt of pain came from his mouth and at that moment he heard footsteps coming from a hallway. The stranger entered the room wearing a pale pink tunic and white trousers. She had tied her pink hair in a bun to keep her face clear. Seeing this woman, Madara frowned at a detail he hadn't noticed the day before, since when did women wear anything other than dresses or kimonos? Ah, you're awake, she said in a neutral voice as she approached him. Don't try to speak, 
I'll remove the cannula from your throat first and reopen your lungs. Sakura didn't wait for him to be ready before she removed the plastic object and closed the small wound with her green chakra. When I tell you, take a deep breath. Three, two, one. At the end of her countdown, Sakura unblocked his first lung so that he could breathe through his mouth again. He was coughing hard because he hadn't breathed normally for a whole night. Moreover, the dried blood in his throat did nothing to calm the irritation he felt after the young woman's action on his lung. Here. Drink in small sips. Sakura gently brought a cup of water to his lips. He swallowed small sips and even though it tasted metallic because of his blood, it felt good. Do you feel any pain or discomfort when you swallow? No. Who are you? Madara asked in a small voice as he continued to drink slowly. Prepare yourself. You're going to be in pain. I'm going to open the access to your second lung because this one has been severely damaged. 3, 2, 1, exhale. Madara felt no pain as he felt the pressure of the fingers on his throat, but that was before the young woman continued. Now breathe in. And then Madara knew what she meant by pain. His lung was completely empty and had just filled with air again. There. Slowly, take small breaths, then go slowly with larger ones, Sakura guided in a calm voice as Madara began to get annoyed at not getting any answers. Who are you? He repeated more uncompromisingly. The intonation left no doubt that he demanded to know who she was. But he didn't give her time to answer as he immediately ordered, Answer me woman. At that moment Madara activated his Shirigan and the mere sight made Sakura see red. Her gaze shifted from neutral and professional to that of a skilled ninja. She was after all a woman who had been through the war and she would not be intimidated by a jutsu. No Sharingan. You just came out of chakra exhaustion. Sakura's tone was harsh as her emotions raced through her head. She had just saved him and he was already trying to use his Sharingan on her. Seconds passed and Madara didn't deactivate his jutsu. You won't be the first Uchiha to die by my hand, so I advise you to deactivate your Sharingan. Your name? Madara demanded in a deep voice. Inwardly he was slightly impressed with this woman's temperament. She didn't have an ounce of fear and that characteristic glint in her eye, a war veteran. Who was she to be so confident in front of him? Haruno Sakura. Now deactivate your Sharingan before I do it for you. With a name finally on her face, Madara deactivated his jutsu, but did not look away. It wasn't tomorrow that the great Uchiha Madara was going to bow down to a common woman, no matter how powerful she was. Sakura leaned towards him and stared into his left eye for a few moments. Her face was scrunched up, as if she was looking for an anomaly. Look to the right. Look to the left. Don't use your Sharingan again until I tell you to. Then she pulled the brown hair from the other side of his face before continuing. Open your eye and keep it open. She gently placed her hand on it before a soft chakra flowed out to heal the inside of the eyeball. For now, she could do nothing for the eye itself. Aren't you going to ask me my name? I already know who you are. Madara. This greatly disturbed the Uchiha who had no idea where this woman came from. He knew all of the greatest ninjas of the elemental nations and someone of her ilk would have been the talk of the town. Someone who could break through a cliff, someone who could master chakra at such a high level. How do you know me? Who doesn't know Uchiha Madara? Sakura retorted as she withdrew her hand and gave further instructions. You can close it again, it might itch, but don't touch it. When her eye inspection was complete, Sakura walked over to her desk and grabbed an inkwell with a fine brush. What are you doing? The man questioned, intrigued by the objects she held in her hand. Seals to keep you alive and help you heal. Sakura was drawing seals on his bladder, followed by his intestines. Each stroke turned blue before returning to its original color. It took her about ten minutes to draw everything, then she inspected her work. When she saw no mistakes she turned her gaze to Madara's face. With these two seals, you won't have to go to the bathroom anymore. As long as you are paralyzed or until you are a little more independent, I will leave them on. Where did you come from? Asked Madara, who had never been so curious about anyone. 
she exuded mystery and that bothered him to no end. At the end of that question, he saw great pain in the depths of her eyes. From a place that no longer exists. Sakura was plagued by many memories of seeing the person responsible for her departure. As she remembered it all, tears were coming to the corners of her eyes. She decided to stand up before she looked weak in front of this man. She didn't think it would be so hard to be in his presence. After all, even if he was her enemy, he was the last person who was also in her time. She wanted to cry so badly, but couldn't afford to, so she left the room before it was too late. A hint of regret. That was what Madara had felt as he watched this strong woman break from the inside out. Then he looked down at his own body, he had many bandages on his torso, where he had undergone operations. His left arm was covered with seals that seemed to glisten in a very small way, hardly visible to the naked eye. Seeing all this he wondered how competent this woman was. How many people in the world were capable of having chakra control like hers? Who was capable of having superhuman strength that even he, the great Madara Uchiha would not be able to match? Was she affiliated with the Uzumaki clan to use Finjutsu with such ease? And her eyes. She was a woman who had seen war. I assume you're hungry, Sakura said as she returned with a tray in her hands. It consisted of two bowls, a glass of water and a pair of chopsticks. The sadness had disappeared from her eyes and was replaced by neutrality. Yes. The dark-haired man could feel the sweet smell filling his nostrils, and he realized that he was horribly hungry. He hadn't eaten since the night before and his body was craving something to replace the loss of blood and chakra. Sakura placed the tray on the bedside table before sitting down in a chair near the bed. Unfortunately, the stomach surgery means that you won't be able to eat your fill for a while, Sakura explained as she picked up the bowl of soup. She grabbed the spoon and filled it before blowing gently on it. She held the spoon up to Madara's lips and he didn't know whether to be insulted, open his mouth or tell her off for what she was doing. I know you don't like being dependent on someone Achiha-san, but you have to eat and you're in no condition to feed yourself. Reluctantly, Madara opened his mouth and enjoyed the taste of the hot soup in his mouth. His gaze never left Sakura for a moment as she fed him. He was extremely ashamed of this situation but his attention was diverted when she spoke again. This soup contains all the ingredients necessary to boost blood production. For today I can only give you one bowl because of the recent surgery. When she finished, Sakura put the empty bowl down before grabbing the second bowl of rice and the pair of chopsticks. Why do you hate me? If Sakura was surprised by this question she didn't show it. She adjusted the chopsticks in her fingers before handing Madara a portion of rice. Chew until the rice is mush in your mouth. And what makes you say I hate you? Sakura asked innocently. The man took the time to chew his mouthful long and hard as the woman had advised before swallowing and speaking. You may be able to hide your emotions, but your eyes don't fool me. Let's just say that I don't hold most of your clan in my heart. Why? Asked Madara in return, very surprised. Another bite was brought to his lips, and this one was also chewed for a long time. Every Uchiha I've ever met has tried to kill me, to subdue me, to hurt me. Sakura had to admit that even the love of her life had done nothing but hurt her. He had played with her feelings, broken them and thrown them away. If it wasn't for the intervention of her sensei and Naruto, she would have died by his hand. I never hurt you. Not yet. Madara may have been a very good observer of emotions, but Sakura had the future as an advantage, allowing her to come out with half-truths. For after all, Madara hadn't hurt her yet. At least not yet. She set the empty bowl down on the tray before grabbing the glass of water and bringing it to the patient's mouth. Drink slowly. Why are you doing all this? What do you mean? Sakura asked confused. Why did you save my life? Why are you helping me get better? If you hate my clan so much, then why are you bothering to save its leader? I took the Hippocratic Oath. The real reason. The real reason. Sakura wondered as well, had she done the right thing by saving his life? I wonder why myself, Sakura whispered more to herself than to Madara. She placed her hand on the dark-haired man's temple before saying, Sleep now, you need plenty of rest. 
And as she said this, Madara sank back into unconsciousness. Will I be able to change him? Chapter 5 Day 4 Just as she had to learn to control her chakra, Sakura had to learn to control her emotions throughout her ninja training. And that was something most difficult. For by definition, a human being was driven by their emotions whether they were positive or negative. Very few people could completely disregard them and be mere tools. Sakura knew this all too well having seen and experienced it herself on many occasions, emotions were an integral part of being human. Hate could drive one to kill just as compassion could prevent one from doing so. Her master had taught her that even if one could not completely suppress one's emotions, it was possible to manage them. To do so, one had to resort to meditation, which also allowed the shinobi to discover their inner chakra. But very few people knew how to use meditation to be in tune with their chakra. And that was what Sakura had been doing for a month now. Currently standing at the edge of her garden promontory, her hands were resting against her abdomen, palms up. Her senses were on alert, watching for any suspicious noise around her. Her concentration was on her chakra, to feel it inside her, to feel it running through all her coils, through her tenketsu. In a month, she had understood how to harmonize with her chakra, allowing her to save her own. However, this was not enough for the young woman, she wanted to understand the mystery that resided in the composition of chakra, the physical energy and the spiritual energy. She knew that this power was the assembly of the two, but she could not understand where they became one. Where did these two energies meet to form this famous chakra? That was what Sakura had been looking for for almost an hour, not knowing that she had been watched for a long time by Madara in his bed. Like every morning, he saw Sakura open the French windows wide, giving him a breathtaking view of the garden as well as the valley. He wasn't sure what to make of this young woman who had her back to him. He owed her so much, he even owed her a life debt, which was no small matter. Very few people in the shinobi world could say that Madara owed them. And that was why the man had kept silent for the past few days. It was a way to thank her, but at the same time, a way to observe and determine who she was. He followed carefully and silently the routine that had been set up regarding his care. She would gently place her hands on his chest each time before her chakra entered him, it was gentle, pleasant and comforting. Then, after checking his vitals, she would check the status of his seals to see if everything was in order. She always asked the same questions during her inspection, did he feel any discomfort? A pain? Or an itch? Then, once her inspection routine was complete, she would go back into what appeared to be a kitchen and return with a tray of food. He was only allowed one bowl of soup and rice at the moment, which was far from satisfying his hunger. He felt like demanding more, but his mouth would remain shut every time, perhaps because he knew that this woman knew what she was doing. Once he had finished eating, she would force him to fall asleep, claiming that his body needed a lot of rest and as little stress as possible. Was it a genjutsu she was applying to him to sleep? Or was it one of the effects of her kekiai genkai? For to Madara, the green chakra she was using could only be a kekiai genkai and a very rare one at that. He had never seen this kind of thing in his life and she wielded it as effectively as he wielded ninjutsu. So it was once again deep in thought that Madara began to stare at his savior outside the house. What did his life mean now? He was paralyzed, half-blind and dependent on a woman for survival. He was so ashamed of himself at the moment that anger overcame him. He felt miserable that he had failed in his goal of peace, that he had not been able to save his clan from its fate, that he was finally. Nothing. Madara was so deep in remorse that he gasped slightly at the sound of Sakura's voice near him. Good morning Uchiha-san, did you sleep well? Sakura asked politely as she put down the large pillow she was sitting on. Yes, Madara said knowing the routine was about to begin. Do you feel any pain in your torso? She began as she gently placed her hands on the newly operated areas. Only if I have to take a deep breath. It'll be a while before you can breathe fully again, Sakura explained before taking a pair of scissors to cut the bandages around his body. Where did you learn all this? Madara asked before Sakura lifted her gaze to look her patient in the eyes. She saw that there was no animosity in the dark-haired man's eyes, only curiosity. Most of my skills were learned by myself, Sakura revealed before removing the entire blood-stained bandages. 
the superficial scars had disappeared entirely through her Iryo ninjutsu. However, the three operations she had performed would be visible forever. The three scars were still a pinkish red, but it seemed to have closed up nicely. You learned that. By yourself? Madara repeated slightly skeptically. He could see no trace of lies in her eyes, but he still had great doubts about the veracity of her words. I'm going to sit you up slowly, if you feel any pain in your stomach, tell me immediately, Sakura demanded before carrying out her task. She brought her left arm up to the Uchiha's back as her eyes darted back and forth between the stomach and Madara's facial expressions. Stop! Madara said with difficulty as he practically sat up. Sakura pulled him back slightly before placing her hand on his abs once more. Is this an overall pain? Or is it a sharp pain in the scar? It was a sharp pain, like having a blade shoved into my stomach, the dark-haired man answered, as a shinobi he knew what a weapon penetrating flesh felt like, especially since his fight with Hashirama Senju. Good. The healing is going better than expected. Sakura continued to apply her Iryo ninjutsu regardless of their proximity and as their faces came within 20 centimeters of each other, Madara turned his face towards the green-eyed woman. Answer my question Haruno-san, Madara asked softly in a deep voice. Sakura was caught off guard, this was the first time Madara had called her Haruno-san. If he deigned to call a woman by her name and add the suffix, san it was because he had a modicum of respect for her. I didn't learn on my own at first. Like everyone else, I had a master, Sakura revealed before looking away. Her mind was at odds, part of her wanted him to be mean like the Madara she knew and then she would know how to react. But another part of her was glad to see that he could be at least civilized. Who is your master? Was. Sakura replied as she tilted the man forward again before asking, still in pain. Better. Still painful, but bearable. Try taking a deep breath and tell me if the pain is the same in your lung. Madara complied and he had to admit that it was easier to breathe. Better. Well, it looks like your lung has recovered slightly and your ribs are under less pressure, Sakura remarked before tipping Madara completely onto the bed. Continue to take only shallow breaths though, until your organ heals. Madara fell back into thought as Sakura left the room. The Kekiai Genkai theory was still possible, but it was also reduced since he had been taught some of her skills. Was it possible to learn from her? Meanwhile, Sakura was outside her house filling a wooden tub with water. A small stool and a large table were set up near it. Towels were laid out here and there with various bottles on the table. For several days her patient had been confined to bed without being able to move. Until now she had not been able to move him because of the recent operations, but the organs were now stable. And it was time to bathe the convalescent, as he was still covered in dirt and blood, just like the bed he was lying in. The risk of infection had to be ruled out at all costs. Sakura also poured a bath bead she had brought with her from the future. As she poured more water, the pearl released a foam that would camouflage the inside of the water. She hoped that this would make Madara less self-conscious when he was in the bath. Positioning her hands in the water, she worked her chakra to heat it to a comfortable temperature before returning to the house. Once at her patient's level she placed her hands at the seals on his stomach. His bladder was currently empty as were his bowels, signs that the seals were working properly. She emitted a spike of chakra in order to deactivate them, as the water could alter the ink, which could do irreversible damage. She then pulled the blankets off of Madara's body before taking him in her arms like a bride. What are you doing? He complained, he hated being carried like that. Stop being such a brat, Sakura retorted, ignoring his protests. He wasn't the first man who had been ashamed to be held like that. Put me down woman. No. It's time to take a bath Uchiha-san. You've been waiting in your filth for four days and now and now that your condition has stabilized, it's time to do something about it. After his body was fully immersed in the warm water, a sigh of well-being escaped his mouth. Only his shoulders, his left arm and his head were not underwater. Her left arm especially shouldn't be wet because of all the seals on it, so Sakura wrapped it in a towel just to be safe. Try to relax, your muscles need it, Sakura advised as she rolled up her sleeves to her biceps before dipping her hands into the hot water. What are you doing now? 
Madara snarled as she felt the woman take off her underwear. I'm taking off your underwear, you need to be washed all over Uchiha-san. This is humiliating, Madara growled now annoyed. Listen, Sakura began, pinching the bridge of her nose at the approach of a potential headache from this argument. You're not the first patient I've had on my hands and you're also not the first man I've seen naked. You need to be washed, so swallow your misplaced pride and let me do it. Don't order me around, woman. I'll give you orders if I want Uchiha-san, you're currently under my care and if I order you to do something for your health, you'll comply, Sakura warned before taking a glove and soap in her hands. Who do you think you're talking to? Madara asked increasingly annoyed. To me you're nothing, so stop whining. I'm not amused by this any more than you are, and don't even think about activating your Sharingan to try to change my mind. Haven't you ever had a woman wash you in the past? H.N. Madara said before turning his head away in annoyance. That famous onomatopoeia, today Sakura had confirmation that this trait Sasuke had was a family trait. For a moment she felt a twinge of sadness as she remembered the love of her life. If you're that embarrassed, close your eyes and enjoy the hot water. In all his anger and shame, Madara slowly began to relax and enjoy the moment, but of course that was something he would never admit to. He couldn't remember when the last time was that he had taken time to relax and rest properly. His life had been full of battles, plots, betrayals and wars. So it seemed strange to take a bath and be washed. Nevertheless, he had to admit that she was delicate in her gestures and did her best not to embarrass him or hint. This only put more questions in his mind. After a while, he felt something wet on his face. His first reflex was to open his eyes before noticing that she was washing his face. Why was she doing this? Why was she doing all this after what his clan had done to her? She didn't want to tell him, but her previous answers made him think that members of his family had potentially destroyed her village. Was she trying to make him pay by making him feel ashamed? By making him live like a cripple? Why are you doing this? He asked after a moment of silence. What do you mean Uchiha-san? Why did you save me that night? I'm a shadow of my former self, he answered in disgust. Yes, that was what he felt disgust at what he had become, a wreck. Because I had the power, Sakura said, gently tapping her face flannel on Madara's right eyelid. And hope for what in the end? To end my life on a bed waiting to die. Madara retorted sarcastically. Life is a gift we've been given and that's why it's called the present, Sakura said wisely. How is being paralyzed a gift? The dark-haired man was indignant, not inclined to philosophize about life. Who said you were going to stay paralyzed? Sakura questioned with a raised eyebrow. I'm sorry, what? Do you really think you're going to stay paralyzed? Sakura questioned with an amused smile. It didn't escape the Uchiha's notice that she was smiling, it was the first time he'd seen that expression on her face. Still smiling, she left her question hanging for a few seconds before continuing. I have every intention of making you walk again Uchiha-san. Sure, it will take time, but I can guarantee that one day you will be able to be a shinobi again. We shall see, Madara said with a spark of hope in his heart. Without a doubt, this woman was convinced and determined to make it happen. The dark-haired man sensed that her eyes spoke the truth as she told him to get back on his feet and restore his dignity as a ninja. Close your left eye, Sakura asked to clean his eyelid. How come I've never heard of you? I'm a pretty private person, Sakura said but Madara wasn't having it, he was sick of all the secrets she refused to divulge. Stop taking me for a fool, Hirono-san. You know things I didn't even know existed until I met you. You have skills that would make many ninjas swoon and your knowledge of the human body could revolutionize the shinobi world. How many human beings could be saved if you taught what you know? So answer me honestly. Upon hearing this Sakura understood that there was hope in this man. Sure, he understood that she was a ninja and that her abilities were not common, but he had analyzed her skills for the good of man and not to wage war. Few men thought that way and it warmed her heart. I apologize, Uchiha-san, but this is something I would like to keep to myself for now. We all have our secrets, lean your head back, Sakura said before standing up and taking a bucket to fill it with water. 
she poured the water from the bucket over Madara's hair, being careful not to drip the liquid on his face. Then she grabbed a container of shampoo and applied it to his hair. Madara could feel fingers energetically scrubbing his hair as well as his skull. You were trained in the ninja arts, weren't you? Madara questioned, though it was more of a statement than a question. You seem surprised that this is possible. Why shouldn't a woman be? The cherry blossom questioned earnestly, trying to make up his own mind about how the dark-haired man viewed women. It's not a woman's job. Usually they are too weak or too sensitive to do what is necessary, he stated unscrupulously and eloquently. Sakura wasn't at all surprised by the answer, since it echoed what the Rikudo had told her before she came here. And even though she was offended by his disregard for women, she kept it to herself. She continued with her current mission she rinsed all the lather from the dark-haired man's hair before grabbing a large comb to begin the long task of detangling. Don't be fooled Uchiha-san, just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I'm weak. I am quite capable of taking someone's life. My knowledge makes me a lethally dangerous person. I have as much blood on my hands as you have on yours, despite myself, she said calmly, still tending to the dark-haired man's hair. If you regret the death of your enemies then that makes you weak, the man retorted scornfully. Sakura didn't answer right away in order to keep her nerves under control. This man was truly one of a kind. One minute he was giving her hope that maybe he could change and be open-minded, and the next minute he was a complete fool again. On the contrary, it's what makes me human, she contradicted wisely as she finished untangling the man's black mane. She grabbed a dry towel and rubbed it in, removing as much moisture as possible. Is it weak to reach out? Is it weak to help others? Does that make me weak for saving you from death, Uchiha Madara? No answer came from the Uchiha, and besides, Sakura didn't expect an answer from him, for in her heart she knew she was right. She then reached into the bath to grab Madara's body and pull him out of the water. She quickly laid him on the table before covering his private parts first so that he wouldn't be too embarrassed. Once he was dry, she put on his underwear, followed by black silk trousers, and then took him in her arms again. How do you do that? Asked Madara, who still couldn't believe the strength of this woman. Her arms were thin, muscular but thin. Logically a person of her physique could never have lifted him with such ease. Not that he felt fat, but he was quite aware of the weight he was carrying. What do you mean? How come you're lifting me like I don't weigh anything? Madara demanded. I don't know, Sakura answered boldly, flashing that small, enigmatic smile she suspected must have infuriated the Uchiha. She laid him gently on the cushions around the coffee table before moving to the bed and removing the bloody sheets and blankets. You want me to believe you don't know where your strength comes from? No, I'm just saying that I don't intend to reveal my skills to the first person I meet. Do I ask you about your Sharingan? About its characteristics? Or what you could do with it? She objected as she grabbed new sheets from one of the wardrobes. No. Although I think you know more than you should, Madara conceded. This woman intrigued him because he knew she was hiding things from him, far too many things, and the Uchiha wasn't used to not getting straight answers. She was quite different from all the women he had met, and the way she avoided answering while pushing him to think even more, proved to him that she was indeed a ninja. He even had confirmation of this when she added. Maybe, but it's our job to go out and gather information. He remained silent as he watched her make the bed until she came to pick him up and put him comfortably in it in a semi-sitting position. No discomfort or pain. She asked solicitously. Other than my pride. Nothing, Madara pouted. Sakura didn't react to the remark, though it might have made her smile inside. As great a shinobi as he was, Madara Uchiha was still a man who acted like a real kid who was upset that people didn't obey him. She walked over to her desk and picked up her inkwell and brush again. She settled herself comfortably on the bed, giving her a good position to draw the bladder and bowel seals with care, these had been erased during the bath. Are you affiliated with the Uzumaki clan? The dark-haired man continued, looking for clues about the young woman. No, Sakura answered without hesitation, though inwardly she hoped one day to meet with them to discuss the art of Finjutsu. Then how come you have the same seal as Mito Uzumaki? He asked suspiciously. After all, as far as he knew, 
only the daughter of the Uzumaki leader had such a frontal seal. The Uzumaki are not the only ones skilled in the art of Finjutsu. Certainly, they are the most competent in the world, but nothing says that this seal is exclusive to their clan or even that it was invented by them. And I don't know who this Mito Uzumaki is, but I highly doubt that her seal is on par with mine, she said without humility. Pretentiousness, that was what Madara sensed in that last sentence as the young woman drew seals on her skin. She knew, or rather was certain that her seal was more powerful than Mito Uzumaki's, who had the reputation of being a virtuoso of Finjutsu. But she declared that she did not know her. But who are you at the end? You come out of nowhere with skills no one has ever seen and you claim to be better than Mito Uzumaki in Finjutsu, the dark-haired man exasperated. Aren't I? Sakura added naturally as she continued to make the intricate tracings on her patient's body. So you know Mito to be so certain, he concluded by deduction. Only by reputation, Sakura replied before putting down her tools and activating the two seals. Who are you? Repeated Madara once more, emphasizing each word. Does it really matter who I am? Can't you just settle for Sakura Haruno, the person who saved you from death and takes care of you? She had no intention of revealing anything more concrete about herself to him, now or later for that matter. The Uchiha understood that for the moment he would have nothing more. He was content with this argument and did not insist, although he had to admit that the little he had seen of this woman confirmed that she was potentially better than Mido. I'll go and prepare some food, would you prefer to stay like this or would you like some reading? Do you have a book on what you did to my heart? Are you sure? You might not understand anything, the young woman said, not expecting him to want to learn about such a subject. Yes. Sakura walked over to one of her bookcases before grabbing one particular book, it had a brown cover and looked quite thick. It was a book that had been written by her former master. But this information only Sakura knew since before she left for the past, she had had the names of some of her books changed to avoid suspicion. In case anyone came across them. The Kunoichi was now glad she had thought of this since her patient was asking for this type of reading. The Human Heart by Tsunade Haruno, Madara read as he grabbed the book with his one able-bodied arm. Was that your mother? Yes. Happy reading, Sakura replied quickly. She didn't want to be interrogated again, even if in a way it was a half-truth. She had always considered Tsunade Senju a second mother. She then went to the kitchen to prepare the meal. Madara stared blankly for a few minutes at where Sakura had gone before coming to. The theory of the Kekiai Genkai seemed to take over when he saw Tsunade Haruno's name on the cover of this book. He opened it at a random place and came across a very detailed diagram that made his eyes widen. There were so many details, too many details and too much information. Thanks to his Sharingan, Madara had become accustomed to reading very quickly and did not waste a moment to immerse himself in his reading. Everything was explained about how the human heart worked, there were many diagrams to represent its physiology. Each part of the organ had its own name to describe it, and it was even explained how to perform an operation for a particular injury. As Sakura had warned her just before, many of the words had no meaning to him, surely medical terms. After twenty minutes of reading, Madara realized what the young woman cooking in the next room had done. Without a doubt, it was something he would be absolutely incapable of reproducing. If such a book existed, why was this the first he'd heard of it? Why weren't people like Sakura or her mother referred to in any of his reports? Why had no one mentioned these people? Was he a clan? All these questions were driving him crazy. His reading was interrupted by the arrival of the person at the center of all his thoughts. She placed a steaming bowl of rice and vegetables on her desk before coming towards him with a tray. It was like any other day, just two bowls and a glass of water. Why didn't your mother ever publish this book? Madara asked as she slowly sipped the soup Sakura was serving him. Sakura didn't answer right away. She was thinking about what would have happened if Tsunade had actually tried to publish this book in the Sengoku era. Because of the men of the time it probably would have been impossible. That was one of the things that really irritated Sakura, the supremacy of men over women in the Sengoku era. She tried to do it. However, because she was a woman she wasn't taken seriously 
on the grounds that a common woman didn't know anything about medicine and should leave it to those who did, Sakura explained with undisguised resentment. You don't hold men in your heart, Madara remarked. That's not the point, Uchiha-san. What I hate are men who think they're above women just because they have a pair of balls between their legs, Sakura said, looking Madara straight in the eye so the message would be understood. Is that a threat? Interpret it any way you like, it's a big deal to me. Recognition isn't one of my priorities in life, Sakura replied sharply before holding a mouthful of rice to Madara's lips. What do you aspire to in life then? The dark-haired man asked curiously. Madara didn't get an answer, but rather a look of intensity from the woman who seemed to be sizing him up, as if to see if he was ready to get a real answer from her. I long for many things in life, Uchiha-san, and none of them are easy to obtain, Sakura half admitted sadly. She longed to see her friends, her teachers, her family, her world. But most of all she longed to bring peace to this world, yet she couldn't reveal her true motives to him yet. She turned her attention back to the bowl of rice in her hands, perhaps looking for the solution to what was troubling her after the dark-haired man's question. Is that why you saved me? Maybe, Sakura said in a small voice. You didn't save me without a reason then, Madara insisted before receiving a hard, closed look from the young woman. I admit at first I wanted to crush your brains in the same way I destroyed Black Zetsu the other night, Sakura said coldly. The warrior's face was back in place, one of the facets Madara loved the most. But. I couldn't judge you until I got to know you, so I saved you. To see if you were like every other Uchiha I've ever met. And. Sakura paused for a moment before looking away. Madara didn't say anything, he'd learned a lot in a short time and didn't want to spoil it. Some of the sentences seemed to make her come out of her shell. She was a woman of character, one who didn't let herself be pushed around, but once you knew how to deal with her, she was less scary. And? Madara encouraged gently. And I thought if you were different, maybe you could help me, Sakura finished as she set down the second bowl. This gave the brunette food for thought before a detail came to mind. Who was this black Setsu? No sooner had he finished his question than a sound of breaking glass was heard. Looking down he saw that the young woman had just crushed the glass in her hands. Her face was filled with hatred and anger at the mere mention of that name. He was one of the people responsible for the disappearance of the people I loved, Sakura replied before sighing and picking up the pieces of glass from the floor. You need to sleep Uchiha-san, she said sharply to end the subject. Is that really necessary? Yes, your body still needs rest. One last question, what are you helping with? The Uchiha persisted. Sakura looked at him then with what seemed to be hope, but also fear. She no longer struggled with what she should or shouldn't say to him, and said distinctly. Bringing peace to this rotten world, before quickly placing her fingers on Madara's temple. This conversation had exhausted her, and she couldn't bear to debate the subject with him. Sleep, she said in a whisper as he was already drifting off to sleep. Sakura grabbed the book he held in his hand and placed it on the bedside table as tears rolled down her cheeks. Chapter 6 Day 5 Bringing Peace to This Rotten World This was a project he had had since he was very young. Despite his violent upbringing, Madara longed for only one thing peace. Sure, he had learned to appreciate the taste of battle and blood, but his ambition was too strong to give in to his instincts. And that's why this phrase kept turning over and over in his head. Ever since he woke up, he couldn't stop thinking about Sakura and her desire to bring peace to this world. He never imagined he would meet anyone else with the same ideal as him, except for Hashirama Senju. Inevitably, the dark-haired man plunged into the past he had known, a past synonymous with war and death. Indeed, Madara was born in a period called the Muromachi era, the time of the War of the Provinces. This period had been very long and bloody because hundreds of ninja clans were constantly fighting each other, leading to perpetual conflicts between the nations. Each wanted to expand their territory and establish their dominance over the other. Over the years, two clans stood out for their strength, the Senju clan and the Uchiha clan. They were known and recognized for their equal strength and their tenacity in war. They were therefore regularly called upon by nations who wished to go to war against each other. 
After a while, every confrontation was nothing more than the Uchiha against the Senju. This constant pitting of the Uchiha against the Senju only served to reinforce the deep enmity they felt for each other. It was in this spirit of hatred and conflict that Madara was born. Unfortunately he did not have a typical childhood. While the other children of his age played hide and seek, he had to learn to masking himself in order to kill. He didn't know what it was like to grow up in the innocence and love of a family, instead he was brought up to experience the pain and suffering that hatred brings. His whole life was about getting up, training, killing, crying in silence, going to bed and doing it again. Because of the extreme violence of the conflicts, the average age of the shinobi was no more than 30. This average age was constantly decreasing because many of the ninjas who lost their lives in these battles were children. Thus, with the constant loss of their loved ones, a never-ending cycle of revenge was born, to the point where the shinobi hid their family names for fear of retribution. Madara also remembered that at that time he met Hashirama who had the same desire to bring peace to this rotten world. Both boys grew up to become leaders of their respective rival clans. And despite their childhood friendship, both inevitably became enemies. It was also during this time that Madara and his brother discovered the secrets of the Sharingan becoming the first to awaken to the Mangekyo Sharingan. Unfortunately, this pupil blinded its user with repeated use. And one thing led to another, with the constant conflicts, Madara's vision deteriorated until his brother decided to give him his own eyes after a fatal injury. Thanks to this, Madara obtained an eternal Manjiki Sharingan with which he could continue to fight without suffering from my degradation. Nevertheless, Madara remembered that even after decades of conflict here the violence of the fighting only increased to the point of carnage. Most of the clans under the banner of the Uchiha and Senju clans, decided to form the first lasting truce between the people. Madara, however, was the only person who opposed this peace. He argued with his own clan to convince them to continue fighting, that it was all hypocrisy. But he was finally forced to form a permanent alliance with the Senju clan. Soon after, a pact was formed with the daimyo of the Land of Fire and as a result, Kanoha no Sato was founded. This created an unprecedented movement as others did the same, creating the five great ninja countries and their villages. When the alliance treaty was proposed, Madara flatly refused to sign it and opposed his entire clan. Indeed, the clause of the treaty was inadmissible for the dark-haired man, because it placed the Uchiha clan below the Senju clan. And it was out of the question that his clan would be in such a position, it was both a matter of pride, but also a matter of preservation. Madara, as a great visionary, felt that despite the existence of this truce, the common hatred that had been ingrained for generations would always be present and would one day resurface. So when he saw this so-called peace achieved, or rather negotiated, he couldn't help but ask himself the following question, for how long? For him, this peace was false and would not last, how could it since the inhabitants hated each other? So Madara took the first step to impose his vision of what true peace was in this rotten world. But he failed, and was now physically diminished. Dependent on a mysterious woman who shared the same desire for peace. This rotten world, Madara whispered, at first he had thought that Sakura's words had been spoken in the air. But the look on the young woman's face didn't deceive, she really wanted to bring peace to this world. This woman had probably had to experience the same suffering as him to desire this kind of thing. And it was with this thought that Madara watched Sakura meditate outside on this beautiful sunny day. Until she came to perform her medical routine. As always, she was thorough and professional in her work, and Madara had to admit that she was very efficient in what she did. The pain was lessening by the day, and he could only look forward to being able to walk again. Haruno san, Madara called out in a deep voice as she poured green chakra into his scars. Yes, Achiha san. She asked, looking up slightly. What have you been through to have the desire to bring peace? The young woman didn't answer right away, too surprised by the intensity of the request. There was both hesitation and hope in Madara's eyes that was shocking. Sakura quickly thought of a lie so she wouldn't tell him her entire life story, but rather a potential life in the Muromachi era. The war. Sakura began, returning to her medical duties. My life was ruled by it. Having to hide because of the many turf wars, having to look like a man so I wouldn't be raped by invaders. 
learning to become a weapon to protect my people and watching my loved ones die for bullshit. The end of her sentence was spoken with rage and Madara could see that tears were forming in the corners of her green eyes. She quickly ran her hand over the budding tears before continuing. Human beings are so horrible, greedy, selfish, thinking only of their own interests without thinking of the consequences of their actions. Some people just want to live in peace and quiet without worrying about others. So I've learned to become strong so that no one can tell me what to do, Sakura continued firmly as she finished checking her old operations. I'm going to straighten you out like I did the day before, warn me of any pain. What is peace to you? Madara questioned very puzzled as he was tipped forward. The pain he felt was still present in his abdomen, but much more bearable. It's not a sharp pain anymore, it's constant when you straighten me up, he told the young woman. Try to hold on for a minute while I sort this out. And I admit your question isn't simple Uchiha-san, Sakura said before her hand turned green again. Then use your own words, I'd really like to know your opinion on the matter, Madara insisted. Living in harmony with your neighbor, not being jealous or envious when someone else does better than you. Knowing how to help your neighbor without expecting anything in return. A world where people move forward united, not divided. A world where power over others is no longer the driving force of society, Sakura says hopefully, while imagining that this could actually be possible. Unfortunately, such a world cannot exist Haruno-san, Madara disillusioned. He too had imagined it, but experience had proven it impossible. I know, the human being is too stupid to understand it. Are you alright? Bearable, the Uchiha replied, concentrating on the benefits this woman was giving him. I think this world is a hopeless case that doesn't deserve to live, he asserted vigorously. That's a bit radical Uchiha-san, not everyone is a despicable being, Sakura defended as she tipped Madara onto the bed. In a way, she agreed with him. Her two-year journey in his time had allowed her to grow up and see the true face of humanity. Many people deserve to die for who they were and for the actions they committed. But to generalize to the whole population was not to be exaggerated. Man never learns as well as he does in pain, the Uchiha said in a deep voice. I sadly agree with you Uchiha-san, Sakura nodded before removing the blankets from her patient's body. I'm going to take you outside to get some sunlight, a little light won't hurt you considering your pallor. Hn. Madara allowed himself to be carried, but not without a little reluctance. The weather was beautiful and it would have been a shame to stay cooped up brooding. He was placed on a wicker chaise long with a cushion on it. Are you comfortable, Uchiha-san? Sakura worried as she watched for any expression of pain or embarrassment on his face. After all, no matter how careful she was, the slightest change in position could cause even the slightest risk of damage to her work. Yes, the view is beautiful. Sakura sat down beside him in a chair before opening a green-covered book she held in one hand. Who would have thought the great Madara Uchiha would be able to appreciate the beauty of a place? The more time passed the more Sakura discovered a person completely different from the man she thought she knew. She had formed the idea that he could only be a cold, calculating, crazy man who only wanted to destroy the world. But she realized that you could only really claim to know someone by sharing time with them. And even though he had certain traits that were totally in line with the character she had been described, Madara Uchiha was a different person altogether. A thoughtful person, able to appreciate the simple things in life. I agree with you, it's really soothing, Sakura confirmed, crossing her legs as she resumed her reading. Long minutes passed as the sun began its journey to slowly reach its zenith. Every once in a while a small cloud would come in and reduce the intensity of the sun before it began to move across the sky again. Having just lost everything, Madara never thought he would be so relaxed in his life. Was it the location? Or the fact that he was in the presence of this stranger who was taking care of him? Or was it the knowledge that the shinobi world thought he was dead? How can I help you bring peace? Madara asked after a moment, his gaze still on the valley. The people below were harvesting in the rice fields, there must have been twenty of them working in a coordinated fashion. Your Uchiha Madara, she stated simply but resolutely. Sakura knew that this simple name commanded respect and fear. It opened many doors for her world peace projects. 
she intended to use the illustrious reputation the Uchiha offered to do just that. I am but a shadow of my former self, he despaired, and I remind you that I am believed dead. For now. And don't forget who you are, Sakura reassured him with conviction. What would you do? Madara asked curiously. What would your plan be to bring peace? Sakura stopped reading, she had thought long and hard about the question. For, as the Rikid Senin had told her, peace could be achieved in many ways. I would act intelligently, Sakura began, looking up at the sky as she searched for words. The world is ruled by money and power, so all I'd need first is enough money and influence to get some people on my side. Wouldn't that make you what you hate? We've been taught to do the dirty work Uchiha-san, if I have to bribe a few people and slit a few throats to get my way, I'll do it without hesitation, Sakura said forcefully. She wasn't the same as she was two years ago, Sakura had sadly realized that the world was rotten and vicious. To succeed, one had to play this twisted game in order to have any hope of showing her vision. So yes, the young woman was aware that in order to get the desired result, one sometimes had to get their hands dirty and act in ways that some would call immoral. She took a deep breath before continuing. Once this is in place, I will take advantage of people's distress. Distress. Madara gasped at her mention of it. The world is ravaged by war and the cycle of hatred has been with us since the world began. When a person is devastated by fear, loss and suffering what does he do to keep from sinking further? They call for help. And what happens when someone reaches out to them? She takes it. The people you reach out to will all have one thing in common, they are victims of war. So they will stick together, they will not think about their past differences, because they will be in a new home that they will cherish and protect. How will doing this bring peace to the whole world? Until we become big enough for the big five countries to fear us. While they spend years killing each other, we'll grow stronger until the big five countries are nothing compared to what we've become, Sakura explained with determination. She seemed to have thought about how to bring peace. She wanted a world for those who deserved it. Her master had taught her through her role as Hokage that you must make sacrifices for the good of the many. Fools who only thought of themselves, power and war had no place in this world of peace. So if they had to die, she would let them die, Sakura was willing to do that. For the good of the many. Unfortunately the big countries will not give you time to become a threat. You will be the target of assassination, Shinobi will be sent to wreak havoc on your people. The best way to destroy a country is to destroy it from within first. Your vision of peace is not feasible Haruno-san, Madara said as he saw the flaws in the young Haruno's plan. Sakura turned her gaze to the Uchiha and an enigmatic smile settled on her lips. This is where you would come in, Uchiha-san. What do you mean by that? I know you want to bring peace Uchiha-san, it's evident in the questions you're asking me. But I feel that the method you used to bring peace was not the right one. Force? Yes, but not so brutal. Or at least not at the right time. What do you know about my methods woman? Madara snarled, not liking the accusation of this woman who was also belittling him. I'm not trying to criticize you Uchiha-san, but as powerful as you are, you can't stand alone against the whole world. And that's why you failed Hashirama Senju, Sakura explained, knowing far too much for her own good. You're playing a dangerous game, Haruno, Madara threatened as he finished being friendly. Sakura sighed at the brunette's attitude before going to the nearby forest to look for twigs. Once she found enough, she returned to her seat. That branch is you. No matter how strong it is, alone it will be destroyed, Sakura demonstrated, breaking the branch in half with her fingers. But if you're united, you become invincible. Sakura gathered the ten or so twigs with the rest of the branch and bent them slightly to show their strength before continuing her explanation. I never said that your vision of peace was wrong, just that the way to achieve it may not have been the right way. And don't give me any of your grandstanding about, I'm a man, I know better, Sakura anticipated, moving her index finger towards Madara as she began to get to know him a little. H.N. The minutes passed without either of them deigning to speak, enjoying the gentle warmth of the sun and the delicate breeze of the wind. One studied while the other pondered the possibilities of achieving such peace. What she had proposed had some basis in fact, and there were many holes to be filled. 
if, of course, she had told him all about her plans for peace. After a moment his gaze turned back to the young woman. She was concentrating on her book, the title of which he could not see. Every now and then she would make a note here and there on a sheet of parchment. Her hair fluttered in the wind and Madara could see her tucking a stray lock behind her ear from time to time. He would be a complete idiot to deny that she was a beautiful woman, but it was something he wasn't about to say out loud. What are you reading? The nerve endings of the spine, Sakura replied as she scribbled a sentence on her parchment, her eyes flipping from the book to her pencil. What are nerve endings? Madara inquired. Even though he was a killer he loved to learn, any information could save your life. The human body is composed of a circulatory system of chakra connected by Tenketsu. The blood system is connected to our chakra system. And it has been discovered that our whole body is composed of nerve endings. This is a part that can only be seen with a very powerful magnifying glass. Basically, these nerve endings connect all the sensations in the body to our brain. It's what makes us feel heat, cold, touch, taste. Pain, Sakura elaborated, stopping her reading. She had always loved sharing her knowledge, being able to teach was a dream of hers. Is that why I can't move? Exactly, if certain connections are broken, the brain can no longer give the body the information to move. Let's take a military example, you need to move one of your ninja units from one place to another. You send a traveling bird, but it gets intercepted. Your unit won't move, because they never received the information, Sakura presented before turning her gaze back to her book. This is from your mother. Madara was completely impressed, he never imagined the body was so complex. Yes. Mother was a virtuoso when it came to medicine and the human body, Sakura sighed with a wistful look on her face. She thought back to all the lectures with her, the hard lessons, the intensive training, the hugs. I wish I could have met her, Madara admitted, which drew a surprised look from Sakura. I don't know if you would have gotten along, Uchiha-san. She was an even more temperamental woman than I was, the pink-haired woman informed, thinking back to her former master. Very temperamental, and she reacted quickly if you had the misfortune to contradict or upset her. Impossible, no one is more temperamental than you, Madara scoffed, finding it hard to imagine anyone with a more fiery temper than Sakura. I won't allow you Uchiha-san. Sakura hadn't expected this attitude from the clan leader. He had the reputation of being a closed and cold person, not someone who could have a sense of humor. I'll allow myself if I want to. Pig-headedness, Madara retorted childishly and it was another surprise to Sakura who saw many sides to this man in just ten seconds. He was so different from the being she had fought in the fourth great shinobi war. Yes, but at least I'm walking. If he wanted to play this game, there would be two of him and he would lose. It was small and petty. You'll survive, feel free to join me at the table Uchiha-san. Then she walked away all proud of herself, leaving the dark-haired man all alone, with no way to reach her. Come back here woman. Madara shouted without getting an answer. Day 15 After 15 days of treatment, Madara's organs were on the mend. However, even if he could, he still couldn't play sports because they were still too fragile. But now that he was more stable, Sakura would be able to work on his spine. Sakura had seated Madara on a wide stool, herself positioned at an angle to him. She positioned the man so that his legs were at a 90-degree angle to the floor and his chest was as straight as possible. The patient had to be able to stand half on his own. However, she still had to make sure that he did not collapse on the floor. Why are you only starting this part now? Madara asked, looking at the young woman who was practically glued to his body. Her left arm was holding his trunk so he wouldn't collapse and her right hand was gently touching his vertebrae. It was almost like a caress. She seemed to be counting, putting very light pressure on each vertebra. Because what I'm about to do is going to be very painful Uchiha-san and you mustn't stress your organs, Sakura detailed, stopping her hand where the sword had lodged. The connections were almost all broken. Did Hashirama use a jutsu of an electrical nature when the sword went through you? Yes. Madara had a very bitter taste in the back of his throat as he recalled that moment in his life as the scene quickly came back to his mind. 
The feeling of that blade going right through him, the feeling of being out of control as it penetrated him, the words of his former friend. Not good, Sakura whispered to herself as she brought her hand down further to see the extent of the damage. She thought about how to proceed, should she just do pressure points? Or should she have to do surgery again? Why is it so bad? Madara inquired, even though she had whispered her sentence, he had perceived it. The human body is an electrical current, our brain alone generates electrical energy to function. The information sent to your body is like a circuit and suffering an electrical attack can have devastating effects on the body, Sakura detailed as her index and middle fingers were covered in green chakra. Hmm, does this change anything? I'm going to need more time to get you better, Sakura admitted as she placed her fingers down her spine, on the first lumbar vertebrae known as L1. Then Sakura prepared some hurtful words for the Uchiha to get angry at her. How does it feel to have lost like a weakling to Hashirama? Hearing this sentence, Madara felt hatred and anger wash over him. In a split second he let his emotions overwhelm him. He had an overwhelming urge to murder Haruno Sakura for daring to speak of this sensitive subject and for calling him weak so openly. You little bai. Ah. Madara screamed at the unbearable pain that washed over him. It reverberated through his entire being and it was so powerful that a tear escaped from his valid eye. I'm sorry Uchiha-san, I had to make you angry so the pain would be less. Sakura had just sent a blast of chakra to the vertebrae, unblocking the nerves and connections. Her two fingers were still covered in green chakra and were giving a light circular massage to the previously targeted area. Breathe slowly, it will pass. I know, the pain is excruciating. I hate you. Madara raged angrily. I know, tell me when the pain is gone, Sakura agreed, she would have reacted the same way in the opposite situation. The injected chakra spike had hit a nerve coil, sending pain information throughout his body. The two of them remained in this position for many minutes until finally the pain became nothing more than an echo. The pain is gone, Madara sighed with relief. Now, let me know when the numbness in your legs is gone. Sakura placed her two fingers on the vertebrae again to put pressure on the ball of nerves. However, it wasn't a discharge of chakra like before that she was pulsing, but rather a comforting chakra that was seeping into him. And now that she said it, Madara felt a powerful tingling in his legs. What did that mean? Had she just given him back the feeling in his legs? It's okay, Madara said, and after a minute the numbness was completely gone. This is why I couldn't do this before Uchiha-san. Your heart wouldn't have held and that would have created complications. I'll have you know that I've only fixed one spot out of 24 potential ones, Sakura announced before releasing the pressure on Madara's back. Drink, Madara demanded, feeling very weak. He had just rested for a fortnight and yet felt like he had been fighting for hours. This woman was absolutely right when she said she was deadly dangerous. Sakura picked Madara up again and laid him gently on his bed before fetching a glass of water from the kitchen. Here, drink it slowly, Sakura advised as she held the glass of water to Madara's lips. Do you feel like eating? Or would you like me to put you to sleep to recover from the strain on your body? I'm not weak. Madara protested, still struggling with the fatigue he felt after that healing session. Well, I'll be right back, Achiha-san. After a fortnight of treatment, the meal had finally changed. Today the bowl of soup was a little bigger, the bowl of rice was the same, but there was also fish to go with it. Fish? Madara remarked, inwardly happy to be eating something other than rice and soup. Fish is a great source of nutrients for your body. Also, your stomach has healed well. Even if it's still weak, it should have no trouble digesting such tender, melting meat, Sakura replied before blowing on the spoon. How long will it take? For your spine. Probably one to two months at the most to expect to be able to sit up on your own. You will also have to do some re-education exercises to get used to it. As for your legs, probably another month with a lot of rehabilitation, because they will have atrophied from not being used. Madara was both displeased and happy. Happy that in three months he would be able to stand on his legs again. And unhappy that he would have to stay in bed for another three months before he could resume his physical training. For the next minute, 
Madara silently ate his soup before taking the first bite of rice that tasted lemony this time, probably added to cook the fish. Will this heal my arm too? Unfortunately not, Sakura replied, alternating between rice and fish to feed Madara. She cut small portions of fish with her chopsticks each time before handing it to her patient. Your arm is going to be very difficult to heal, but I'm going to do it. How? Madara enjoyed the taste of the lemony fish in his mouth, it felt good to eat meat, especially since Sakura was an excellent cook. I've been developing a healing technique for tissue regeneration for over a year now. I'm almost there and once I've perfected the technique, I'll be able to rebuild your chakra system, your tenketsu, your right eye, and your sharingan. To say that Madara was shocked would be an understatement. It was one of the few times in his life that Madara was speechless. At the same time, this woman boasted that she had the skills to restore his sight and his sharingan. Normally one could not restore a blind eye, let alone one that had been destroyed by the Izanagi technique. Who are you? Haruno Sakura, the second known doctor ninja in the elemental lands after my mother Tsunade Haruno. While others specialize in killing, my mother and I specialize in saving people. Medicine Ninja. Madara repeated. Yes, tell me Uchiha-san, I would like to ask you a question about your Sharingan. This request made the clan leader frown. After all, there were many people who wanted to take the secrets of the Sharingan for themselves. That depends, Madara said very suspiciously. It wasn't an attack technique that blinded you, I found no elemental residue and yet you are blind. Not just blind, your jutsu is simply gone, Sakura analyzed as she placed the empty fish plate on the tray. Did you use a Sharingan technique to make him like this? Madara didn't want to answer at first, it was a clan secret that only he and his brother had discovered. The thought of his brother brought back painful memories, for to get to this point he had to endure seeing Tobarama Senju mortally wound his brother Izuna. Izuna later entrusted his eyes to him just before he died, gaining the eternal Mangekyo Sharingan and an unconditional hatred for Tobarama. However, he knew that his Sharingan had been extinguished by activating Izanagi, but he did not think that it would be completely gone. Yes, Madara whispered. Sakura thought to herself, she had never heard of a technique that could blind the user after use. She knew that the evolution of the Sharingan blinded the user after using it, but Madara had a Mangekyo Sharingan Eternal so he shouldn't have been blinded. Hmm. I guess it must have been a very powerful technique to have such a backlash. You're too smart for your own good, Madara said in a weak voice due to the fatigue that was getting too strong. He slowly closed his eyes to rest. Thank you, Sakura said before turning her gaze to Madara's face as he drifted off to sleep. She silently rose to her feet, placed her fingers gently on his temple and helped him into a restful sleep. Sleep well. Chapter 7 The Great Madara Uchiha is dead. This was the news that was spreading throughout the elemental nations. One of the greatest shinobi history has ever known was dead, killed by his friend Hashirama Senju in a legendary confrontation in the Valley of the End. While the political stakes and outcomes of this conflict remained secret, the land of fire could not hide Madara's death. With this victory, Hashirama Senju earned the title of the most powerful shinobi warrior of all time after the legendary Rikid Senin. The Senju clan thus secured its supremacy and control over the village of Kanoha no Sato and at the same time over the Uchiha clan. What Madara had fought for all his life was now being destroyed by the Senju. The Uchiha clan was in their pay and no longer had a leader to guide or protect them. To compensate for this and to avoid a rebellion, Kanoha no Sato appointed the Uchiha clan to be in charge of the village police under the recommendation of Tobarama Senju. This appointment calmed the tensions and allowed the Uchiha to not feel wronged. By this act, Hashirama had secured a position as the number one power for the land of fire. Many clans had joined their village, and through this, even if the other four major countries united, they could not defeat this village and its leader. The plan to honor these two great shinobi was then launched, and the construction of two huge statues at the Valley of the End was undertaken. However, since his victory, Hashirama seemed different. Sure, he had lost his childhood friend in that final battle, but there was something else. He became weaker and weaker, as if he had fallen ill. Was it because his fight with Madara had affected him more than he thought? 
Had he received an injury from the fight that was killing him slowly? Was it the fact that he had helped seal the nine-tailed fox demon inside his wife Mito Uzumaki that had exhausted him? Or was it an accumulation of all that? Whatever the reason, the result was that after a while, Hashirama Senju disappeared as if he had never existed. He had given no information to anyone, and even his wife said she did not know where he was. But was this the truth? No one knew, and Kanoha did everything possible to hide this news. But for how long? At first it was just a small rumor, but every rumor has an element of truth to it. And if this rumor was true, it would change a lot of things for the elemental nations. For if Kanoha lost Madara Uchiha and Hashirama Senju, then that village would become more vulnerable and thus more accessible. Thus, little by little the peace flags were put away and the beginnings of the next war approached. It remained to be seen if this rumor was true, Hashirama Senju, the shinobi god was no more. Day 29 After 29 days, the two protagonists had still not killed each other. Despite the differences they might have had, both were making efforts to be civil, but it was difficult for both. Sakura had the knowledge of the future and memories that often came back to her when she looked at the brunette. While Madara had to ignore the fact that a woman was ordering him around while still being a mystery. Today was once again a sunny day in the land of rice paddies. Sakura had set Madara up on a table outside so that she had direct access to his back. She was currently dipping her hands into a container of hot water mixed with various oils. Once her hands were well covered with the mixture she placed them on the dark-haired man's back, intending to rub it all over. What is all this for? Madara asked, not understanding the point of this process on him. Now that most of the nerve endings are repaired, I need to put them back in the right place, Sakura explained as she massaged Madara's back. With each stroke she applied a tiny layer of healing chakra. Don't concentrate on what I'm doing, just let yourself go, it'll be easier on your body. Madara listened to the young woman's advice and closed his eyes to focus on his surroundings. In almost a month, Madara had realized that it was better to listen to this person, even if it pissed him off to admit that a woman was right. But hey, this woman had saved his life and everything she had done so far was close to a miracle. After about ten minutes of being massaged, Madara was on the verge of falling asleep. On a table next to Sakura were some basalt stones, an inkwell, a brush and some towels. The young woman wiped her hands with one of them before grabbing one of the stones along with her brush. She delicately drew a finjutsu seal on it before sealing it with a point of chakra. Once the seal was in place, she soaked the stone three-quarters of the way through in the liquid she had used earlier. She was very careful not to get any of it on the finjutsu seal so as not to alter it, then she placed the stone on Madara's upper back. The hint of chakra Sakura exerted plus the fact that he felt something at the top of his neck gently snapped Madara out of his trance. He looked over at the young woman who was once again riding on a stone. What are you doing? Madara asked uncertainly as he felt a strong heat spreading through his neck. It was actually a very pleasant, almost restful heat. I'm placing stones that will generate a constant heat. This will allow your muscles to relax as much as possible, Sakura explained as she continued to draw a symbol on her stone. She dipped the stone into the oil before placing it just below the first one and so on. Once your muscles are completely relaxed, some of your nerve endings will reposition themselves, and then I'll help place the more difficult ones. Madara was having more and more trouble getting his head around this. The more he got to know this woman, the more unreal she became. No one should be like this, he felt like a little boy in front of her acquaintance. More than once Madara wondered if he hadn't died in the valley of the end and that everything he was experiencing now was just a figment of his imagination in the world of heaven. Hirono-san. Yes Uchiha-san. Sakura asked as she placed another stone on her patient's back. This one was larger than the others and was placed where Hashirama's sword did the most damage. How old are you? This question caught Sakura completely off guard. He was asking this question as if he was talking about the weather and she was not expecting such a request at all. Until now he had wanted to know about her background, her name, her skills, about medicine, but never about something so. Mundane. Twenty years old, Sakura answered shamelessly. Twenty was young to have such advanced knowledge. Sure, 
He himself had been a virtuoso when he was twenty, but not on an intellectual level and that was what was so impressive. Especially with the provincial wars present for most of her life. Another question came to Madara's mind, who had taught her the rest. He understood that her mother had taught her the art of medicine, but who taught her the art of being a shinobi? What about you Uchiha-san? Sakura dared to ask as she placed one of the last stones on her patient's back. Twenty-nine years old, Madara replied wearily. It was normally the age that many couldn't even reach because of their profession. Uchiha-san. What is your vision of peace? Sakura questioned curiously as she placed the very last stone down. She wiped her hands before settling down next to Madara. You asked me a fortnight ago what my vision of peace was. Now I would like to hear yours. Her voice was sincere, she really wanted to hear his vision. Peace through strength. Was it because he was beginning to trust this woman a little or was it because he was relaxed? Whatever the case, Madara felt for the first time in his life like sharing his vision. The human being needs a framework to live. If you don't impose barriers, he will think he can do whatever he wants. So for me, you have to use force, show that if he deviates from the right path, he will suffer the consequences. About thirty seconds passed, during which Madara seemed to be searching for words. I think the ideal would be to have one big country ruled by one person with a triumvirate and sub-advisors. This would allow supremacy over everyone. Everything would be decided, analyzed, calculated for the good of all and put in place so that everyone would obey and live in peace, Madara continued, as he was opening his heart. For me, a totalitarian regime must be installed to prevent the world from killing each other. Sakura didn't answer, she didn't want to make any comments that might upset him, this was absolutely not the time. So she kept quiet, but found his vision of things more sane than putting all people in an eternal genjutsu. The minutes passed without a single break in the silence, and Madara's body began to be covered in sweat from the emanation of the stones. It felt almost like being in a steam room, except that the heat was focused on him. Don't panic, Sakura whispered before placing her hands on his loins. Her fingers glowed with green chakra and applied gentle pressure. As the muscles relaxed completely, Sakura managed to reposition the majority of the connections. She would linger at one point for long minutes before moving on to the next vertebra and doing the same thing over and over again. Every second she would send her chakra into Madara's vertebrae creating a slight humming sound inside her patient's body. This allowed the more difficult connections to fall back into place. After an hour of concentration, Sakura had finally finished her work and she could feel the fatigue creeping over her. The constant supply of chakra, mixed with the concentration required, made Sakura sweat. She then began to remove the stones one by one, not forgetting to deactivate the seal on each basalt stone, before placing them in a bucket of water. I'm going to turn you over Uchiha-san, Sakura warned as she ran a towel over the clan leader's back to clean him up. She grabbed his towel-wrapped left arm and leg and gently flipped him the other way. She positioned him correctly in the center of the table before climbing onto the table herself, kneeling at his legs. She then placed her hands on the thighs of the dark-haired man who was looking at her strangely. I want you to try to stand up straight Uchiha-san. Madara didn't expect this request at all and hastened to try to stand up. He could feel a part of his body responding to his commands again, allowing him to half-right himself before finally falling back onto his back. Describe the sensation to me. I felt a part of my body obey me, however, halfway through I could command but it didn't do anything, as if that part of my body didn't exist, Madara replied. Do it again, Sakura ordered before Madara complied. Once he reached halfway up, he jammed again, except this time Sakura grabbed one of his shoulders and helped him do the rest. There, you are upright. Now tighten your abdominal muscles and lie back down slowly. I'll be here to hold you down if you lose control. Madara tightened his abdominal belt and a very slight pain was felt in his scar. He had no trouble bending over, but after a moment something stuck and he lost control again. Thankfully Sakura held him up before leaning him back on the table. Well. It looks like there's still a lot of damage to your backbone. But it's a good sign, you've almost righted yourself, Sakura explained before stepping down from the table. The brunette said nothing, but a smile could be seen on his lips even as Sakura hugged him once more. 
she headed inside to put him back in his bed. Would you like to read something special tonight? Sakura asked when she saw that the book on the human heart was now finished. Hi, I'd like a book written by you, Madara replied quietly. Me? Sakura repeated disconcerted. Yes, you. The dark-haired man saw Sakura walk over to her bookshelf and pull out a green-covered book. Here, Sakura said, holding the book out to Madara. How to Become a Ninja Medic Volume 1 by Sakura Haruno, Madara read aloud before beginning to read. Do you feel like a ninja, but want to save lives? Then this is the book for you. Do you feel useless because you have no bloodline and want to preserve your precious people? Then you have come to the right place. Do you aspire to have some first aid knowledge for your missions? Then read on. Are you a person with little intelligence, a fan girl, not sure what you want to do in life? Then close this book immediately, this job is not for you. Being a ninja is a tough job, but being a ninja medic is even tougher. You will always be the first person to be targeted on the battlefield. It will be up to you to always keep yourself safe, to think of your teammates while protecting yourself. Because dead, you will be useless. You will have to work twice as hard as your colleagues, both intellectually and physically. If you thought it was going to be easy and you'd just stay inside and read books, then give up being a ninja medic right now. The world is a cruel, merciless place and it only takes a second of inattention to decide someone's life or death. If you don't have the guts to see blood, organs, broken bones or shredded limbs, then close the book and change your vocation. You think I'm tough. Good for you. Because life won't do you any favors on the battlefield. My name is Haruno Sakura, the second greatest medic ninja the world has ever known. And if you're reading this, maybe you'll know the difference between victory and defeat for your nation. Lesson 1, Dodge. The minutes passed and Madara did not see the time pass, he discovered through this book a whole other side of the young woman. A hard and unimpeachable side that did not tolerate failure. Like him. I'm sorry Uchiha-san, but it's time to eat, Sakura interrupted as she placed the tray on the bedside table before taking the book from his hands. From what I've read, you seem tougher than your mother, Madara remarked as she watched her put the book away on her desk. The war forced me to. Sakura walked over to a device that Madara thought was an odd sculpture. It was a square box made of finely carved oak wood. On top of it was a sort of metal cylinder forming an open flower. On top of the wooden box was a black disc, a gramophone. Sakura took a black disc out of a package and placed it on the installation. What are you doing? Madara asked, suddenly curious as to what the young woman was doing. I play music to relax. What I did this afternoon wore me out. A few seconds after Sakura turned the crank on the gramophone and put the needle on the record, a faint sound of music filled the room making Madara feel completely lost. Ho how. An inventor gave it to me before he died. I'm not sure how it works, Sakura replied before moving closer to Madara to feed him. The music wasn't too loud and just filled the house just right. I think it's the only one in the whole world, it's just a prototype according to what he said before he died. It's revolutionary. As he ate his meal of rice, fish and vegetables, Madara tried to discern what instruments were being used. There was the sound of a harp, a guitar, a stringed instrument he didn't know and a woman's voice. At first it was just instruments coming out of the gramophone, but then a woman's voice came in. How did he manage to put the sound of the instruments and the voice of this woman in the box? I don't know, maybe it was Finjutsu. I never wanted to open it for fear of breaking it. It's an object that's dear to me, Sakura said, placing the empty fish plate on the tray. Would you like to stay awake a little longer? Yes, I'd like to listen. Sakura returned to her bookcase and picked up one of her books, The History of Kanoha and its first Kage. It had been two days since she started reading about how Kanoha worked in the Sengoku era. Time passed and Madara eventually fell asleep on his own with the music playing. Sakura was about to follow, but was taken aback by a sentence in her book. A month after the great battle between Achiha Madara and Hashirama Senju, the first Hokage disappeared. It is suspected that he died, but no one found his body then or even now. 
Was it Black Zetsu who killed him in the old timeline? I need to know for sure, Sakura whispered before going to bed. Day 30 Hitomi-san, Sakura announced with a cheerfulness in her voice. After two months, Hitomi and Sakura had bonded. Sakura-san. How are you? Hitomi turned around delighted to see the young woman in a good mood. I'm fine, thank you, Sakura replied pulling a small smile from her lips. She had grown to love the people of this village. How about you? Your husband and son aren't giving you a hard time. Hitomi let out a small laugh at the doctor's question. Ah, it's no worse, you'll understand when you have a child and a husband yourself. Nah, it's not for me. She wouldn't say it, but it was one of her dearest dreams. She had longed to have a husband and children to cherish. However, the candidate she wanted for this dream, simply did not exist anymore. We'll see Sakura-san, we'll see. I'd be surprised if a beautiful woman like you couldn't get her hands on a man, Hitomi winked, making her blush. If not, did you come to the village for any particular reason? Hi Hitomi-san, I need to ask you a favor. Hitomi was a little surprised, it was the first time her friend had asked her for something. She had done a lot for the people of this village and had never asked for anything in return. I'm listening, after all you've done for our village, it's the least I can do to help you. I need to go back to Hai no Kuni for a day or two, Sakura began as a serious face settled on her features. This was the second time Hitomi had seen such seriousness on her face. The last time was when the village hunter had cut his fingers and she had used her powers to heal him. However, I will need you to take care of someone in my absence who is in my home. Yes of course. What should I do? Hitomi hastened to agree. It must have been recent, because Hitomi had visited Sakura at home several times, and had never seen anyone. I'll need you to prepare food for this person and feed them, Sakura explained before placing her hands on Hitomi's shoulders. However, there will be a few rules to follow, if you break them, it could cost you your life. Hitomi was suddenly afraid of what Sakura was asking her to do because it sounded more serious than she expected. I am listening to you. This person is in some ways like me. He is able to use what you call magical powers. He is currently paralyzed in bed and I am treating him. He is a very important person to me, but he is also a person capable of killing. Don't worry, I have taken measures so that he cannot harm you. If he's that important to you Sakura, I will. A warm smile settled on Sakura's face at this answer, but the seriousness quickly returned to her features. One rule, never look him in the eye. Never. That man has the power to manipulate people, to hurt them, and even to kill them if they have the misfortune to look him in the eye, Sakura ordered sternly. Fear could be seen in Hitomi's eyes as she knew from Sakura that magical powers existed. Besides, Sakura had always been a calm and gentle person, so to see her so stern and serious about such a subject made her understand the seriousness of the matter. The two months had taught her that even if you were young, you could be a great person. You just need to cook for him, in my kitchen there's everything you need. I've already prepared his lunch, we'll just have to prepare tonight's and tomorrow's lunch. Everything will be written down on a piece of paper, Sakura listed. Another thing Hitomi-san, he's an extremely handsome man. Hitomi smiled suggestively at Sakura at the description of her patient. Is that why you take care of him? Hitomi asked with a knowing smile. No Hitomi-san, as handsome as he is, that's not the main reason why I help him. Anyway, the point is, he's very handsome, so don't give in to his demands. He's a man trained to kill and he knows how to manipulate people to get what he wants. Hi. I know I always told you never to call me, Sama because we are all equal. But not this person. You will call him Uchiha-sama. It hurt Sakura to ask all this of someone she liked very much, but she had no other way, she had to go to Kanoha to get answers to her questions. Hi Sakura-san. When you introduce yourself to him, give him this letter right after and if he does anything to you he'll have to deal with me, Sakura said as she handed a small roll of paper with a finjutsu seal at the opening. It was something simple, an injection of chakra would open it. One more thing, Sakura said as she adjusted her bag. He's a proud person, so don't make him feel inferior and again thank you. 
Sakura moved closer to Hitomi and hugged her. It was the first time she had hugged anyone since she left for the past. Hitomi was very surprised by this, but returned the hug happily before speaking into her ear. I'll be very careful Sakura-san, but also be very careful and come back soon. I will, goodbye, Sakura said before breaking off the hug and disappearing in a second, making Hitomi gape at her abilities. Once she came to her senses she walked over to her husband and explained Sakura's request. When it was almost noon, she headed towards the young woman's house to meet this Uchiha-sama. The path was difficult for anyone not used to it, it was a very steep passage to get to the top. However, the location was well worth it. After 15 minutes of walking, Hitomi finally arrived at her friend's house. She entered through the kitchen door as she did every time she came to visit her. She put her sandals to the side and walked to the table in the center of the kitchen. There were lots of ingredients arranged with a sheet of paper containing instructions. Hitomi couldn't read, but Sakura had written the explanations in drawings. She could see a sun accompanying a bowl of rice, soup, and fish. Further down was a moon with the same thing, except this time there was an arrow indicating the ingredients on the table. Hitomi grabbed the tray of food, the dishes were still steaming. Hitomi was sure that Sakura had left hours ago, so how could the food still be hot? Hitomi walked to the living room and looked around for someone. Who are you? Demanded a harsh, cold voice. Hitomi flinched slightly, but managed to keep her grip on the tray. At the sound of the voice, she quickly looked down. Ohai Achihasama, I'm Hitomi, Sakura-san asked me to take care of you today because she had to leave, Hitomi quickly explained as she felt her heart racing. Somehow, Madara felt reassured that nothing had happened to the young woman. He hadn't seen her since she woke up, she hadn't done her meditation session or her medical routine and he'd been afraid that something had happened to her. She also asked me to give you a letter, Uchiha-sama, Hitomi continued, but did not get a response from the patient. Would you allow me to approach Uchiha-sama? Hi. Hitomi slowly looked up to see where the man was and her first thought was that he was beautiful. She had never seen such a beautiful man in her life. The words Sakura used were far too weak to describe the charisma of this man. She'd also never seen a man with any fat, only muscles. A blush settled over her face at her thoughts. She placed the tray of food on the bedside table before holding the letter out to the dark-haired man, keeping her head down. With his able-bodied hand, Madara grabbed the roll of paper before injecting a tiny amount of chakra into the seal, unlocking it. Achihasen. Duty calls me to high no kuni and I cannot shirk it. The person in front of you is a friend of mine, she will take care of you while I am away. Please be kind to her as she is doing her best to help us. I should be back in two days at the most. And if I find out that while I'm gone you've hurt her, or if I find any traces of Jinjutsu on her, you'll have to deal with me. Haruno Sakura. What right did this woman have to give him orders? Madara crumpled the scroll in his hand before tossing it onto the bedside table. Madara finally turned his attention to the newcomer. He wondered how he should deal with her. Should he act like he did with all the women he had met? Or should he be more agreeable and thus potentially have a source of information about Sakura Haruno? Oh yeah, Madara said after a moment. Are you hungry, Achihasama? Hitomi asked not without giving a small nod to his greeting. Hi. Hitomi sat down on the stool next to the bed and grabbed a bowl of soup before holding the spoon up to Madara's lips. She stared at his mouth and tried her best not to look him in the eye. She thought of her friend's words, he can kill with just a look. Look me in the eye, Madara ordered gently, but all he got was a woman lowering her head even more. I apologize Uchiha-sama, but Sakura-san gave me orders. What were they? To never look you in the eye, to never disrespect you, and to take care of yourself, Hitomi listed, this time taking the bowl of rice. Meanwhile Madara couldn't help but notice that Sakura was thoughtful and clever. What do you think of Haruno-san? Madara asked in a reassuringly pleasant voice. He had a potential source of information here regarding his doctor, so he was going to take advantage of it. She's a great person with a big heart, Hitomi answered quickly. Has she lived here long? Madara continued before chewing his portion of rice for a long time. 
It must have taken a lot of effort for a second woman to feed him in this way. Two months ago, she came to us completely devastated, asking for asylum to rebuild her life. Where exactly are we? In the land of rice fields on the border of the land of fire, said the foreigner before holding out a piece of slightly steaming fish. It wasn't white fish this time, but salmon, and the difference in taste was much appreciated by Madara. Did she tell you where she was going? She had some business to attend to in the land of fire, she didn't tell me more. And you Uchiha-sama? What do you think of Sakura-san? Hitomi dared to ask. He didn't answer right away, deep in thought. Madara surprised himself by not sending this weak woman away for daring to ask him questions. Was it because he had been around Hiruno-san for a month that he was becoming a little more tolerant? She's an interesting person, Madara conceded. You seem to mean a lot to her. What do you mean by that? Madara asked suddenly very curious. He didn't think he was that important to her. When Sakura-san first came to the village, she was a person who had lost the will to live. It took a long time to change her, I could only get a smile out of her very rarely. Then, in the last month, her attitude has improved. She has become a little more cheerful, as if she has found hope again. She is a woman who seems to have great respect for you, at least that is what I perceived. Madara was inwardly very surprised and a gentle warmth settled over him. Sakura Haruno had always been professional, neutral, strong, powerful and unbearable. She was a woman of character who relied solely on herself to get things done. In their conversation, it seemed that very few people had earned her respect in her life. In a way, it pleased Madara to potentially be one of her people. What did she say about me? She only told me about you this morning Uchiha-sama, Hitomi replied as she placed the last plate on the tray before placing her hands on her legs. She told me that you were someone with magical powers like her and that you were someone extremely dangerous. But yet someone very important to her. Anything else? Madara demanded softly as she sipped his glass of water. No, Hitomi said hastily. Don't lie to me woman. Madara said in a stern voice. Hitomi was suddenly very frightened by the intonation of his voice. Go Gomen Uchiha-sama, she quickly apologized, bowing her head slightly. She said that you were an extremely handsome person. He was beautiful and he knew it, but hearing it from another person was always gratifying. Especially when you knew that a very closed person thought that about you. Bring me a jug of water and the green-covered book on the desk over there. Then you'll be free to go, Madara pointed to Sakura's desk. Hi Uchiha-sama, have a nice day and I'll see you tonight, Hitomi bowed and then complied. With a heart full of emotion, Hitomi left Sakura's house. Hi no kuni. Sakura walked at civilian speed towards the entrance of Kanoha no Sato. She was wearing a brown dress and carrying a wicker basket. A long grey scarf was placed over her brown hair. She had applied an advanced hengen to her hair color as well as to her forehead seal. She had walked through the entire fire country through the trees and had been walking like a civilian alongside a caravan for five kilometers. The village of Kanoha was still not very large, the walls were thin compared to her time. However, security seemed more important now. She counted with her experience a minimum of ten people present. People were coming in and out and whether it was one way or the other, there was a queue. Time passed before it was finally her turn. The reason for your visit to Kanoha no Sato? Asked a shinobi sitting on a table with a long scroll of parchment. He seemed to be cataloging the people who came in and their reasons. I'm here to buy medicinal herbs, my father is sick and unfortunately he is too weak to come by himself. Where did you come from? Continued the shinobi who was a member of the Uchiha clan by the crest on his linen outfit. Shikuba, shinobi-sama, Sakura replied, pointing to a village about ten kilometers north of Kanoha no Sato. Your name? The Uchiha continued, writing on his parchment. I will ask you to let my colleague search you. No sooner had he said this than another man approached her and began groping her body for a hidden weapon. His hands were unfortunately quite wandering and Sakura couldn't do anything without unmasking herself. So she tensed slightly and flushed her face. After all, she was only supposed to be a simple woman in the Sengoku era. 
Sakura Shinobi-sama. Nothing to report Izumi-san, said the soldier who had searched her in a rude and totally inappropriate manner. Sakura wanted so badly to punch him in the face with her chakra-laden fist. How long will you be staying? Izumi Uchiha continued. The day at most, if I take too long I'll leave in the morning. First time in Kanoha. Hi, it's actually quite beautiful Shinobi-sama. Who is that on the mountain if I may ask? Sakura asked politely with a big smile. The Uchiha turned slightly toward said mountain to see the face. Ah, it's our Hokage, Hashirama Senju. A slight disgust could be heard in his voice as if he wasn't happy about it. So even though the clans had joined, there was still resentment between them. He must be a big guy to have his face on the stone Sakura said in an impressed and innocent voice, playing the naive girl who could be impressed by anything. Was. He disappeared. Izumi. Another shinobi who seemed to belong to the Senju clan warned harshly. However, the damage was done and Sakura had the confirmation she was looking for, Hashirama Senju was gone. Ha! Forgive me Shinobi-sama for this question, I didn't mean to get you in trouble, Sakura bowed deeply. No problem, have a nice stay in Kanoha young lady. Next in line. Arigato Shinobi-sama, have a nice day and sorry again. A smile came to the young woman's lips as she saw her former village. Wow! this is beautiful. It's so much bigger than Shikuba. Sakura had sensed that she was being followed, probably because Izumi had let some very important information out. So she continued to play the innocent young woman going about her business. Excuse me ma'am, can you point me in the direction of the market, Sakura asked an old woman who was watering the flowers on her balcony. Hello child, follow the main road towards the mountain, then follow the hubbub. Thank you very much ma'am. The village was much smaller than in her day and many trees were still present within the walls. The people who did not belong to one of the clans were pleasant and civilized, but if she had the misfortune to ask a clan member for help, she received a black look. When she got to the market, Sakura bought some spices and many medicinal herbs that were the reason given to the village guards. The day passed quickly and she had to find an inn, as leaving at night would have been very suspicious for a civilian. After applying a finjutsu to her door and window that would warn her if anyone tried to enter, Sakura thought about her house. Was Hitomi-san getting along with Madara? Would he be patient enough with her? Day 31 It was almost three in the afternoon when Sakura arrived home. As soon as she returned, she put her things on the table in the main room. She sat down on one of the cushions and placed a book on the table. She unpacked the medicinal herbs and acted as if she were preparing a remedy. Madara started to take a breath to ask a question at her abnormal attitude when Sakura looked at him with a hard face. She brought her index finger to her mouth in a sign to be quiet. She had her war veteran face on and that could only mean one thing, intruder. So Madara kept his lips sealed and silently watched Sakura. She was dressed in traditional clothing and Madara agreed that it didn't suit her at all. He frowned slightly as he discovered that her forehead seal was gone and her hair was a brown color. Seconds passed slowly, then they became a minute, then two minutes, before finally a person appeared behind Sakura with a dagger in his hand. He cocked his arm and stabbed his weapon at Sakura's heart. The dagger was covered in blood as it passed through Sakura's rib cage. Madara was about to activate his jutsu at such a scene to kill the intruder when suddenly, the stabbed Sakura disappeared in a pop of smoke. Kage Bunshin, Madara whispered in surprise. How did this woman even know about this ninjutsu that was one of the Senju clan's best kept trade secrets? A familiar spike of chakra was felt and Sakura appeared at the intruder's back. Was it the surprise? Or perhaps she was faster than the shinobi? Nevertheless, she had time to disarm her attacker, tackling him to the ground before grabbing his arms and placing them above his head held by one of her hands. His legs were immobilized by Sakura's knees as she injected her own chakra into his nerves to neutralize him. Tell me why you tried to kill me leave Shinobi, Sakura ordered with a coldness in her voice that Madara had not yet heard from her. The Kanoha Shinobi tried his best to free himself, but to no avail. There's no point in trying to free yourself, you're far too weak to hope to compete with me. 
Sakura knew where to press to get a man off his back, his pride. This man had just been overpowered by a woman in less than a second and she was able to hold both arms with the strength of one without any effort. As she was now facing the shinobi she recognized the guard at the door, Izumi Uchiha. I repeat my question Izumi Uchiha of the leaf, why did you follow me and try to kill me? Sakura demanded before taking a sealed kunai from her wrist. I'll have you know that as a doctor, I know some particularly painful places that would make anyone's tongue drop out. So, either you answer my questions, or I'll go look for my own answers. Suddenly, the shinobi used his master card and activated his jutsu. Two three tomos sharingan replaced his black eyes. Sakura purposely looked deep into his two sharingan. Hirono-san. Madara panicked as he saw his clan's jutsu being activated. As far as he was concerned, the moment she looked into the sharingan, she was done for. For there was a rule in the shinobi world, if you wanted to survive, never look an Uchiha in the eye. Release me bitch. The prisoner ordered as he unleashed his most powerful jinjutsu. A perverse smile grew on his face as he activated his jutsu. Seconds passed and nothing changed, Sakura didn't move, her gaze didn't waver, except that it became even colder than before. Sakura moved her face closer to the Uchiha's and practically pressed her forehead to the shinobi's, to look deeper into his eyes. Is that all you have to offer me? Is this all the Sharingan of the prestigious Uchiha clan has to offer me? Pathetic. Sakura scoffed, startling the two Uchiha from the room. This was the first time in their lives they had seen someone resist the Jinjutsu of a fully matured Sharingan with full force. Oh. You look surprised. The leaf shinobi's smile had completely disappeared and a look of fear had taken its place as he saw this woman resisting his Sharingan. I repeat my question one last time. Why did you try to kill me? Sakura ordered as she used her strength to begin crushing his wrists. Ah. Kanoha ordered me to follow you because you were new. When you started moving around like a shinobi two miles away from Kanoha, I realized that you might have stolen information from our village, the soldier admitted as he could feel the bones in his wrists about to break. Well. Unfortunately you're too dangerous for me to let you go. Farewell. Sakura said as she cocked her arm to plant her kunai in his opponent's heart. Her weapon was about to go into the flesh when a voice made her stop just at the last moment. Sakura no. It was Madara's voice. It was the very first time he had used his first name. It felt strange to hear her first name come out of his mouth, but it was said so naturally that it confused her. Why was that? You know very well that if he returns to Kanoha other people will come and that's out of the question. Sakura replied without taking her eyes off her victim. I agree, but he's still a member of my clan. Madara-sama. You. You're alive. Said the ninja who had just become aware of his clan leader's presence. Bring him to me. If you try anything Uchiha, I'll kill you, Madara or not. Sakura warned before straightening up with her kunai prisoner at his throat. They both moved closer towards Madara. Madara-sama, the shinobi implored, he was both happy to see his clan leader alive, but at the same time scared to be in a death situation. Lean towards me and look away Haruno-san, Madara demanded before Sakura did as he asked. She looked away in the direction of the outside knowing what he was going to do. A surge of chakra was felt in the room and Madara activated his Sharingan himself which transformed into a Manjiki Sharingan. Tsukuyumi. The clan leader uttered as he activated one of his most powerful techniques. Due to his still weakened state, some blood trickled from his left eye. You're going to go back to Kanoha and say that the person you followed is an ordinary civilian. She has returned home and there is nothing to fear from her. You will also forget about this place and about both of us. Now go. Madara ordered as he placed the man into the most powerful genjutsu of the Manjiki Sharingan. Sakura released the man and pulled her kunai from his throat before releasing the henjin on her own. Her pink hair appeared and her forehead seal as well. Hi, Madara-sama, the man said in a neutral voice before bowing and disappearing in an instant. Silence returned and Sakura continued to look outward. Deactivate your jutsu Uchiha-san. She could have looked Madara in the eye with his Manjiki Sharingan activated, 
but she wanted to keep that information a secret for now. It's okay Hirono-san. Without missing a beat she placed her hand over Madara's eye and a soft green glow emanated from it to dull the pain and repair the damage. You should have let me kill him instead of activating this technique, Sakura said still on guard. The adrenaline was still coursing through her body and it was going to take a few minutes to calm down. What happened to reaching out to the next Hirono-san? Not to those who stabbed me in the heart, Sakura retorted before going to the kitchen to get a glove and a bowl of water. Madara had just seen a deadly woman who had overpowered a member of the Uchiha clan with ease. The worst part of it all was that it wasn't just any Uchiha, but one of his former lieutenants. I apologize for what a member of my clan tried to do to you. Sakura stopped her movement to clean her patient's cheek. She was slightly speechless at what she had just heard. Then slowly a soft smile came to her lips. It was the first time she had ever given him a genuine smile, or at least one that was directed at him. Why are you smiling? I never thought I'd see the great Madara Uchiha apologize to a woman. H.N. Madara snorted slightly offended by her remark. Ah, uh, don't sulk, Uchiha-san, Sakura reassured him with a smile still on her lips. She resumed her gesture and finished wiping the blood from his cheek. You should smile more often Hirono-san, it suits you, Madara complimented as he looked into her eyes. What had caused the great Madara to say such a thing was a mystery. Was it the fact that he had seen her act so powerfully towards a member of his clan who was considered one of the best? Or was it his conversations with Hitomi that made him see Sakura in a different light? Sakura was shocked for the second time that day. Madara had just subtly told her that she was pretty. Sakura looked down at her task, slightly embarrassed as a small blush appeared on her cheeks. I thank you Uchiha-san. Chapter 8 Day 32 After several days of sunshine, the weather finally changed. Today was a time to stay at home with a hot drink in his hands. This was the state Haruno Sakura was in on this rainy morning. Sitting at her desk with a cup of green tea in her hand, the other supporting her chin. She was staring blankly at the outside as her brain pondered what to do next. She had killed Black Zetsu, she was sure, so it couldn't have been him who had ended Hashirama Senju's life. However, he had indeed disappeared a short time ago. Had he died of natural causes? From exhaustion after his fight with Madara? Had he been injured by Madara? Or had a third party of their ilk killed him? So many questions that Sakura couldn't find answers to at the moment. All she hoped was that the news of his disappearance would take the longest time to get out into the world. For her book, The History of Kanoha and its first Kage informed her that it was following his death that the First Great Shinobi War began. Meanwhile, Madara had just slowly woken up from a good night's sleep. Usually his sleep became restless when he used his Manjiki Sharingan, but with Sakura's care he had managed to sleep well. His first instinct was to do what he did every morning and tilt his head towards the outside hoping to see Sakura doing her meditation. She wasn't there. Probably because of the rain. So Madara looked around the rest of the room to finally find her at her desk. Because of what had happened the night before, Madara had many questions for her. He had long understood that Sakura could be a very dangerous person in battle. He had seen what she was capable of against a strange creature at the Valley of the End. However, to see her overpower one of the best members of his clan so quickly was something completely different and sobering. In that confrontation, Madara had seen a person trained to kill efficiently, quickly, and silently. If he didn't know her, he could tell that this woman had been trained in assassination. Then a thought suddenly occurred to him, did an Uchiha help this black Zetsu to kill Sakura's family? Because after all, she had told him that every Uchiha she had ever come across had tried to hurt and manipulate her. Besides, that murderous, icy intonation in her voice when she overpowered Izumi was what was reserved for the enemy. If this theory was true and an Uchiha was responsible for the murder of her family, then why didn't she kill him? At least that's what he would have done, world peace or not. After all, Madara was a very vindictive person, and the world understood that. But the opposite was also true, he protected the people he cared about. And yesterday he had been willing to kill a member of his own clan for daring to hurt Sakura. He still remembered when she was pierced by the dagger, 
he thought he'd gone completely mad for a second and would have done the unthinkable. He had been staring at the young woman sitting at her desk for several minutes. She still hadn't moved and seemed deeply immersed in her thoughts before finally sighing. What's on your mind Hirono-san? The sound of the voice snapped Sakura out of her internal reflections for a moment she had completely forgotten that she was not alone in the room. Several things really, Sakura replied before taking a sip of her tea. Did you sleep well despite using your Sharingan? Hi. Is it about yesterday that you're worried? Sakura didn't know if she should answer him or not. It was still too early to trust him and tell him everything. Madara was certainly indebted to her, but to the point of trusting him about the future, not yet. Sort of, Sakura opined before blowing on her cup to cool the content slightly. She took another sip, and the warm feeling in her throat felt very good. Let's just say I'm afraid for the future. Madara frowned as he hadn't seen Sakura afraid of anything since he'd met her. Why? He asked. Sakura got up from her seat and headed for the kitchen only to return thirty seconds later with a second steaming cup in her hands. She moved towards him and placed the new cup on the bedside table before settling down beside him. A few days ago, a rumor appeared in the village below. A wanderer from Hai no Kuni stopped by on his way back to the capital of Ta no Kuni, Sakura said, giving half-truths to avoid talking about her history book. The world knows of your fight against Hashirama and the elemental nations are now aware of your death. Is this what worries you? On the contrary, it makes me feel better that you'll be able to recuperate peacefully without having an assassin at my door, Sakura retorted, her face still upset as Madara grabbed his own cup of tea. It was the fact that he also said the shinobi seemed worried. But worried about what? I wonder. Is that why you left for Hai no Kuni these past few days? Hi, I needed to know what the village of Kanoha no Sato was worried about. I assume that given your troubled state, the land of fire is in a delicate position. What did that idiot Hashirama do now? He asked sarcastically. That's the problem, he's disappeared, Sakura said, knowing that this revelation would be like a bomb for the dark-haired man. And indeed, a thousand questions were running through his head, why? How? What had caused this man to disappear? Or had someone killed him? Sakura hadn't been wrong, seeing Madara's expression was enough to understand that he was disturbed by this announcement. I don't know why or under what circumstances. I did manage to find some information though, but it seems that he literally vanished into thin air, she explained without the dark-haired man having to ask. She was not yet ready for the first great shinobi war and her concern was obvious. If this information became known to the world, it could create a domino effect across all nations. War. Hi, and unfortunately I'd like it not to start too quickly, Sakura explained, setting her cup down on the bedside table before leaning back more comfortably in her chair. You're really planning on putting your vision of peace into place, aren't you? Ours, the young woman corrected in a neutral tone. What do you mean, ours? Madara questioned, until proven otherwise, he had never agreed to bend to her vision. You were right, Uchiha-san, my vision of peace has many gaps. But I also listened to your approach and I can't help but think that somehow it could work, Sakura said before turning her head towards Madara to look him in the eye. I long for peace Uchiha-san, perhaps I have the solution to bring peace, but the next question would be, for how long? It was a thought-provoking question. After all, every clan often asked itself this question. How long before the next battle? When will the next carnage take place? As I said, I have the means to bring peace. And after analyzing your words, I realize that you may have the method to keep it. Madara did not answer immediately. This was the first time in his life that someone had thought about his vision of peace. At the same time, it was also the first person he had confided his ambitions to. But did he really want to fight again for this rotten world? Did he really want to bleed for these people? Would they even have the means to succeed? How long do you think we have before a possible war breaks out? Sakura thought about the question for a moment, wondering if killing Black Zetsu would speed up or slow down the date of the First Great Shinobi War. Maybe six months, a little longer if we're lucky. A month in the worst-case scenario. How do you plan to raise the money for such an effort? 
Madara asked, knowing that any war is expensive. In men, money, food, weapons and all other resources. I am rich. That won't be enough, Madara retorted, knowing that a few thousand rios wouldn't make a difference. You misunderstood me, Uchiha-san, I am rich. Rich enough to make all the elemental nations pale in comparison. At this point, Madara became suspicious. How could a woman from nowhere boast of being as rich as all the elemental nations combined? If that was really the case, he would have known about it ages ago. Then he saw Sakura raise her hand and in it appeared a gold re-coin, then a second, then a dozen followed before she stopped. When you study science in order to be able to heal human beings, you study chakra at the same time. It is the basis of everything, so I just have to manipulate it in the right way like a fire specialist would. By shaping my chakra as a formula for finjutsu, I can make it have the properties of money, and thus, I have an unlimited resource with me, Sakura elaborated to a shocked Madara. It was the best way Sakura could think of to justify the millions of Rio sealed on her. All that money from the loans she'd taken out would soon be put to use. Do you realize that countries would destroy entire nations for this knowledge? Madara exclaimed, still reeling from the news, and was imagining many possibilities for the future. Hi, and that's why you're the only person in the world with me who knows about this. Why? Why me? Madara demanded, wanting to know why this woman wanted his help. Because you're Uchiha Madara. Because you have the experience. Because I may be smart, I may be strong, I may be rich, but I'm still only one person and I'm still a woman. We're in an era where I'm considered by most men to be a distraction. Sakura replied angrily at the harsh reality of her words. But you Uchiha-san. You have the reputation, you're a strong person, you have a clan and you have the charisma to bring the world together. You've already done it once with Kanoha. And above all, compared to all these scum, you are a scum who wants peace. And that makes all the difference to me. Yes, they were scum, beings who lived only to kill. They were only tools for others. They did the dirty work so that other more innocent people wouldn't have to. And that, Madara couldn't deny, but he couldn't understand how she could have so much faith in him. Yet they had only known each other for a month and she seemed to be putting the future of the world in his hands. Kanoha is a failed experiment. Madara retorted. That's just it Uchiha-san. You know what must not be done. Sakura rebounded at Madara's last words. And now Uchiha-san. With Hashirama potentially dead, who could really stand against you? Madara frowned as he pondered the question, there were very few people who could give him a hard time. The only people he knew of would be Tobarama Senju, Jinjetsu Zuki the Naide Mizukich as well as Sakura Haruno and that was if they didn't use the power of the beach. Maybe now he could bring peace. Maybe with the help of this woman he would succeed. He had nothing to lose by trusting her, it was enough to give time to time and see how the world would turn out. And if the opportunity arose to bring peace. Then they would. Madara gazed into Sakura's eyes for a long second, searching for any hint of cheating, any hint of lying. But found none. The daimi is the first step, Madara finally agreed without answering the previous question. It was one thing for him to accede to her vision of peace, another to reveal her possible weaknesses. But the young woman didn't seem to mind, on the contrary, she wore a beautiful smile and God he enjoyed seeing her smile, it suited her so much better. He must be aware of our ambitions, we should be able to have an interview with him in order to convince him, or to manipulate him, he said. His great strategist's brain was coming into place. He had to leave no stone unturned and their plan could not be carried out without the support of the daimi. In fact, since the countries had been formed, the shugo of each province, who were governors, agreed on a new status, that of daimi, who would be the representative of the entire country. It would be he who would decide with the kage on the steps to be taken to manage the country. So, it would be impossible to implement their project if he did not have the support of the Lord of Ta no Kuni. Would a letter be enough? If we incorporate a finjutsu doubled with a jinjutsu, asked Sakura who also knew how the world worked in the brown man's time. Explain yourself Haruno-san. It's common knowledge that the daimi all have their own ring. All I would have to do is to put a finjutsu seal on it, 
which will only unlock the scroll for the owner of the ring from the land of rice fields. And the Jinjutsu so that only he can read it, Sakura explained, once again demonstrating her intelligence. Ingenious. That might work, get a nice scroll, the Uchiha recommended, impressed by the young woman's ideas. Sakura hurriedly got up and walked over to her desk to pull out one of her finest scrolls. She settled herself comfortably in her seat and prepared to write. I'm listening, Uchiha-san. To the attention of the daimi of Ta no Kuni. The Muromachi period is now over and it is time to turn to the new Sengoku era. The peace that has been established is only temporary and the beginnings of war are at the doors of the elemental nations. I have the power and the means to make Ta no Kuni a place of peace and prosperity. A place that will be so powerful that no one will dare to attack this country, but will instead want to join it. Unfortunately, I cannot meet you in person at the moment, as my projects require my presence. But if in the future you are interested in such a future, let me know and an interview will be arranged. The eagle that brought you this letter will stay in your domain for two days while waiting for an answer from you. I don't sign. Apply wax to the bottom of the page, my clan leader's seal will be enough to make him understand who I am. Are you sure it's a good idea to announce your survival? Sakura asked as she approached Madara with scroll in hand after pouring hot wax on the bottom of it. No daimi would pass up such an opportunity, they're supposed to be smart, so he should be able to keep his mouth shut, Madara reassured her before applying the seal of his ring to the still hot wax. Once that was done, Sakura once again walked over to her desk and began to inscribe Finjutsu seals on the back of the parchment. This would now be opened only by the daimi of the rice country. After about thirty minutes, accompanied by the sound of rain, Sakura finally applied chakra to the seal to activate it. She rolled it up before walking towards the dark-haired man. Could you not use your Sharingan? Madara nodded before performing the ram seal with his only able-bodied hand before a small amount of chakra was felt in the room. There, that will do the trick, just wait until the weather is nice before sending it. I assume you have a summoning contract with the eagles for mentioning it in the letter. I'm repeating myself, but you're too smart for your own good, Madara said, tired of being so easily read. I know. Anyway, we'll discuss this later Achiha-san, I'm going to prepare dinner, Sakura interrupted before leaving the main room for the kitchen. Day 34 After two days of incessant rain, the sun was showing its face again. And it was with undisguised pleasure that Sakura could resume her meditation on this beautiful morning. She was so close to succeeding that it was becoming frustrating for the young woman. For days and days she had been close to finding the answer to all her questions. She had understood that her chakra was the mixture of physical and spiritual energy, but there was something missing. Over the past two months she had come to understand that her brain was the source of the spiritual energy that then flowed to the rest of her body. Then it mixed with the physical energy, not in one particular point, but of course the whole body. But that was the problem, where was her physical energy? It was her body, she was sure of that, but which part of her body? Was it the flesh? Was it the organs? The cells? What was it that was producing energy throughout her body? Then suddenly the answer came to her, energy. The human body was constantly making energy, her whole body was a source of energy. The cells by their very existence were energy and that was why it was so dangerous, because to use that energy was to use a part of oneself. In her discovery, Sakura couldn't hold back all the joy that was buried inside her. Yes. Sakura shouted as she left her seated position and jumped into the air with her fist raised. I did it. Finally, after all this time, I did it. Yoo-hoo. A wide smile was on her face before a pleasant laugh escaped her lips at her discovery. After so much effort, she was finally rewarded. A soft smile also appeared on Madara's lips as he watched the young woman jump for joy outside the house. He had learned to appreciate her rare moments of joy and he loved the freshness of her youth in this moment, though he wouldn't mention it. So it was a smiling Sakura who returned inside the house. Oya Achiha-san, did you sleep well? Sakura asked as she started the medical ritual. Hi, why the show of good cheer? Madara asked after wiping the smile from his lips. I finally did it. 
I finally figured out how to do regeneration without affecting the human body, Sakura said proudly. This woman had once again surprised him and continued to impress him day by day. Regeneration was something that many people had tried, to no avail. Then his thoughts turned to his arm and eye, they were finally going to be healed. Could you regrow any severed limb? Not that much. But I'll be able to work on your eye and arm soon, Sakura replied as she ran her chakra-covered hands over Madara's body. Any pain or discomfort to report? No. It's healing well. Good, it's healing properly. Are you ready to make your summons? Do you know the signs? Hi, focus and I'll take care of the rest, Sakura said before biting her thumb to get some blood flowing from it. She waved her hand before placing one of them on Madara's arm and pinning the second to the ground. She provided the blood and chakra and Madara provided the target to summon. Kuchiyos no Jutsu A large circle of Finjutsu appeared on the floor of the house from her hand. The blood was sucked into the seal before a cloud of smoke appeared to make way for a beautiful golden eagle. It looked around and when it saw Madara on the bed, it leaned forward. Uchihasama I need you to take this scroll to the Daimi of Ta no Kuni in person. I'm waiting for an answer from him and I'll give him two days. If you can stay close to him to listen to his reactions, that would be ideal, Madara explained, handing the scroll to the bird. It will be done, Uchiha-sama, the golden eagle bowed once more. Once the scroll was in place, it flew off to its destination. That was a beautiful animal, Sakura commented as she tended to her thumb wound before heading to the kitchen for dinner. Would you like to continue reading? Yes, Madara said before grabbing the book Sakura had written. Lesson 1, Dodge. If you're dead, you're useless. If you're injured, you'll have to take care of yourself first and your companions may die. Your priority is to stay alive. So before anything else, you need to train your body to react. Find a training partner and dodge whatever he throws at you. Let him go harder and harder, faster and faster. This way your body will gain muscle memory that will save you precious seconds between life and death. Don't rest on your laurels once you have achieved this. Don't get cocky and make it hard for yourself, because a ninja will never attack you head on. 90% of deaths are due to attacks from the back. So get several partners to continue this training to be attacked from several places at once. This will teach you to be aware of your surroundings, to analyze, and most importantly, to work on your visual memory. The more you train your eye to dodge projectiles as well as hand-to-hand -hand opponents, the more your eye will get used to it. This way, your brain will analyze by itself without you noticing it. With years of practice, you might even be able to anticipate attacks and see where your opponent will strike next. That last paragraph made Madara a little nervous. He felt like he was reading a description of one of the Sharingan's abilities. Maybe it was just a coincidence, maybe he had become a little too paranoid and was seeing traitors and spies everywhere. Nevertheless, he was brought out of his thoughts when he saw Sakura return with two trays. She placed one on the table in the room and approached him with the second. No, Madara said as Sakura moved closer to him. What do you mean no? Sakura asked in utter incomprehension. I want to be able to eat by myself at a Haruno-san table. Madara announced as he looked into her eyes. He wanted his pride back and not to be a burden that had to depend on someone else. Sakura turned slightly and placed Madara's tray on the table next to hers then walked over to her patient's bed. She picked him up before laying him down in front of the table, setting his legs up properly so they wouldn't get in the way. Once he was in a position where he could stand on his own, she sat down beside him. Itadakimasu Sakura grabbed her chopsticks before eating in silence. However, her gaze was still on her dining companion to see if he needed help. Itadakimasu, Madara said in turn before grabbing the spoon with his good hand. Thanks to Sakura's care this one had more mobility. He dipped the spoon into his bowl, then brought it to his lips. With this simple gesture, joy could be seen on his features, he was able to eat by himself he was becoming autonomous again and that was priceless to Uchiha Madara. Day 35 It had been almost a year since Hashiba Shita, the Shugo with the most territory and power in the land of rice fields, became Daimi. Thanks to his influence, 
he had succeeded in making his country prosper in the cultivation of rice, thus making an announcement to the rest of the world. He did not want any war on his land and was not a threat. Diomi Hashaba had made many agreements with the land of fire, the land of lightning and the land of earth, all three of which bordered him. In exchange for agricultural resources, this territory would be left as neutral ground that would not be allied to anyone. This tactical choice was put in place by the fact that he had no shinobi military force. Three quarters of the people were farmers working in the fields. These people had no awareness of the world around them and the political issues that were taking place. The harvest is going well this year, Daimi Sama, announced a man sitting at a table covered with parchment. Will it be enough to keep our commitments and the survival of the people? Hashaba asked. He was a man of normal build wearing a brown and white kimono. He was in his forties, clean-shaven except for a mustache and a goatee, with long black hair tied back in a ponytail. Hi Daimi Sama, replied the person who was in charge of the accounts. Then suddenly their conversation was cut short by the arrival of a magnificent bird of prey. This one could only bring a message because this was not the territory of such a bird. This kind of animal lived in the land of lightning and generally did not approach humans. Moreover, a small case was hung around his neck. He landed gracefully on one of the armrests of the chair intended for Daimi and waited. He stared into Hashaba's eyes and seemed to be waiting for him to grab the scroll case hanging around his neck. He reached out to grab the object before seeing the animal fly away and land gently on the window sill. The bird seemed to be doing its own thing so Hashaba decided to open the case. He immediately saw the quality of the scroll and concluded that it was someone very important and rich who had written to him. The more Hashaba read the message, the more serious and focused his eyes became, before he widened his eyes as he recognized the signature seal. His brain was racing as he imagined the possibilities of such an alliance with the great Achiha Madara. Is everything all right my lord? The secretary dared to ask and received only a glare in response. Excuse me, my lord. The daimi returned his gaze to the Achiha seal and pondered the stakes of such a move. Selling the information that the great Madara Achiha was still alive could bring him a lot of money. But on the other hand, peace and prosperity for his country as well as power. Hashaba rose from his seat, scroll in hand, and walked over to one of the braziers in the room. Get me a scroll for special occasions, the daimi ordered the only other person in the room, who hurried to comply. I am listening. The secretary had the quill in hand ready to write, but the words never came. The daimi was in the process of throwing the letter into the fire, which flared up in an instant, erasing all evidence of its existence. Get out. Hashaba ordered with a tone that could not be challenged. So the secretary quickly left, closing the door behind him. Only he and his four personal guards remained in the room. It was very rare for a daimi to write his own mail, but this was a situation where no one but him should read his letter. He sat down at the desk and began to write his reply to Achiha Madara. After about ten minutes, Hashaba poured wax on the bottom of the parchment and applied his daimi seal. He rolled up the scroll and stood up towards the raptor still standing at the edge of the window. He put the scroll in the case around his neck and closed it. No sooner had the daimi closed the case than the bird of prey flew away. Time will tell if I made the right choice. Chapter 9 Day 36 Do you really think he'll accept? Sakura asked. The two shinobi were currently seated at the central table of the room for lunch. It had been two days since they sent their message and they were anxiously awaiting the response of the daimi of Ta no Kuni. If his answer was positive, their plan would advance more quickly. If the daimi refused, they would probably have to kill him. In a way, he has no choice, Madara said. It's actually in his best interest to say yes. It would be very bad form to refuse a request from the Uchiha clan, especially its leader, the dark-haired man explained taking a piece of fish with his chopsticks. The current daimi would be very unwise to forget that if the elemental nations existed and especially that if he held this position it was in large part thanks to the Uchiha clan. To refuse would be like signing his death warrant. We're going to find out soon anyway, Madara added, his gaze focused on the outside. In the distance, a dark spot was approaching before gradually taking shape, a raptor. 
It was Madara's summons, and with a few beats of its wings, it landed on the table. The bird bowed to its master. Uchihasama, the animal, greeted respectfully. Report, the dark-haired man ordered in a leader's voice. It was an intonation Sakura had hardly ever heard. Through his voice, one could feel his strength, his determination. He was born to lead, a true leader. The daimi of Ta no Kuni responded within minutes of reading your message, Uchihasama, the golden eagle explained, straightening up. He took a few minutes to think things over before making a decision. He dismissed everyone in the room except for his bodyguards and wrote his response himself. The Uchiha was satisfied with these first words. The daimi was taking his letter seriously so that he would take the trouble to write it himself. This was something quite rare among country leaders. What did he do with the message he sent? Burned in a brazier, Achihasama, the bird quickly replied, not glancing at Sakura. Perfect, Madara exclaimed before opening the scroll case and pulling out its contents. Nice scroll, the daimi took it very seriously. To Achihadano. The world is constantly changing, and with it its share of events. The Muromachi era is now over, and with it that of the shinobi gods. Those who allowed by their presence to establish a certain stability are no more and as you say so well, the beginnings of war are at our doors. However, you can imagine that I only aspire to the prosperity of my country and to peace. I suspect that with your proposal comes its share of war and bloodshed. But after all, he who desires peace, prepares for war. Nevertheless, I would be suicidal to refuse your proposal. And I cannot ignore who you are. My country exists because you have established the elemental nations. I dare to hope that your death was part of your plans to disappear and act more easily in the shadows. I, Daimi Hashiba Shita of Ta no Kuni accept your proposal Uchihadano, in the hope and expectation that I am doing the right thing. I await your directives. That's fine, Madara said, placing the scroll on the table. They now had free reign to run the country of Ta no Kuni. I'll let you go hunting my friend and get some rest. In three hours I will entrust you with another courier and you can return home after delivering it. Hi, Uchihasama, the animal bowed before flying off into the valley to hunt for food. We need resources now, Sakura said more to herself than to the dark-haired man at her side. Hi, and we need to do this quietly, Madara confirmed, as Sakura headed for her desk. She pulled out a scroll once more and prepared to write another missive to the daimi. I am listening, Uchiha-san. Daimi Dano. Like any country, a flourishing economy is the basis of everything. Don't worry about that, I have an endless supply of money to support several wars in a row. However, having the means without having the resources is useless. I need you to create huge reserves. I don't care how you do it, but you need to collect as much money as possible to last for years. Make requests in various countries for food. Grain, wheat, rice and anything that can be stored for a long time. Also, if you have a person with knowledge of finjutsu, seal vegetables, fruits, meat. Check with your advisors, but find various excuses for the different countries. Bad harvest, parasite, population boom, it's up to you, but be as discreet as possible. You also need to gather a lot of raw materials. Start the project to expand your capital, make new houses, new shops. What for? You will understand in the future. Order a lot of wood from Hai no Kuni, stone from Tsuchi no Kuni, iron from Kaminari no Kuni, exploit every wealth of each country and this at the lowest possible price. You have to make important reserves for the future and it doesn't matter what you do, but you have to be discreet and clever. If you can do this without suspicion for at least six months, then we will win. As soon as I'm available I'll come to you with some money to fill your treasury, so use your money. Don't use wax and bring me a kunai and an unused feather, Madara said. What are you going to do? Sakura asked as she approached her patient at the center table. She conjured a kunai from one of her many seals in a puff of smoke, then handed it to the dark-haired man. The latter placed the scroll in front of him before grasping the weapon. He made a small cut on his thumb, then dipped the top of his ring to impregnate it. He then affixed the seal of the Uchiha clan with his blood on the scroll. 
He then took the virgin feather and placed it on his cut so that the tip was covered with his blood. He signed it thus, Achiha Madara. I have just made a deed of blood, proving that I am committed to providing what I said in the letter, the dark-haired man explained to the young woman's silent question. He began to suck his thumb to stop the bleeding. He'll feel more serene this way, I'll let you do your Haruno-san finjutsu again. Hi, but first show me your thumb so I can fix this, Sakura demanded as she grabbed the Uchiha's arm. I've done my part, now I'd like to know what you plan to do once the war starts. How will you proceed Haruno-san? Madara asked, his thumb now unscarred. The big countries won't go to war with each other at home. What do you mean? The small countries will suffer the consequences. Many alliances are made between large countries and smaller countries that are merely vassals. But it will be on their lands that the battles will be fought. So I intend to go to those countries and evacuate as many people as possible. After the battles, Sakura explained, her own sentence hurting her. Why not before? The dark-haired man wondered. Because unfortunately, I need them to be desperate to offer them our help, a home, food, and a new family, Sakura said in a determined voice. Day 50 Okay, I want you to try to stand up on your own two legs, Sakura announced to the dark-haired man who was currently sitting on the edge of his bed. The young woman was at his side, ready to support him if he failed. Madara had expected another ritual from the young woman to heal his back and prepare his legs, but it seemed that while she was healing his nerve endings, she had also healed his legs. It was with great surprise and satisfaction that Madara complied. He placed his right hand on the edge of the bed and thus began the task of standing on both legs. He felt pain in his lower body from the effort and could feel the trembling in his lower limbs. Stop! Sakura ordered as she saw that Madara was having difficulty. She then stood in front of him and offered. Put your right hand in mine and use me for support. Madara still had his pride, but in order to regain the use of his body, he managed to put it aside. He placed his hand in her hand and couldn't help but find it soft. Normally, a ninja's hands were calloused and worn from the hard work of training. Yet hers were soft and gentle. He had already caught a glimpse of her softness through her care when she touched him, but today was different. So he used the strength of his arm to pull himself up and Sakura didn't flinch an inch despite the weight of her patient. Madara slowly rose to his feet and ended up on both legs after about twenty seconds of effort. His limbs were shaking, and used to being pushed around. Sit back down, Sakura ordered after a moment. It looks like there's almost no damage, she confirmed with satisfaction. She had managed to accomplish something extremely dangerous and complicated. Many times she could have killed her patient without meaning to, but she wasn't just anyone, she was Sakura Haruno. Once Madara was settled back on the bed, Sakura knelt down and brought her chakra-covered hands to the dark-haired man's lower limbs. While applying her healing chakra, she made Madara's legs flex and extend. No discomfort. No, replied the man whose gaze was on the woman in charge of his care. Good, try to bend your right leg as much as possible by yourself without using chakra, Sakura asked as she placed the leg on the ground. Madara did the exercise and managed to bend it very slightly, his muscles still too weak to raise it any higher. Is it the same feeling as when we did the abdominal exercises? She asked, trying to get a feel for her patient. No, I feel that my leg responds to my orders, I just. Not the strength, admitted Madara who tried to bend a little more his member, in vain. Extend your leg now, but don't stretch it out. Sakura continued before the brunette did so with much more ease. Okay, extension is easier than flexion, she noted then. Now rotate your leg outwards, then inwards slowly. I felt a small shock go through my knee to my back, Madara confided as he swung his leg outwards. Sakura quickly put her hands on the knee before using her IRY ninjutsu. Continue with this spinning motion while I look for the problem, Sakura said. Madara rotated his limb inward once more, then outward and the small shock was felt. There. There it goes again, Madara pointed, tensing up. Stay in that position, if it gets too painful, stop, Sakura pointed out, seeing what the problem was. What's causing this? The Uchiha asked, over the past few days he had finished Sakura Haruno's first book. 
thanks to her he had become a little more interested in the human body. One of the side effects of what Hashirama did to you, it affected your sciatic nerve. The pain you felt was due to a mechanical problem in the lumbar mobile segment, whether it was in the joints, ligaments, or your muscles. They are responsible for pain radiating from the spine to behind your knees. Sakura had explained all this before standing up to inspect the man's back. Continue to hold the position and tell me to stop when I've reached the peak of pain in your back, she explained again, placing two of her fingers on his lower back and slowly moving up his spine. Here, Madara exclaimed once she had reached the dorsal vertebrae D12. Breathe in, the young woman announced, placing two of her fingers perpendicularly before injecting a large amount of chakra once more. Ah! Madara yelled, despite the fact that this wasn't the first time he'd experienced this type of pain, it still hurt like hell when she did this. He could once again feel the pain wash over him and spread through his entire body. It was less unbearable than the first time, but it still hurt like hell. Take small breaths, Sakura whispered in his ear as she massaged his back. Since Madara had agreed to help her, Sakura had changed her attitude a bit. She had put aside her vision of the Madara of her timeline to focus on the man in front of her. A man with a completely different vision, one who hadn't had time to think about the Eye of the Moon plan and who wasn't influenced by Black Zetsu. If you take away this knowledge of a potential monster, Madara was a very interesting person. He was certainly a macho man who she would love to rip his balls off, but he now seemed to consider her an equal. Probably due to seeing all her skills and healing him. In almost two months, Sakura had discovered a person who was curious, invested, proud and with honor. She could see a softer, more fragile side from time to time, which he was quick to hide so that no one would see that side. Are you feeling better? Sakura asked softly, still massaging the vertebra. Hi, Madara answered weakly. Repeat the movement with your left leg and tell me if the sensation is still there. The dark-haired man tried to do as she asked and found that he no longer felt the discomfort and pain. He was slightly out of breath from all the treatments. The young woman waited for him to recover before kneeling down in front of him. She explained to him that they would proceed in the same way with the right leg. The Uchiha was a little apprehensive but strangely enough it was easier on that side. Why was the T? He had no idea, but he managed to get that leg a little higher than the other. He didn't hesitate to question the pink-haired woman who continued to monitor the movements of the right limb while giving instructions to the dark-haired man. I suppose you're right-handed, aren't you? The man nodded his head in agreement. You involuntarily put more muscle into your right arm and your right leg. Since it was more muscular than the left, it's easier to use it now, Sakura replied professionally. I don't feel any pain when I rotate, Madara anticipated, already rotating after extending her. Perfect. Sakura enthused before looking at Madara with a slightly sadistic smile. From now on, every day we'll do rehabilitation exercises for your legs. But first, let's get back to your abdominal exercises. She helped the dark-haired man to lie comfortably on the floor and then placed her hands on his knees. Come on, give me a set of five and hold your core on the sixth pull-up, Sakura commanded as she stared into the brunette's eyes. Madara complied and did his exercise to slowly build up his muscles without damaging his back. He had been feeling his upper body obey him properly for the past few days, except for his left arm. The pain from his scars had completely disappeared and only the sensation of effort was present. Hold on for another ten seconds. This had become their new morning routine. The treatment of his organs was done more quickly, but the physical exercises were now longer. Day 52 Today was a very ordinary day in the world of Madara and Sakura. They had completed their medical ritual, as well as the rehabilitation exercises. They had eaten in silence while enjoying the music from the gramophone. However, the rehabilitation was exhausting for Madara and he fell asleep quickly that night. He no longer needed to be put to sleep with chakra, except when his doctor deemed it necessary. So it was two hours later that Sakura decided to go to bed. She blew out the candles in the main room, but not without checking the protections at each entrance. She was after all a ninja in a dangerous time, with the future of the world in her hands, so she had to be on her guard at all times. She walked to her room and carefully placed her candle on the bedside table. 
Sakura removed all of her clothes and put them in the laundry basket. She then put on a pair of pink silk panties and a black t-shirt that she usually used for sleeping. Seeing the pile of laundry she had gathered, Sakura realized that she would have to do some laundry tomorrow morning at the river. The young woman's room was quite modest, she had two pieces of furniture in which her clothes were stored, a bed in the center with a bedside table and a wardrobe built into the wall. On her bedside table were two photo frames that were important to her. One was of her parents smiling. The second was a picture of Team 7 after Kakashi became Rokudame Hokage. She knew it was dangerous to have that kind of picture visible, but Madara couldn't move by himself yet. But she knew that very soon, she would have to hide those two photographs. As she sat on her bed, Sakura stared at the floor, thinking about how much she'd accomplished in almost three months. Her house had been built, she'd bonded with a village and made a friend. She had eliminated Black Zetsu and made the choice to save Madara to guide him to bring peace. Many would call her a fool and a traitor for helping such a character. But they were not like her. She had listened to the words of the Ricketts and Neen, she had decided to see the world in its true light to understand why the world was rotten. The worst part of all this was not the fact that there was misery. It was seeing people close their eyes to it, hoping that it would disappear on its own. With all this time at her disposal, Sakura had taken the time to analyze Madara's view of her timeline. And unfortunately, she could understand why he had wanted to plunge the world into a genjutsu. Because the world was stupid, greedy, selfish and this one never learned. It repeated the same mistakes over and over again. So, putting it into an illusion was a solution. But not the right one. Sakura understood this vision, but couldn't accept it, the world would have no free will and this peace would be the same as in her time, false. Luckily, the moment Sakura saved Madara, she prevented Zetsu from guiding him to this famous Moon Eye plan. For the time being, the Madara in the other room had not had sixty years to think of this plan. Today, Uchiha Madara's peace was achievable and Sakura had every intention of helping him while improving this vision. With their plan in motion, Sakura wondered if the people she had known and loved would exist in the future. Sure, they wouldn't recognize her at all, but would they exist? Because what the two protagonists wanted to do would change the face of the world as it was. Sakura turned to her bedside table and grabbed the frame containing the picture of her parents. Tu Chan. Ka Chan. Sakura suddenly had tears falling on the frame. She had become strong, but it was still hard for her to think that her parents no longer existed and probably never would. In any case, even if they appeared in the new future to come, they would not recognize her as a child because their temporality will have been completely changed. None of those she had known would ever be part of her life again. She lay down on the bed, still holding the picture in front of her, and then suddenly she broke down. She began to cry as softly as possible, thinking about her past, about the people she loved. She tried to stop the flow of pain that was coming over her once again, but to no avail. Madara was gently awakened by muffled noises. Was he dreaming? It took him a few seconds to regain his senses and remember where he was. It was night, the room was lightly lit by the glow of the moon. He remembered, he was recovering. But what disturbed him was that muffled sound he heard once again. He concentrated chakra as quietly as possible in his ears to increase the hearing. Thanks to this, he could distinguish perfectly the slightest suspicious noise and especially if someone was hiding in the house. But instead of an enemy, he perceived that it was someone in pain. He immediately understood who the feeling belonged to. Sakura. Why was she crying? Was it because of him? Was it because of her past? Or was it her own demons that were haunting her? Although she hadn't told him anything about her history, the little he had managed to get out of her in all those weeks at her side, he had deduced that she had suffered and lost everything. Madara had always considered women to be useless, weak and uninteresting. That crying was not suitable for a man, that being merciful never brought anything good. But that was all before. For almost two months now, Madara had begun to change, to think differently. All his life he had only seen women who didn't deserve his attention and it was refreshing for Madara to meet a woman like Sakura. She was sweet, kind, beautiful, but at the same time deadly dangerous, and it was largely because of her that Madara changed. 
She was the second woman he didn't consider weak and she was the only woman in the world he saw as his equal. He was looking forward to the chance to fight in a friendly match, or to see her on the battlefield. She was also a woman who had taught him that reaching out could do so much. The proof was that it had saved his life. Besides, there was one thing Madara hated, people picking on the people he loved. And Sakura was starting to fall into that category of people. So it hurt to hear her cry and his body acted in spite of itself. He pushed back the blanket with his able-bodied arm and slowly straightened up to find himself sitting on the edge of the bed. He didn't know what he could do to stop her crying, but he was going to do something. Anything. The hardest part was ahead of him, he put both feet on the floor and tried to balance himself on his legs. They shook with the effort and after a few seconds Madara managed to stand. He managed to take one step. Two steps, but finally lost his balance because his legs were not yet ready for such an effort. He collapsed to the ground with a loud thud and a groan of pain. He still managed to break his fall with his right arm. Barely a second after his fall, Madara heard someone running through the house. The next moment he could see the door to the room open with a bang as Sakura entered. She was back in warrior mode thinking of an intruder. She was dressed in a black t-shirt and simple underwear. Her green eyes glowed slightly in the darkness, evidence that chakra was flowing into her eyes to see better in the night. She held a kanai in each hand ready to fight. Madara thanked the darkness, as a blush settled on his face at such a sight. Uchiha-san! Sakura exclaimed as she saw Madara on the ground. She glanced around the room quickly, looking for an enemy. When she found none, she realized that Madara had probably fallen out of bed. She dropped her weapons and ran to him to pick him up. She crouched down and picked him up and laid him on the bed. As soon as she heard the sound of the fall, she had rushed in, ready to fight for her home and her patient. She didn't care what she was wearing at the time or what tears were still on her cheeks. Nothing was more important than protecting Madara. That's why she was completely unaware of the embarrassment of the man seeing her so scantily clad for the first time. She quickly lit a candle on the bedside table and worried about why the Uchiha was on the floor. Did you have a nightmare? Sakura asked as she looked at the dark-haired man's body for any injuries. No. I'm sorry, Madara apologized. This surprised Sakura who didn't understand why he was presenting them to her. This was the second time he had apologized to her, the first time was because a member of his clan had tried to kill her. Why? Sakura asked uncertainly. Madara finally turned his face to the young woman. She still had tears on her cheeks and her green eyes were slightly reddened. He couldn't bear to see such a thing. He gently raised his right arm to place his hand on Sakura's cheek. He gently wiped away the tears that were still there. Sakura was far too shocked by the gesture to make any movement. I don't like to see you cry, Madara announced in a deep voice before wiping the second cheek. It doesn't suit you. Sakura didn't know what to make of the man in front of her. He was being delicate with her and seemed concerned about her condition. Who knew Madara had a heart in his chest? Plus, he had just made another reference to her being pretty. The young woman couldn't hide the blush that was building up in her cheeks, so she gently grabbed Madara's hand as he wiped them clean to stop him from doing so. Sorry, she said before wiping away the rest of her tears herself without letting go of the Uchiha's hand. I didn't mean to wake you up, is that why you fell? You're past. Madara asked, ignoring Sakura's comment. He saw her lower her eyes as if ashamed. Hi, she replied in a small, emotional voice. Do you want to talk about it? Madara offered with an unfamiliar concern. I miss the people I love, Sakura confided softly, squeezing the dark-haired man's hand a little tighter. Do you have family somewhere? Madara asked softly and only received a no from Sakura with her head. She looked like she was ready to snap again, so Madara burst his chakra into his hand and around him. Chakra could be used for what the ninja called, killing intent, but the opposite could also be done. When a chakra was powerful enough, it could envelop someone with its feelings. So Madara gave off a feeling of understanding, protection, security, warmth and comfort. 
The people we love will always be with us, Madara explained wisely and in a voice that was meant to be comforting before pointing to Sakura's heart with their linked hands. Don't mourn them, live your life to make them proud of you. Sakura never thought chakra could be used in this way and she felt a little better. She could feel Madara's power through her chakra and slowly her painful thoughts diminished. But she couldn't help but wonder why Madara was doing this. Why was he taking the time to comfort a woman? Why couldn't he be the man she had known? It would be so much easier to hate him than to let this new feeling come over her. Arigato. Chapter 10 Having faith in one's abilities, just like having faith in oneself, was the key to success. Sakura Haruno knew this all too well, having experienced it more than once in her life as a ninja. Some people were capable of exceptional acts that could be considered miracles of life. But Sakura had learned that their success was only due to the faith that the people performing them had. How many times had she seen Tsunade or other fellow doctors perform perilous medical operations? Sure, they were competent doctors, but mastery of techniques was not everything, it was truly due to their belief that they would succeed and get the desired result. Similarly, when she had taken the Chinin exam, Sakura would not have been able to pull it all off if she had not believed in herself. Just like all the times she had to fight an enemy. If she hadn't had faith in her abilities, she never would have defeated them. It was because of this, or rather because of it, that she had become stronger and stronger. Not only physically, but also psychically. She knew that if she became discouraged, if she lost this unshakable faith in herself, she could die. So she had finally toughened up and strengthened her mind. By developing her self-confidence, the young woman had also increased her determination to succeed in whatever she undertook. And that was what had allowed her to save this man from death when everyone else would have given up or not even tried. But not her. Because when Sakura had an idea in mind, a goal, she succeeded. Even if it was difficult, exhausting, daunting, repulsive, she would continue until she was satisfied. But the pink-haired Kunoichi had discovered something else. If faith could lead to success, the opposite could also serve certain interests. And as much as it bothered her, Sakura knew that war was not just about physical confrontation. No, war was also fought on the psychic level. How many nations had fallen in the end? How many people had surrendered? All because they had lost their faith. Because the psychological pressure exerted on them had totally destroyed them and they had not known how to bounce back otherwise. These people and nations had no choice but to accept the worst things, no more money, no more home, no more free will, even to the point of considering themselves useless in the world. But sometimes all it took was one person to change things. And Sakura knew this all too well, having known Naruto Uzumaki. He was one of those people who was like a light in the darkness. He had never deviated from his goal, to bring Sasuke back to the village and more broadly, to make sure that peace existed between peoples and nations. How many people had the blonde man helped to find the path to hope? Undoubtedly, he had been the one who had motivated the troops during the Fourth Great Shinobi War, the one who had made it possible for the Ninja Alliance not to despair and for them all to become allies. So it was with her missing friend in mind that Sakura was convinced that the peace she sought with Uchiha Madara had to come through these two aspects of faith. Believing in oneself and giving hope. Day 55 It had been two days since Hashiba, the daimi of Ta no Kuni, had made the choice to join the cause of Madara Uchiha. He had been a bit reluctant at first, but when he received the second letter, his doubts and fears disappeared. It was very rare to see a clan leader sign in blood, it was proof that he was committed to doing what he had written. And if the legendary Madara signed in blood, he would do what he said because he had only one word. So Hashiba decided to keep his word in turn. He began to think long and hard about how to proceed. It was going to be difficult to remain discreet in light of Madara's request. Especially since Hashiba knew that if he was caught doing this, he would be accused of betraying the neighboring countries with whom he had made trade agreements. Tanaka called the daimi in a loud voice to the attention of his secretary who immediately raised his head in the direction of his lord. Yes daimi-sama. Send a letter to all the members of the council, tell them to be present within two days. Ordered the country leader to his subordinate who hurried to fetch scrolls to make the summonses. It's as good as done, daimi-sama, 
Tanaka assured him as he wrote the first letter. Suzuki. Hashiba shouted towards the door. Barely two seconds passed when a door opened and a heavy set man entered the room. He was in his forties, with a few scars on his face, a sign of a life as a warrior. He also had an eye patch from an old injury. His jet black hair was tied in a high ponytail and he was dressed in dark samurai armor. Daimisama. Command and I will obey. Replied the man, waving his hand against his chest. They had fought together for many years during the provincial war. One became Daimi while the other was appointed his closest advisor and leader of his armies. A small army, but an army nonetheless. Both Hashiba and Suzuki had mastered the rudiments of chakra. They were not shinobi, but were able to use rudimentary techniques, such as bunshin no jutsu or henjin. However, their strength lay in the fact that they were both skilled swordsmen. They were not samurai, however, because the samurai would not stoop to the use of chakra, which was dishonorable. The mirror is the soul of the woman. The daimi began enigmatically. Just as the sword is the soul of the warrior, Suzuki completed, realizing such a sentence. To anyone else it was just a warrior's proverb, but to Suzuki and Hashiba it meant that the beginnings of war were near again. Reduce the surveillance patrols, the nations now know our position towards the world, the Lord explained. Besides, I now need our soldiers for anything else. You will split our army into several parts and organize many expeditions. As you wish. Spread the word in the city that we need men for our caravans and that the pay will be commensurate with the task at hand. Organize this for the next two days. You will have to prepare caravans and groups that will go through all the elemental nations. Why my friend? Suzuki asked, and although he respected his lord by virtue of his position, he was also his friend. He was helping him to govern the country by giving him advice and he needed to understand this sudden request better. For the prosperity and peace of this world, replied the daimyo before turning to Tanaka and his guards, what is said here must never leave these walls. He added in an uncompromising voice. The daimyo was surrounded only by people he trusted, but threats were always necessary if one did not want to be betrayed by appearing weak. Hi! replied the six other people in the room, Suzuki, Tanaka and the four bodyguards. Each of them knew that if any of them had the idea of betraying their lord, they would lose their heads by their own hand. Times are changing, and we must evolve with them if we do not want to be eradicated, said Hashiba, who seemed to have gained a few years in one go, such was the gravity of his words. Day 57 Ohai advisors, I have summoned you all today to discuss the future of Ta no Kuni and what I intend to do, Hashiba began, looking at his advisors. There were six of them so that even if there was a tie in arguments, the daimi would decide. They were seated on cushions on the floor, Suzuki to his right and the other five facing him. Only his secretary Tanaka was placed on a separate table to record the entire conversation. As we managed to survive on our agreements with the large neighboring countries, I have received an offer that I could not ignore, the feudal lord continued for his audience. He poured himself a cup of hot tea before continuing. This person is ambitious and wants what we have always wanted to bring, the prosperity of our country. Who is this person Daimisama? Asked a very old man, in fact he was the oldest in the assembly, approaching sixty. It was a feat to reach such an age in those days. I will withhold his name for the moment, Umajisama, Hashiba replied respectfully. He may have been the lord of this land, but Umaji had always given him valuable advice that led him to where he was now. And that is why he showed him so much respect, but also because he was very old. You should know that he will come to meet us in person when the time comes for him to manifest himself. What does he want from us? Suzuki asked, still wearing his fighter's armor. To prepare ourselves, to make huge reserves, to enlarge the capital to accommodate more people, Hashiba explained, remembering the last letter he had also burned so that no one could read it. Did he say why? Asked Ramaji, trying to understand why such a request, if not to wage war. The old man grabbed a cup of hot tea and poured some sugar into it. It was a rare commodity and only those of the nobility could afford to have sugar. He said that everything would be explained in the near future, Hashiba assured. This could cost our treasury a lot of money, Daimi-sama, 
I doubt we have the finances to carry out such a project, argued another man, younger than the others this time. He was one of Hashabah's sons, he was not a fighter, but was extremely good at managing the country's economy. This man is extremely wealthy and has pledged to provide us with the funds for his projects, Hashabah explained to his son before bringing the cup to his lips and blowing gently on it. How do we know he's not lying to us? Ramaji asked wisely. The old man, from experience, preferred to make sure that this was not a trap to weaken the country in order to conquer it later. It was known throughout the world that Tano Kuni was a neutral country that indirectly had the protection of the great countries that surrounded it. A seal of blood. This simple answer silenced everyone because very few people used this practice which was a solemn commitment. Don't we risk attracting the wrath of the other countries by accepting his offer? Suzuki worried, seeing the negative side of the proposal. He was a fighter, but had been through enough battles to want to avoid future ones. That's what I thought too. It's more than likely that we'll incur the wrath of neighboring countries when they find out what we're doing. But the person who contacted me has the power to change the world. What are your guidelines then? Suzuki asked. We need to gather enough resources to accomplish our goal and find subtle ways to do so to be as unobtrusive as possible. Hmm, we need to send caravans to all the countries to collect as much food as possible in case of a siege. Since we don't have a shinobi army, they'll be less suspicious of our caravans, Umaji suggested after a moment's thought. I think we should avoid the capitals as much as possible, suggested the son of Hashiba. Your son is right Daimisama, unless we have a real reason we should avoid the capitals. At least at first. And it will all depend on what this man says next, another advisor argued in a loud voice. I'll make contact with some friends in Kaminari no Kuni, I might be able to get some good arrangements for food, Maji continued, gently stroking his white beard. Do any of you know anyone skilled in Finjutsu? Asked the feudal lord casually, who received only negative nods, except from Ramaji who was still touching his beard. If it is something simple, I think I have the man for it. Good, because we'll have to seal up all our supplies and put them in a safe place. And what are you going to do about the town? Daiki asked. Start construction. Tanaka. You'll prepare an announcement for tomorrow that a huge construction project is about to begin and that we need manpower, Hashiba dictated to his secretary. Hi. Now we have to decide where to send our caravans. The Daimi stated as Tanaka hurriedly laid several maps of the elemental nations on the floor in front of the council. Day 75. For almost three weeks now, Sakura had been imposing rehabilitation exercises on her patient, who could feel lucky to have this woman at his bedside. He had a doctor who took care of him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But more importantly, this was not just any doctor, it was one of the greatest the world has ever known and the most powerful today. Normally, to learn to walk again because of a back injury, it took years of work to expect to stand. Even more so to walk by yourself. But with Sakura's knowledge and her IRY ninjutsu, this would be fixed in a few months. Why does it take so long to heal? Madara asked, he had no idea how long it would take the human body to recover. He had hardly ever been injured thanks to his skills and his Sharingan. So being in recovery was totally new to him, especially for so long. Consider yourself privileged Uchiha-san, if it weren't for me it would be years before you could walk again, Sakura replied as she injected her chakra into Madara's legs to repair his muscles after the exertion. Is that arrogance I hear? Madara asked with a small smile. This was the first time he had seen the young woman brag about her abilities, she had always been humble and unassuming. I consider you the most powerful ninja in the elemental nations and you feel the same way, Sakura replied, still focused on her work. Does that make you arrogant? I see your point, Madara replied, understanding that there was nothing arrogant about saying you were the best when it was a reality. A few more bends and extensions, Sakura ordered and the man performed them with gusto. Anything that would give him back the use of his legs was good for him, so he never balked at the instructions she gave him. It was much easier now, in fact, as he could practically bring his leg up to his chest. It was proof that everything was healing properly thanks to the young woman. If you had to rank yourself in terms of power Hiruno-san, where would you place yourself? Madara asked, very interested in her answer. 
After all, he had seen many of her abilities, but didn't know what she thought of herself. It's subjective. Sakura began as she began to think about where she stood in the shinobi world. As you know, even a child can kill the most powerful of fighters if they're prepared. You know what I mean, Haruno-san, Madara replied, seeing Sakura's point being made. Hmm, since I'm not known, only five people would be able to kill me, but of course that's relative, the cherry blossom finally replied based on her knowledge of the Sengoku era. If she were in her own time, there were many ninja who would have been able to match her, but only because they knew of her abilities. Who are they? Madara insisted, curious about these people. You, Toborama Senju, Ashina Uzumaki, M and Genjetsu Zuki. Each of these five people, if they were engaged in a fight to the death against me, would probably kill me, Sakura explained, knowing when she was outclassed. If she were to engage in a fair fight against these five individuals, she would have a very difficult time getting out of it. Sure, they'd be in a bad way too. But I know my limits. She confessed then. You don't include Hashirama? The dark-haired man was surprised that his rival and former friend wasn't mentioned. He's dead, Sakura added as if it were a mere triviality. Good point, why would you lose to these other four people? Madara asked with disgust and anger as he thought back to Toborama. This was a man he wanted more than anything to eradicate from the face of the earth. He who had caused the death of his brother. Sakura stopped what she was doing and sat down on the floor to think about it. She had the advantage of knowing a lot about these four people from books, but formulating it was a whole other ball game. Toborama, as was Hashirama and yourself, are virtuosos in the ninja arts. He's a veteran, so unless we can surprise him, he'll end up outclassing me. He's not an army killer, but he's a great fighter. As for Ashina. One word, Finjutsu. Thanks to my knowledge in Finjutsu, I know that he would be able to take armies by himself. As for M, he is known to become invisible and I am not the sensory type. And as for Genjetsu Zuki. You know very well why I will have no chance against him. This man has the reputation of being invulnerable. On the other hand, if they make the mistake of underestimating me, they'd die in an instant, conceded the confident young woman. I'm always surprised that I've never heard of you. I'm a woman and this is a world without mercy for the female gender. So I've been acting three quarters of my life under a henjin. Okay, now spread your legs, do a squat but don't force it too much. Madara complied and felt the pain in his knees as he bent, he straightened up at the limit. Good, now hold on to me, Sakura said as she moved to his right. How about a little walk in the garden? Sakura had a beautiful smile on her lips as she said this, for it implied many things. Among other things, that Madara was finally ready to walk. Hi, I'd love to, the dark-haired man exclaimed in disbelief as a very thin smile stretched across his lips. It was the first time Sakura had seen a smile like that on his face and it made her feel better about this man. Lean against me and take your time, Sakura recommended as she stood beside the dark-haired man to support him. The man leaned against the girl and walked very slowly across the main room, one step at a time. He moved slowly and that was priceless to Madara. If he had been alone, he probably would have shed tears of happiness, but he was a man. And a man never showed his weaknesses. So he swallowed the feeling and concentrated on his legs. Once he reached the French windows, he had to climb a staircase of three steps. It was much harder than walking on flat ground and bending his leg made him lose his balance. Luckily Sakura was there to help him and she kept him from falling to the ground before steadying him. Easy, Sakura said sympathetically. He brought his second leg next to the first. He had just descended the first step, with difficulty and help, but he managed. He was not judged or criticized and could take his time to succeed. So it was with great motivation that Madara lifted his right leg to take the second step. He adjusted his position thanks to Sakura and finally managed to get down the last two steps. The feeling of contentment and pride was too great this time. He could neither hide the smile on his face nor the tears that were starting to fall from his eyes. Yet no tears were shed, but Sakura saw the emotion. She saw the great Uchiha Madara being human, the cold, bloody being did have a heart and could feel emotions. 
After about 10 meters, the two protagonists arrived at the edge of the cliff where a wooden bench was placed. She helped her patient to sit comfortably before joining him to admire the view. It's beautiful, Madara whispered, looking out over the valley before him. It stretched as far as the eye could see, disappearing into the horizon. There were many mountains that made up the land of the rice paddies and it must have been a difficult place to get to. Long minutes passed in a comfortable silence. Each of them in their own thoughts as they stared at the horizon and enjoyed this moment of peace. Nevertheless, Madara watched the young woman beside him. She was anything but normal, she was a woman who had a hair color that was unique in the world to begin with. The way she dressed was anything but traditional, she dressed in odd clothes but he couldn't help but find her beautiful in her style. Her hair had grown a little since the first time they met. It was a little below her chin in a sort of layered bob, delicately encompassing her face. Today she was wearing white trousers accompanied by a striped top made up of several colors, green, red, beige and black. It went well with her face. Madara had known many women in his life, he had known carnal desire, physical attraction, but what he had been feeling for some time was a sensation he could not define and it scared him a little. After all, the unknown was scary and many people would rather close their eyes than go in that direction. Why do you despise women Uchiha-san? The pink-haired young woman suddenly asked. She slowly shifted her gaze in the direction of the dark-haired man, her face filled with curiosity. She wanted to know what had caused a man like him to despise the female gender. For they are useless and weak, Madara began, looking down. Two months ago he would have ended his sentence like that, but not after meeting Sakura. He then added, at least, for the most part. Do you consider me weak or useless? Sakura asked without looking away. She wanted to make him think, she wanted him to change and evolve in the right direction. In a way, what Sakura was doing was psychological manipulation. Proving that what you were thinking wasn't necessarily the right thing, but making sure that the thought came from the person concerned and not from an external source. No. I must admit that you are the only woman I respect, Madara admitted, and this pleased Sakura immensely. It was very difficult to gain this man's respect and for a woman to gain it was the equivalent of the end of the world. Why? Sakura continued. You know very well why, Madara retorted, reluctant to elaborate on his thoughts on the matter. I'd still like to hear it from you, Uchiha-san, the young Kunoichi insisted, finally getting what she wanted. For you are strong and independent, the clan leader conceded. He could only admit that she had those qualities he had just stated and it felt strange to see the weaker sex so different from his upbringing. His father had always told him that women were useless, that women were nothing less than objects and that they had to serve men. And why do you think I am what you say I am? Predisposition, the vagaries of life, training, Madara mused, thinking about what could have made Sakura so competent. What if other women were given the same chances I had? Do you think these women would still be useless and weak? Sakura asked, wanting to make the dark-haired man understand her point of view, that women were the equal of men as long as they were given the chance to prove it. Madara was skeptical of what Sakura was saying. To him she was a unique being that no other woman could match. Even with training Madara highly doubted that was possible. I doubt any other woman could match you. A man becomes strong and powerful through training Uchiha-san, a woman is only useless because men have decided she will be useless. If you were to give these women the chance to have the same education, training and training as the men, you would see that women are far from useless and weak, Sakura explained seriously. She knew what she was talking about because she had seen many women in her life who were exceptional. Women who were even superior to men in some areas. Of course, both men and women can be good or bad at certain things. But one's strength should not be defined by the existence of a pair of balls between the legs. It's only by one's convictions and belief in one's abilities that a person becomes strong, Sakura argued vehemently. Madara remained silent in the face of this speech, it went against all his teachings. He couldn't erase twenty years of teaching with a snap of his fingers, it was extraordinary that he had listened without reacting, or even listened at all to the young woman. Of course, a woman can never surpass a man in brute strength, but a woman is more agile, lighter. 
more flexible and can fight in a whole different way than a man could, Sakura continued in the face of the brunette's silence as he seemed deep in thought. I will never in my life attempt an arm wrestling match with you Hiruno-san, the brunette affirmed on the subject of brute strength. He knew that if he tried to coerce Sakura with physical force, he would undoubtedly lose. Wise decision, Sakura smiled before continuing. All of this is to say that when we get our people, I would like you to consider my words. Women are not objects and even less useless. Yes we are more physically fragile, yes we are more sensitive, but we are still human beings just as capable as any man. Just as not all men are destined to be great fighters. I would think about it, Madara conceded. If it had been anyone other than Sakura who had made that speech, he would have ignored it completely. But he couldn't ignore a woman like Sakura, not after what she had done for him. Thank you, Sakura said before standing up and extending her hand in Madara's direction. It's time to go home Uchiha-san. The man grasped the hand and slowly sat up. He longed to hold Sakura's soft hand in his, though he didn't know why. Reluctantly he let go of her hand to better lean against her arm to walk. They took the time it took for the dark-haired man to cover the distance and especially the stairs. Once back in the house, properly installed so that he could rest his legs, the man called out to the young woman who was about to prepare the meal. Hiruno-san. The young woman turned to look at the man who was calling her his voice was deep, as if he was about to make an official announcement. I am infinitely grateful for everything you do for me. You pulled me out of the clutches of death, took care of me, gave me back the use of my legs. For all this and all that you will do, I thank you. Sakura-san. Sakura was speechless, she really didn't expect to ever receive such thanks from this man. Besides, he hadn't called her Hiruno-san, but Sakura-san, proof that she had become someone important to him. She didn't know what to say, a whole bunch of different emotions were running through her right now. Please, Madara-san, she replied in a voice almost shaking with emotion, before leaving the room and heading to the kitchen. Chapter 11 Day 90 For three months now, Sakura had been at an impasse. Indeed, the young woman was discovering in Madara a totally different person. She saw a powerful, charismatic, influential person who knew what he wanted in life. He was a man who could protect his loved ones, had fragile sides and if you were someone who had earned his respect, he listened to you. And without her realizing it, Sakura was experiencing a different form of love than she had known as a child, learning to love someone. At the same time, Madara was walking slowly through the garden, the exercises Sakura had imposed on him were paying off. He was now able to walk slowly by himself. However, he still couldn't run or use chakra in his muscles, but he could walk for a good hour if he took regular breaks. It was a blessing for Madara to finally be able to move on his own. He was currently standing next to a tree on the edge of a cliff, looking off into the distance, a slight smile on his lips. What's happening to me? Sakura wondered as she sat at her desk and watched her patient walk outside. For some time now, she found herself enjoying his presence more and more, enjoying feeling his intense gaze on her. This was something totally new to her. She had never known a man to look at her in this way. Sasuke had only looked at her as a useless person, Naruto had the look of a child, but Madara. He had many ways of looking at her and it disturbed her greatly. He could have that curious, interested, sometimes calculating or intrigued look. Sakura could easily say that she did not leave him indifferent. And that's why Sakura didn't know where she stood anymore. For she had never let a man know the real Sakura. No one had told her she was beautiful in such a subtle way. She found herself enjoying her rare, intimate, awkward moments with him more and more. Sakura-san. Madara's deep voice said. This return to reality brought her out of her questioning of her shaken feelings. Hi. Sakura asked confused. Are you alright? Madara asked worriedly. Yes, why? I called you twice and you didn't answer, Madara explained after walking the path from the garden to her doctor's office. Goman, I was just thinking, she admitted and received only a thin smile in response. The man was more relaxed since his thanks and Sakura understood that even Madara was a human with many faces. A face for the outside world, one that must be above reproach in order to preserve the honor of his clan. 
a cold and ruthless face to his enemies. And a relaxed and tender look to his loved ones. Would you like to come walk with me? Madara asked, looking out. He didn't want to show his discomfort, after all, this was something new for him, he'd never asked a woman to go for a walk with him before, usually he would have imposed his opinion. Gladly, Sakura replied, glad to refresh her mind. Would you mind if we went to the village? I don't mind. Just give me a moment to get my basket and buy some vegetables, she said as she headed for the kitchen. She returned with a wicker basket on her arm before moving to Madara's side and grabbing his right arm out of habit. How long before I can use chakra do you think? The dark-haired man asked as they walked towards the village. That depends Madara-san, this is the first time you're going on such a long walk, if you're not too tired, we can consider running in the next few days. Sakura-san, I'd like to ask you a delicate question. I'm listening, Sakura replied, never knowing what to expect with the dark-haired man by her side. His questions were always surprising, going from the advanced medical field to the completely mundane. Did a member of my clan. The dark-haired man began softly before stopping and looking the young woman in the eye. Is responsible for the loss of your loved ones? It didn't take any verbal response for her to realize that this was indeed the case. Madara had always been good at asking the right questions and this time he had made sure to look her in the eyes. He could read her soul and as soon as he asked the question, her gaze changed. He was sad, angry, cold and at that moment he understood that a member of his clan was responsible for this woman's pain. He felt anger in his heart without really understanding the reason. Who was it? Madara added after a few seconds of Sakura not answering. He's dead, she finally said, lowering her eyes. She was trying to sort out her head and her heart, both of which were at odds. Did you kill him? Asked the clan leader who knew from Sakura's words that she had killed Uchiha in the past. His own madness is his undoing, Sakura announced, thinking back to that famous battle, when Madara became the equivalent of the Rikid Senin before he was stabbed by Black Zetsu. His name. The dark-haired man demanded forcefully. Please Madara-san, Sakura pleaded with pain. She didn't want to answer that question at all, it still hurt too much to bring up the subject. It was hard enough to clear her mind for the past few days, so to openly bring up her past with Madara was inconceivable. I understand, the Uchiha finally relented as he saw the pain in the woman's eyes. He wanted so badly to dive into that green ocean, but he decided to resume their walk. Madara-san. Yes. Please be civil. The people of this village are very kind and are not used to seeing people of your ilk, the young woman recommended, knowing that Madara was a very proud person. She got no response from him, but knew in her heart that he wouldn't do anything, or so she hoped. The village was only twenty yards away, the screams of children playing outside could be heard. A hammer hitting the anvil was also audible and mingled with the ambient hubbub of the village. A smile came to Sakura's face as she spotted Hitomi, her closest friend from that time. She was heading in her direction when she felt Madara stop. She turned her gaze in his direction and found a serious look on his face, accompanied by a hard face. Madara-san. Sakura asked the Uchiha, worried about his attitude. Sakura. Hitomi's voice shouted. She quickly turned her head towards her friend and saw her frightened face as she pointed to the road behind them. She turned around and could see a group of men running towards the village in the distance, weapons drawn. Probably bandits, Madara informed him as he heard the sound of footsteps, but more importantly felt their presence, hence his sudden stop. Even though he was supposed to be dead and no one was looking for him, Madara was still a paranoid ninja. He was always on guard, always on the lookout for the slightest noise or suspicious behavior. Get everyone together and hide. Sakura shouted to the villagers. But Sakura, what about you? Hitomi worried for her friend. But all she got in return was a sweet smile from the pink-haired young woman. Don't worry about us my friend, Sakura reassured her before slowly walking towards the group of bandits. They would soon be in range and Madara was moving along beside her, unperturbed. No chakra in your legs Madara-san, Sakura warned just before the confrontation. Hi, replied the man who knew he had to save himself. 
but they seem to be just civilians, his reflexes alone should be enough to handle this threat. What are they doing? They're going to get killed. Panicked one of the villagers as he saw their doctor and that dark-haired man walking towards the invaders. We have to do something. Said another man with a pitchfork who was stopped short by Hitomi's voice. No. Trust. Trust them, stammered the unsure woman. There must have been about twenty of them, random people who had to loot small village after small village. The first bandits arrived at Sakura and Madara's level and the carnage began. The first one to come in contact charged Sakura with his sword pointed forward to skewer her. Thanks to her training, she took a slight step to the side, dodging the blade. She grabbed the weapon's wrist as she passed, and with a simple spinning motion, she cracked the bone at the joint. The bandit immediately dropped his weapon and screamed in pain at the abnormal angle he now had. His screams did not last, however, as he was immediately hit with two green chakra-laden fingers on his neck, rendering him unconscious. The next one that was hand to hand had targeted Madara who easily dodged the sword pointed at him. The Uchiha grabbed his attacker's weapon with ease, merely spinning around to slice the bandit's head off as he went. He didn't linger on the corpse and continued on his way to the young woman's side. Don't look, darling. Hitomi ordered, turning her son to face her so he wouldn't see so much brutality. She knew in a second what her friend had meant when she said that Uchiha-sama was a born killer. His presence, his build, his body language, everything about him was dangerous. What she saw was by no means fair, the two protagonists dodged, parried, before finally crushing every opponent that came their way. A broken arm, a severed limb, a scream of pain before finally losing consciousness or dying. This was the sad reality of the bandits charging Sakura and Madara. It's. It's unbelievable. One of the residents shuddered as he watched the two shinobi annihilate the threat. In just fifteen seconds, a dozen men had just been neutralized or simply killed without warning. They were two opposites, one neutralizing while the other killing. But both were ruthless in their strikes. Two beings, trained to kill for their country, now defending their home. Go around and capture the women. Ordered what appeared to be the leader of the bandits. We'll keep them busy. Hearing this, Sakura saw red and decided to put an end to this little game. People Sakura loved were not to be attacked. He was ten meters away from her and a simple propulsion of her chakra-laden legs allowed him to cover that distance in a second. She appeared in front of him, her gaze cold, announcing that she would show no mercy to this individual. She struck at his chest and on impact a thud was heard accompanied by the characteristic sound of breaking bones. The man's rib cage exploded into a thousand pieces, puncturing all his internal organs in the process. With such a blow to the chest, the man died instantly before being propelled down the cliff. She then turned her gaze to Madara, he was surrounded by several bandits that he dodged and parried with his sword with ease. A leg was sliced off in a graceful movement by the Uchiha, a movement that continued towards a throat, taking another life. Sakura conjured up two kunai in her hands in a puff of smoke at the sight of a bandit running towards the villagers. No mercy for rapists, no mercy for those who preyed on her people. She threw one of the two kunai. Her shot was accurate and with her legendary strength, the weapon stuck in the captor's back. A groan came from his mouth before he collapsed to the ground. In the meantime, Madara had killed all of his opponents and the last two survivors were running for their lives. There was no way they were going to leave any witnesses who could talk about what had just happened here. Sakura threw her second kunai at the nearest man who received the weapon in his skull. She prepared to run towards the last brigand, but Madara stopped her. Let. Madara repositioned the sword in his hand to throw it like a javelin. He adjusted his body, positioning his legs for the best footing. He couldn't use his left arm for balance, so he activated his Sharingan for a second to aim over a hundred meters away. His eye analyzed his running speed, the strength of the wind, and the trajectory to be given, then he launched. The gesture was fluid, graceful, controlled, the weapon covered the distance very quickly before piercing the man from side to side. Sakura didn't waste a moment and crouched down before waving her hand. Dotan, Kenok no Jutsu. Sakura uttered, before placing both hands on the ground. As soon as the chakra made contact with the ground, 
it broke apart and reformed into a large pit. This would be the place to put all the corpses. There was no need to make graves for this kind of person. Once the pit was in place, Sakura took the bodies and piled them in. Madara picked up a new sword and made his way to the few survivors. He felt no remorse or mercy in finishing off the bandits who had been neutralized by Sakura. Please, help me. Implored one bandit as he crawled towards the stunned villagers. They had just seen two people kill twenty people with such ease. Hearing this voice, Madara walked over to the man with a severed leg. No. Please. Mare. Arg. The man begged before he died, his head pierced by a blade. The gesture was clean and precise but above all ruthless. Madara lifted his gaze from the body to look at the people before him. They were afraid, and understandably so, they were afraid of being killed too. He stared at them for a few seconds with a heavy, blood-curdling stare. Then after a moment, he bent down and grabbed the corpse's leg and dragged it into the mass grave. Hitomi. Wa. Who are these people? Asked a dark-haired woman beside her. I don't know, but I trust Sakura, Hitomi replied as she watched her friend put another body in the hole. How are your legs, Madara-san? Sakura inquired with a worried face. She'd seen him fighting several opponents, tipping backwards, bending his legs. He'd put his back and legs to the test, so to speak. Withstandable, Madara replied and began to wave his one good hand in ninjutsu. Step aside. Please don't push too hard. Katan, Kakakya no jutsu. Madara wasn't the greatest fire specialist for nothing. Even with little chakra in his ninjutsu, his techniques became devastating. And nothing could survive the furnace the Uchiha summoned. The temperature produced by the flames was so hot that the villagers had to take a few steps back because the air became so hot. After about twenty seconds, only ashes remained. Dotan, Yumekamu no Jutsu, Sakura said before placing her hands on the ground again. As she did so, the chakra shifted the earth to bury the pit and return the road to the way it was before. The only evidence that there had been a battle was the blood on the ground, but a good rain shower would fix that. Sakura dusted off her hands before picking up her small wicker basket. She also readjusted her clothes, the only sign that she'd been in a fight before rejoining her patient. Is everything all right? Sakura asked once more. It wasn't that she wanted to be annoying, but as a doctor she didn't want him to get hurt for nothing. Hi, thank you, Madara replied with a small smile. He had just tested his body after three months of recovery. Sure, he hadn't pushed himself to the limit like Sakura had asked, but he was glad to see that he could already fight. Don't move, Sakura whispered before pulling a white handkerchief from one of her pockets. She brought the handkerchief to the dark-haired man's cheek and gently and tenderly wiped away a trace of blood. She made the gesture last, keeping her gaze plunged into the dark-haired man's. Why she was doing this, she had no idea, but Madara did nothing to stop her or interrupt the moment. The tender moment lasted for a few moments before Sakura realized what she was doing. A small blush appeared on her cheeks before she grabbed Madara's arm and headed towards the village. However, the gesture as well as the embarrassment on Sakura did not go unnoticed by Hitomi who had a wide smile on her lips. The two ninjas approached the villagers who suddenly all bowed to each other. When someone saved your life in the Sengoku era, you showed gratitude, but Sakura wasn't used to that. Sakura-sama, Lord Sama. Said many people. Madara was named Lord Sama because of his power, but also because of the way he stood. And without knowing a name, this diminutive was ideal. Come on, come on that's not. Sakura began to say before being interrupted by Madara. It would be an insult to them to deny them what they're doing, Sakura-san, the dark-haired man explained as he got to know the young woman. She didn't want anyone to bow down to her, she just wanted everyone to be equal. Day 91 Sakura was sitting in the main room peeling vegetables for the evening meal. These had been graciously donated by the villagers for saving them from a horrible death. Sakura wanted to refuse but Madara stopped her. As her basket filled with vegetables and other offerings, Hitomi had moved closer to her ear to whisper words that made her blush. 
He's just a patient, she teased. Sakura shook her head to get the memory out of her head. She hadn't known what to say to her friend and had pretended not to understand. She wasn't ready to face what she was feeling yet. Sure, she enjoyed Madara's company, but to love him was something she couldn't yet imagine. Still, she could see his tender gestures as well as his discreet looks. But she didn't want to accept it, she felt like she was betraying all those she had loved and who had died because of him. Night had recently fallen and the room was enveloped by soft music from the gramophone. Madara had taken a liking to it and asked, or rather demanded, to have it every night. So it was under a delicate tune of music that the dark-haired man was sitting on an armchair reading a book recommended by the young woman. Except that he could not concentrate on his reading. He was still thinking about that gesture and that look. He would have liked to activate his Sharingan to immortalize that image in his mind, but Sakura wouldn't have liked that. He set the book down on the table beside him before observing the young woman in silence. She was humming softly to the rhythm of the song. An innocent look hung on her face as her hands were busy peeling carrots. Sakura-san, called the dark-haired man. Yes. Sakura asked without turning to the man concerned. Have you ever had someone in your life? Madara asked as if you were talking about the weather. Why such a question please? Sakura asked in return. I agree that you're not a conventional woman. Madara began as Sakura turned her gaze in his direction. She was suddenly interested in the rest of his answer. But I'm surprised that no man has managed to capture your heart. As you say, I am not like other women. I don't intend to be pushed around, I don't intend to kowtow to men, and that has scared off any suitors, Sakura explained as she resumed her task. Men don't like it when a woman is more talented than them or stronger than them. They feel weak and I have no intention of pretending to be someone I'm not. I desire a man. Sakura paused to think about what she really wanted. Did she really want someone? Yes, she wished she had someone in her life, someone to love her, someone to accept her and rely on. I desire. A man who will see me as his equal. Who will love me for who I am, who will not see me as a common trophy to be displayed or as a common surrogate. I want to know love Madara-san, but I want that person to respect me as a human being, that the man I choose will raise me to his level, hand in hand. Why had Sakura said this? Why had she opened up so much to this man? Was it to make him understand that she wasn't just anyone? Or was it to tell him that if he wanted to try something with her, he should change? You haven't fully answered my question Sakura-san, Madara said in a deep voice. There was someone. I loved someone once, Sakura sighed as she thought back to Sasuke, her childhood sweetheart. She loved remembering that sweet feeling she had towards the Uchiha from her time, but it also brought back painful memories. Why didn't it work? Madara asked gently. He stabbed me in the heart with a ninjutsu technique, Sakura replied resentfully, remembering the feeling of Sasuke's arm in her chest. She placed the peeled carrots in a bowl, then the peelings in the tray. What's his name? Madara asked with a harshness in his voice that Sakura had barely heard. He wanted to hurt this person who had dared to hurt her. Uchiha Sasuke. And he's already dead, Sakura answered firmly before standing up and heading for the kitchen. Madara understood why Sakura hated the Uchiha clan so much. He remembered one of the first things she said to him, they tried to kill me, subdue me, or harm me. However, he had no recollection of an Uchiha named Sasuke, perhaps a renegade or a distant member. After a while Madara heard noises in the kitchen, a sign that Sakura was preparing the meal. He had never asked for any particular dish, as everything Sakura cooked for him was delicious. Besides, he had finally agreed to listen to this woman when it came to his health. The proof was that three months later he was able to fight again. The record had reached the end of its piece and the room was silent again. Just as he was about to get up to play the music again, Sakura beat him to it. Sakura-san. Hi. Who trained you to fight like that? Madara asked. It was something he had wanted to know for a long time. He had only seen Sakura fight for very brief moments each time, today included. But that fight yesterday afternoon had proven to him that she was trained in the ninja arts, even ninjutsu. His name was Kakashi, 
Sakura said with pain and Madara understood that this man was someone close to the young woman. I miss him very much, it was partly because of him that I became the woman I am. He saw and believed in me. He must have been a powerful person to train a woman of your caliber. Hi, he was a great shinobi, Sakura agreed, putting the record back in its sleeve. But he was like any other man. What do you mean? Madara asked curiously. He was weak in one area. Madara hated being called weak, even indirectly, and Sakura had just called him weak. And how was he weak, please? Madara asked with a slightly harsher tone. To the fairer sex. I'm not weak. The Uchiha asserted firmly. Sakura said nothing more and let the music fill the house again. After a few seconds of music, she put her hands in the sign of the ram to throw a henjin at her. Sakura had always been a beautiful woman without trying very hard, except that right now Sakura was intent on proving her point. Her traditional outfit was replaced by a white halter dress that stopped just short of her bottom. She wore no trousers at all and showed black stockings that reached her thighs and ended in lace. The same thing accompanied her arms until they covered her biceps. With her back to the Uchiha, he had a direct view of the young woman's form, which was accentuated by the heels. She turned sensually and approached the Uchiha with a provocative smile. She was wearing light makeup and Madara thought she was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his life. She was so beautiful, she gave off so much that he was speechless and didn't know what to do. He didn't react when she was in front of him and climbed on top of him. She placed her buttocks right on his privates, as if she was trying to tease him. She leaned forward to get closer to his ear. One of Sakura's hands rested gently on the dark-haired man's chest while the other tenderly caressed his cheek. Tell me Madara-sama. Do you find me to your liking? Sakura whispered in a sultry and tempting voice. Do you think you could help me? Hi. Madara couldn't help but answer with difficulty. He couldn't think straight and only wanted one thing, this woman. In the past he had had the desire for the flesh, but had always managed to keep it under control. But this time he was totally subjugated, it was brutal what he felt inside. He wanted nothing more than to put his lips on hers, to feel her slender body against his, to squeeze her and simply make her his. Sakura's hand caressed the Uchiha's cheek and moved down to his neck. You see Madara-sama. This is how weak men are. They don't know how to resist the beautiful sex, Sakura whispered sensually in the dark-haired man's ear. All I would have to do is summon a kunai in my hand and I could easily slit your throat, she said sharply. Then Sakura moved very slowly away from the dark-haired man, placing a chaste kiss on his cheek. She stood up from her position and walked towards the kitchen, not without moving her hips. When she felt she had played with the man enough, she made her henjin disappear, resuming her previous attire and leaving Madara completely stunned. This woman will drive me crazy. Chapter 12 Day 93 It had been three days since Madara had been forbidden to walk by Sakura's order to rest. And it was justified since he had felt some pain in his body after fighting, but nothing that was insurmountable. But hey, Sakura was demanding that he rest as much as possible, much to Madara's chagrin as he had regained a taste for using his legs. So once again he was forced to undergo a medical routine. Not that the proximity of the young woman bothered him, quite the contrary. He really liked to feel Sakura close to him, he still remembered her perfume when she had teased him. Just the thought of it made him lose his nerve. No pain Madara-san. No, I'm not in pain anymore. Stand up straight, Sakura ordered as she stepped back. He complied with ease even though he had to do it slowly. When he'd been fighting he'd put his body under pressure to move quickly and that's what was hurting him. Still nothing. No, I feel fine. Well. Sit back down, Sakura said before crouching down. She helped Madara put on his sandals, as bending down was still a difficult movement for him. We'll go warm this up before we start rehab again. A wide smile appeared on Sakura's lips as she took Madara's hand to help him up, then headed outside. What are we going to do Sakura-san? Three days ago, when we fought, you proved that your body was recovering properly. However, the fight delayed my schedule slightly, because you had to make some quick and sudden moves. 
But that's settled, so we can start running, slowly, but we'll run. Madara was really pleased to hear this news. He felt really lucky to have this person by his side. He really didn't know what he would have become without her. Probably dead, buried six feet under or eaten by scavengers. So, I know that as shinobi we can put our bodies under a lot of stress, but since your body is still fragile, we're going to have to do some stretching, Sakura announced as she faced her patient. Do as I do and don't go to the point of pain. Madara imitated the girl in front of him, making gestures he had never known existed. What good will that do? Madara asked, stretching one of his legs. Chakra protects our bodies when we run, fight, jump, or do any other physical activity necessary for a shinobi. But before using your chakra, we need your muscles and your joints to strengthen. And if they're not prepared by the warm-up, you could hurt yourself more than anything else. I understand, said Madara. Still no pain. Sakura asked after ten minutes of various stretches. No, I'm not. Well, let's go. Father would turn in his grave if he saw me like this, Madara sighed to himself. If his father were still alive, Madara would probably have been punched in the face for daring to obey a woman. And Uchiha didn't obey anyone, least of all a clan leader and especially not a woman. But Madara was not his father, and he knew the strength of an individual when he saw it. And this woman was brimming with strength, and maybe that's why he listened to her. As Madara began to run slowly behind the young woman, he remembered something his mother had once said to him, I hope that one day you will find a woman who can fill your heart, my son. That day, Madara was only fifteen years old. He had been trained to kill and did not understand his mother's words. After all, he had had little contact with his mother, for as a future clan leader, he had to be as untroubled as possible by female ideologies that might interfere with his vision. Except that after three months of being around a woman like Sakura, Madara was slowly beginning to understand the words of his late mother. His mother had married his father out of political obligation in order to strengthen the bonds of the Uchiha clan, but luckily for her, she was in love with the man before she had to marry him. This was very rare in the Sengoku era and she seemed to want her children to experience this feeling as well. After all, a mother only wanted the best for her children. But was what Madara was feeling deep inside him love? Would this woman be the one to make him happy? After all, Madara wouldn't even know love if it was laid down before him. Oya Sakura san. Lord Sama. Hitomi shouted in the distance as she harvested rice in a rice field alongside two other women who were also waving. Ohai. Sakura shouted back in the direction of her friend. Madara didn't bother with a verbal greeting. He nodded ever so slightly in Hitomi's direction and continued running behind Sakura. Time passed, deep in thought, answering Sakura's questions still worried about his health. He could feel the warmth invading his body, sweat was beginning to appear on it and he was enjoying the feeling of physical exertion in his entire being. He had missed it so much that a small smile appeared on his lips. However, after a moment, his hair bothered him a little. Sakura-san Hearing the dark-haired man call her name made her stop dead in her tracks. She immediately thought that he had reached his limit. Yes. The girl inquired as she approached Madara. Madara held his hand out toward Sakura's head without taking his eyes off her. She could feel the dark-haired man's hand land in her hair and undo the red headband that held her pink hair back. It fell back slightly in front of her face, making her look even wilder to the dark-haired man. Could you tie my hair back, please? It gets in the way of my running, Madara asked in a deep voice. So with a small blush Sakura grabbed her red headband from Madara's hand. She proceeded to pull Madara's hair up into a high ponytail. He was two heads taller than her and she had to stand on her toes to reach his hair. She had her face close to his as she performed her task and Madara took the opportunity to smell her once more. He closed his eyes to enjoy the sensation that washed over him. Of course, this small gesture didn't go unnoticed by Sakura, and her blush increased. Even more so when she saw what Madara looked like with his face completely clear. Thank you, Madara whispered. Day 101 Madara was silently watching the young woman who was turning the main room upside down. She had moved some furniture and was setting up a large easel in the center of the room. 
she placed two chairs near the piece of furniture before placing a large sheet of paper on top. At first Madara thought Sakura wanted to paint, but when he saw what was on the large sheet he knew what they were going to do. It was a huge sketch of an arm with its detailed chakra network. Many notes were transposed here and there. Is this what I think it is Sakura-san? Madara inquired as she came closer. Hi, I've made enough progress in my technique that I'll be able to start reconstructing your tenketsu, Sakura confirmed before bringing an extra piece of furniture next to her chair. On it she placed a finjutsu kit, a container of water, and a folded towel. I assume this is going to be painful. I'm afraid so, but it will be different from the pain on your back. It'll be the same as a tattoo, only more painful. At least I hope so, Sakura confirmed as she laid out her equipment. She moved closer to Madara and placed her hands on the sides of his stomach. She ran her hands under his tunic and gently moved upwards to remove his robe. Except that for Madara it was once again perceived as a caress that tortured him. Especially when the woman in front of him was looking deep into his eyes. Once his robe was off, Madara had only one thought, and that was to satisfy his urges. It had been over three months since he had touched a woman and the one in front of him was driving him completely crazy. Sit down, Sakura ordered, unaware of the effect it was having on the brunette. She sat down at Madara's side before grabbing his left arm still in stasis from the network of finjutsu she had applied in the past. She took one last look at her notes before putting chakra on her fingertips and applying it to her patient's deltoid. It was painful, very painful, as painful as the pain in his back except that it was concentrated in one spot and not all over his body. She didn't have Naruto Uzumaki's skill to regenerate what was destroyed, so she had to do this more slowly and that included touching the nerves to recreate the main tenketsu. Blood flow was her guide and the many burn marks she felt on the inside of his arm were the indication she needed. She took two cells and separated them from the others before applying an accelerated mitosis effect. She stayed this way for nearly two minutes, discharging her own chakra and tapping into the physical energy of Madara's cells. There, Sakura finally said after a moment, causing Madara to release a sigh of relief. He'd been tensing up throughout the whole process. The first Tenketsu is intact. She had succeeded, she had achieved what no one before her had managed, regeneration. Will it take long? Unfortunately yes. How many Tenketsu is an arm made of? Madara asked, slowly catching his breath. If he had to endure this pain with every Tenketsu, it was going to be very difficult. Over a hundred. I'm going back. Sakura said as she injected her chakra into Madara's arm once more and he tensed once more. Why does it hurt so much? Madara asked, he wasn't a fragile person, but the pain he felt was very intense. Sakura didn't answer right away, she was too focused on her task. But once the second tenketsu was back in place she allowed herself an answer. Because I'm getting on your nerves. That's why it's so painful when a haiga closes your tenketsu with their soft fist technique. Sakura grabbed a sponge and soaked it in water before wringing it out, then wiped some symbols off Madara's arm. She didn't want her seals to conflict with his new tenketsu. How do you know about the haiga clan's soft fist? Madara asked in surprise. After all, they were as secretive as the Uchiha clan. I've met one in the past. Get ready. Hamurf, Madara grunted as she felt that sharp pain again. It was as if his arm was being heated to white hot in one spot and the temperature was being raised higher and higher. Release. How did you survive a Haiga? Madara asked, knowing the strength of that clan. From what the brown-haired man had seen, Sakura seemed to be a specialist in Taijutsu and Finjutsu along with some ninjutsu techniques. And hardly anyone went near a Hyuga unless they wanted to die. That was a long time ago, and if it weren't for my sensei, I would have been in serious trouble, Sakura lied, unable to say that she had grown up with a Hyuga princess as a friend. But I know what it's like to take one of their attacks. Sakura realized that she was slowly giving away a little too much information about her past. Was it because she was beginning to trust this man? Did she ever want to confide in him about who she really was? For Sakura was well aware that sooner or later she would say something too incriminating, and knowing Madara, he would become very suspicious. Or worse, he would understand. 
and confronting this man who had caught you in the act of manipulating him was something very risky. Madara-san. Yes Sakura-san. The shinobi asked after seeing Sakura stop her work and lower her eyes. Why are you asking me all these questions? I know where shinobi and information is vital. But why do you want to know so much about me? Sakura questioned, eager to get to the bottom of the great Madara's thoughts. Let's just say. You're piquing my curiosity. In what way? Sakura insisted as she saw Madara deep in thought. He seemed to be searching for words. Do you know how frustrating it can be to have a lifetime of teachings thrown away because you meet the exception to the rule? I am in this situation Sakura-san. You are a woman. You should be a weak person, not even able to hold a weapon and only asked to look good and keep your mouth shut. But instead, this same person who should be useless saved me from the clutches of death, healed me, and made sure I had the use of my body again. This same woman is able to break through a cliff and fight like a shinobi. So I'm certainly not sorry for being curious about someone like you. But there was also something else about Madara that made him so drawn to knowing this woman. One of his mother's few phrases was, pretty flowers are often covered in thorns. And this was the first flower he'd met that had thorns. Dangerous thorns. After such a speech, Madara looked away to hide his present embarrassment, preventing him from seeing the blush on Sakura's face in the process. Have you never had someone in your life Madara-san? Sakura asked as she prepared the next tenketsu. She followed the ones near the arteries first before thinking about doing the ones around them. How mert, the patient groaned slightly as he felt his tenketsu reform under the young woman's skill. I've already had many conquests if that's what you're asking. I'm not talking about whores or courtesans. I don't believe in that. Thing you women used to call love. Why not? It's one of the most beautiful things life has to offer, Sakura retorted with incomprehension. Because it makes you weak. A man has to be strong. A clan leader must be above reproach and crush his enemies. The survival of the clan depends on it, my family depends on it, if I am weak my enemies will take advantage of it. That's what that bastard Hashirama did. Because I was weak, my entire clan is now in the Senju's pay. Madara snarled at the pain he had been feeling for almost fifteen minutes. So no, I don't want any love that could be exploited against me. After this outburst Madara pulled away from Sakura before standing up. He headed outside to calm himself down. This was a sensitive subject for him, remembering all that he had failed out of weakness. All because he had allowed the Senju clan to reach a truce. He leaned against the doorway and looked out over the valley. He had never been so filled with doubt. Since his defeat by Hashirama Senju, his life had been completely changed, his outlook on life altered, his understanding of people altered, and all of this frightened him. He was afraid of making a mistake, of making a mistake and of doing more harm to his clan. He felt like crying for one of the few times in his life. To cry with rage, with hatred, because of his own weakness. Madara was so deep in thought that he didn't hear the young woman approach, and he only noticed her presence when her hand touched his. She stood in front of him, her face full of emotion. Madara-san. You're not weak, Sakura whispered as she stroked the brunette's hand with her thumb. My sensei once told me a phrase I'll never forget, Sakura said, seeing Madara still in distress. A ninja who abandons his mission is no better than trash but those who abandon their companions are even worse than trash. Sakura let a few seconds pass so that her words could be heard by Madara before continuing. You failed Madara-san, but you never abandoned your family, your clan, and you fought for them, for their integrity, for their freedom. Sakura-san. Please let me finish, Sakura said before placing her second hand on Madara's face to force him to look her in the eye. What you did for your clan is a proof of love. You fought out of love for your family and that is what gave you the strength to fight. To me, that makes you strong and not weak. Because on that day in the valley of the end, you were fighting for others and not for your own interests. Madara brought his good hand to the young woman's hand on his cheek. He loved the warm touch on his skin, he felt like he was understood for the first time in his life. He felt like an open book to this woman and he didn't know how to react to this situation. 
So, I hope with all my heart that one day you will find the one who will give you the strength to continue on this path. For it was love for your family that made you the man you are Madara-san, and don't be ashamed of the man you are, Sakura finished, not believing her own words. His mother's voice kept repeating in his head as he looked at Sakura in front of him, when you meet her, you'll understand my son. Thank you Sakura-san. Keeping Sakura's hand in his he returned to their previous place. And after the young woman had settled back down at Madara's side, she resumed her IRY ninjutsu work. The next hour passed in silence, if not accompanied by a few groans of pain from Madara. And after an hour, Madara's breathing was beginning to become ragged, his body trembling slightly from feeling so much pain. He felt like he was being tortured and only the thought of knowing that it was to heal allowed him to endure it. That will do for today, the Tenketsu network on the main artery is back in place. Go lie down Madara-san, I'll get you something to ease the pain. Madara walked over to his bed and lay down with great pleasure. He was exhausted and wanted only one thing at that moment, to sink into unconsciousness. A short time later Sakura returned with a glass of water and a small bag of medicinal herb. She emptied the herb packet into Madara's mouth and handed him the glass of water to quench his thirst. Sleep now, Sakura said before placing her fingers on his temple to put him to sleep with her chakra. What the hell is happening to me? Sakura wondered as she became confused. She felt the need to help him, but she didn't know why. Was it because he trusted her in some way? Or was it because for the first time in his life Madara was confiding in someone? Or was it because he was a very honorable man? Sakura didn't understand this feeling, or she didn't want to understand it for fear of finding out what was behind it. She may have denied herself that, but she wasn't stupid. She could see that she liked being in his presence, hearing him say that she was a beautiful woman, seeing him look at her discreetly. It was very strange, but she liked it. Sakura didn't have time to wonder any longer as she heard her friend's voice outside. Sakura-san. Hitomi shouted as she approached the house. Sakura covered Madara with the waist-length sheet before finally stepping outside to greet her friend. She was wearing a blue-gray dress that was three-quarters worn and faded, along with an off-white top that contrasted with her long black hair. Ohai Hitomi-san, Sakura exclaimed with a big smile at the sight of her friend. Ohai. Hitomi replied before coming over to Sakura and hugging her. It felt good to Sakura to have someone who acted like that with her. She had lost everything and having reconnected with someone kept her from going crazy. She would love to confide in someone, but Hitomi couldn't understand the importance of her secret. What brings you here? Sakura asked as she broke away from the brunette. Just the pleasure of seeing you, Hitomi replied with a mischievous smile. I don't like that smile Hitomi-san. We haven't been able to talk since that famous day in the village when you and the Hitomi began to say before whispering, putting her hand in front of her mouth to cover her voice. And the beautiful Uchiha-sama, if you know what I mean. Sakura couldn't help a slight blush from appearing on her cheeks at this comment. I have no idea what you're talking about, Sakura feigned before opening the kitchen door and stepping inside, inviting her friend to follow her at the same time. Is Uchiha-sama here? He's sleeping now, Sakura replied before taking a tea set and setting it on the table. As usual Hitomi-san. Hai came regularly to visit her friend to talk and especially to make sure she didn't feel too lonely. She watched as always as the young woman prepared the tea and used her magic. She filled the teapot with water before placing her fingers on a symbol which lit up on contact. Then, after a few seconds, steam escaped from the pot. How's the village? Sakura asked as she poured the brewed water into two cups. The village is doing well, people are talking a lot about you and what you accomplished last time. Sugar Hitomi-san. A small smile appeared on Sakura's face. She had introduced Hitomi to sugar, which was a luxury ingredient that few could afford. She didn't even wait for her to answer before pouring a spoonful of sugar into her cup and handing it to her. You know you don't have to. It's nothing to me and you know it, Sakura added before blowing on her own cup. I'm sorry Hitomi-san, I hope we didn't scare anyone in the village. We were all scared. What you two did was a miracle, it's something you only see in stories and legends, and yet. Hitomi admitted, 
thinking back to the other day. Anyone would have been afraid, but you protected us and never hurt us. And you know that I would never hurt you Hitomi-san. Hi, in any case my son swears by Uchiha-sama. Is that so? It seems commonplace to you what you did, but to the children, they saw vigilantes, Hitomi recounted, having to spend the evening calming her son. The latter had been telling the story over and over again. Anyway, a big caravan passed by today. They were heading for the capital and came from High no Kuni. Really? How big? At least, easily twenty carts. Sakura understood that the daimi had set off and that the first caravans had returned. He must have listened to Madara's advice and started harvesting and buying resources in the other countries. The daimi would have to be visited soon, and Sakura would take it upon herself to inform Madara as soon as he woke up. If not, to get back to something crunchy, Hitomi began with a knowing smile. What's going on between you and Mr. Handsome? Absolutely nothing, the young woman replied a little too quickly, sipping her tea. Except that I'm a woman, Sakura. Unlike men who can't see beyond the end of their noses, I can see the signs when I see them. And I saw the look on your face Sakura. Don't forget that I was younger too, Hitomi said, thinking back to her youth. Sure, she was still a beautiful woman for someone over forty, but she couldn't compete with Sakura. I confess I don't know myself, Sakura looked down, she herself did not know what she wanted. What does he mean to you Sakura? Hitomi asked, removing the san suffix because of the more serious conversation. I don't know, actually it does, it helps me forget but at the same time reminds me of the pain of the past. Do you know him from before? It's complicated, Hitomi. When you say things like that to me, I feel like I'm hearing one of those stories that Grandma Mia used to tell me about a forbidden love between two people because they were so opposed to each other. Hitomi said before drinking her tea and enjoying the sweet taste. I don't like him, Sakura said forcefully before finally looking down again and repeating the sentence. Perhaps to convince herself. I don't like him. Saku. Hitomi-san please, Sakura pleaded, not wanting to face this right now. I'm not ready for this. I beg your pardon Sakura, Hitomi apologized, seeing that she may have crossed the line. She may have been her friend, but she knew almost nothing about this woman, let alone her past life. For a woman to be so strong and capable, she had probably suffered in her previous life. I'll leave you Sakura, the day you're ready to talk about it, tell me, I only want to see you happy Sakura. Arigato Hitomi Hitomi walked towards the exit after finishing her cup of tea, she put on her shoes and turned around one last time before leaving. Take care of yourself Sakura and know that you too have the right to happiness. Chapter 13 Day 110 When Hashiba gave the order to send caravans through the different countries, Suzuki stayed for a while with Ramaji and the son of the daimi to organize these expeditions. They all agreed on one thing, it would not be easy. The Diami's son had explained at length that the economy of their country, as of all the countries in the world, was based on trade, exchange and barter. And that without an economy, it was impossible to envisage the development of finance. Yet the development of real trade was still in its infancy. Provincial wars were still too present in people's minds and prevented a real opening of trade routes and even of areas dedicated to this activity. Transactions were still too often carried out between acquaintances because mistrust greatly slowed down trade. This is obviously what had been raised at the meeting, how to avoid drawing attention to Ta no Kuni while conducting such a large-scale operation. It was therefore necessary to be cunning in order to justify such requests to the countries and villages they would be joining to acquire these resources. Not only did they have to avoid raising suspicions that the country was aware of a future war and that they were taking advantage of it to secure their backs. But they also had to be careful not to draw attention to themselves in relation to the sum spent on their purchases. There's nothing like a country that spends money to get people talking. This is both a good thing and a hindrance to their goals in the long run. And for the moment, Tano Kuni did not want to be seen as a country with flourishing finances and a good life. The Diamese advisors understood that the request of their lord and the client who financed them was not made lightly. They had to be ready to become, sooner or later, the world's most important crossroads. If they expected to become the most powerful country in the near future, 
they had to control the trade because in doing so, they would rule the whole world. And to do this, they had to gather as many goods and resources as possible, and above all, do everything to weaken their potential adversaries without them realizing it. This is why dozens of caravans were quickly sent across the vast world, as some would only take several months to return to Ta no Kuni. Suzuki suggested finding many, many excuses to cover up their true purpose, to bleed countries. This ranged from the organization of a huge wedding for a very influential nobleman to the consequent needs of a rich merchant who was anticipating the harshness of the coming winter. Everything was a pretext to avoid being caught and, above all, to cover their tracks. Then came the problem of how to hide the volume occupied by all his new acquisitions. But thanks to Rumaji's knowledge, they found someone competent enough in Finjutsu to make sealing scrolls. Thus, once an agreement was signed, the resources were loaded onto the carts before a person assigned for this purpose, sealed all the goods away from prying eyes. However, Suzuki anticipated that despite all the precautions they were taking, there was still a risk that they would be discovered, especially if the caravans were checked and had no goods with them. So they had to find a way to hide the real purpose of these convoys, as well as their origin. So each escort carried secondary materials, such as clothes, charms, tapestries and other items suitable for nobles. But hidden in the bottom of each cart were all the sealing scrolls. So it was by sorting out all these little details that the plan was able to get underway and it was two months since the first caravans had left. But among them, three caravans stood out from the others, they were the most important and their objective was to go to the most risky places. Suzuki, the Diamis right-hand man, was leading one of them in the direction of Kanoha no Sato. Despite the strong warnings of the council that this was unwise, the man decided to take the risk. Indeed, Suzuki knew that if the beginnings of war were on their doorstep, it would not be long before the borders closed and with it the exchanges. It was therefore necessary to weaken Kanoha in one way or another and quickly. He decided to lead a caravan of thirty wagons with his fifty soldiers. Suzuki was no stranger to the borders, he could even boast of being in the good books of the authorities of the border country. He took advantage of this notoriety to carry out this very risky plan by taking only a very small quantity of rice. It was not even a quarter of what the agreement between Ta no Kuni and Hai no Kuni had defined for neutrality. But the right phrases, along with explanations, made Kanoha accept this small contribution. Since Kanoha accepted Suzuki's request without any objection, it was like validating the implicit request of the Daimi of Ta no Kuni. Thanks to this, the Lord's right hand man made a master stroke. For several days they were able to buy various resources in the capital of the Land of Fire without arousing the slightest suspicion. Once this was accomplished, it was time for Suzuki and his men to return to the rice country. Indeed, they did not want to and should not linger in the Land of Fire. As long as they did not reach their land, they would always run the risk of being unmasked and above all arrested. And it was now more than two weeks since the Suzuki caravan had been heading towards the capital of the land of rice fields. The fact that they had reached the borders was a relief for the soldiers. Since they had returned to the land of their home, the tension in their hearts gradually eased as they felt they had succeeded in their mission. Still, Suzuki had a feeling that he was being watched since leaving Kanoha no Sato. In a way, it was understandable, after having spent so much money, the country wanted to verify the man's claims. And it was a good thing that the Diomis right-hand man was suspicious, because after three days of traveling through the rice paddy country, something unusual happened to the caravan. There, in the middle of the road, two people were waiting without moving. Halt! Suzuki shouted, forcing all the drivers to stop their horses. Are you all right, my lord? Asked a soldier in charge of watching and protecting the convoy. Everyone stay on guard, Suzuki ordered, before riding his black horse towards the two protagonists who were still waiting in the middle of the road. One was dressed in a kimono in dark and light brown, two swords attached to his belt and his face partly hidden by a straw hat. However, the hat could not hide his long black hair behind him. From his posture, Suzuki knew in an instant that it was a skilled fighter who stood before him. But what surprised the old soldier the most was the person beside the swordsman, a woman. But not just any woman. She was dressed like a boy, with clothes that allowed for ease of movement, but she carried only one sword. 
Moreover, her confidence showed that she seemed to be quite capable of fighting. This was something extremely rare, and Suzuki wondered if this was a master and his apprentice. One last thing caught his eye, it was the color of her hair, pink. Suzuki stopped his mount a few meters from the two fighters before dismounting. He walked the last few yards, sword in hand, ready to fight if necessary. He positioned his body very slightly so that he could see the two people in front of his only valid eye. At first glance, the two strangers did not seem threatening, but life had taught Suzuki to always be wary. What do you want strangers? Suzuki demanded in an authoritative voice. With time and experience, he knew the necessity of showing his rank by his presence and his stature. Most people would bow their heads or move away from him just because he was wearing armor. But when you're dealing with other fighters, rank and what you look like can save your life. My apprentice and I would like to join your caravan, said the dark-haired man, bowing his head very slightly. Why is that? Suzuki demanded, still worried. We're heading for the capital of Ta no Kuni and the road isn't the safest, the fighter answered without looking up. Suzuki stared at the man who was talking but still kept a watchful eye on the young woman who still hadn't moved. It was unsettling to see a woman looking you straight in the eye as she did. Wasn't she afraid of receiving a beating for such an affront? What brings you to these parts? Suzuki continued to ask as he heard his men in the distance positioning themselves in case of attack or ambush. It was a common strategy to put one man at the front of the road to act as a diversion while the rest of the brigands attacked from behind. Business, the man replied vaguely and calmly. Elaborate, Suzuki demanded. We have to talk to the daimi, the dark-haired man explained, and straightened his head slightly to expose his face. Pretend you didn't recognize me. Seeing that face Suzuki couldn't help but widen his eyes as he realized who was in front of him. There was no mistaking it, it was an order he had just received. The man in front of him had lost all neutrality or politeness and a stern voice took its place when he gave this injunction. No doubt about it, there in front of him was the very famous Uchiha Madara, presumed dead for three months. Hi, Suzuki said automatically before turning to the caravan, resume your posts. Let's go. After shouting his orders, the Diomese right-hand man turned back to the two protagonists. He was waiting for any instructions that the dark-haired man might have to give. Do you have a cart available for my apprentice and myself? Madara asked as he lowered his head, hiding his face. Few people would have been able to put a name to his face, but anyone with a high enough education would have recognized him. Yes, come with me, Suzuki replied before mounting his horse again. He walked nonchalantly towards the approaching caravan. All eyes were on the newcomers, after all, it wasn't often you saw people on the road in the middle of nowhere. The workers pointed at the young woman, seeing that she seemed to be a warrior. These two travelers will ride beside you, Suzuki ordered a rather elderly man holding the reins of a wagon. As you wish, my lord, the old man replied immediately, shifting to make room for the two newcomers. Madara climbed in first, leaning against the back of the wagon while pulling his straw hat over his face. He gave the impression that he was taking a nap for the rest of the trip. Sakura sat down beside the old man with a smile. Once the two new travelers were settled, Suzuki took over the caravan. Prepare me a pigeon, Suzuki demanded of one of his soldiers, who hurriedly took out a piece of parchment and a feather. The lord seized it and wrote hastily. Daimi. Five days, peace now with me. Suzuki. After writing this brief message, Suzuki wrapped the parchment around the pigeon's leg and threw it into the air. The message was short, but the essential information was there, the sender, the date and, above all, the additional package. If this message was intercepted, it would look like a coded message. You. Suzuki said, pointing to one of the soldiers who immediately stood at attention. Pass the word, don't disturb the newcomers. The soldier complied while Suzuki took over the leadership of the convoy, which was now carrying a new and priceless package. The hours passed quietly for Madara and Sakura. The wagon driver had the decency not to ask any questions and the journey continued in a restful silence. A few stops were made here and there, because of a damaged wheel that needed to be replaced, or a hole in the road that had to be filled in order to move the convoy along. 
Moreover, the road in the interior of the rice country was far from easy. Some of the roads in the hills could be winding and dangerous. And because of one of these inconveniences, the caravan stopped once again. Halt! Suzuki shouted. The main road to the capital was blocked by huge rocks. If you looked up, you could see a piece of the hill missing. Probably a landslide, my lord, analyzed one of the men beside him, should we turn around and take the road to the east? No, we don't have that luxury, we'll clear the road, Suzuki replied to his subordinate. Everybody get your tools. The soldier shouted to the entire convoy. On hearing the order, chocks were put under the wheels of the wagons to stop them. People grabbed tools and started to move towards the rock slide. Should we intervene? Sakura asked softly to Madara after the old man at their side also went forward. I think you should go help them, Madara suggested without removing his hat from his face. Are you sure? Yes, the people of Tano Kuni must be getting to know us, Madara replied quietly, they're not ready for me to come back though. I'll be waiting for you here. With that, Sakura jumped out of the wagon and headed towards the front of the caravan. Suzuki, who was already discussing with several men which rock to remove first, thus avoiding aggravating the landslide. Some men had untied horses and seemed to be harnessing them to huge ropes. Suzuki-sama. Sakura announced once she reached his level. Yes. I didn't catch your name, young lady, Suzuki replied, speaking as if to any woman. My name is Sakura and I've come to help you, she replied, bowing her head slightly. Two of the men close to Suzuki laughed at such absurdity. As if a woman would be useful in such a situation. However, they stopped laughing when they saw Suzuki's dark look. How could you be useful to me? The Diamese right-hand man asked anyway, for if this woman was with Madara Uchiha, she must have had some practical ability. Pull all your men off the site and tell me which rock to remove first, Sakura answered immediately with seriousness. Suzuki frowned and anger could be seen on his face. If this is a joke, it's in very bad taste, young lady, the man snarled, not liking being wasted. As far as he was concerned, she was lucky to be going with Madara because otherwise he would have already slapped her in the face. Either you tell me what to do or I'll do it without your help, Sakura replied before walking past Suzuki towards the rock slide. She pulled a pair of black gloves from her pockets and slipped them on. She might be a shinobi, but she had to keep her hands safe as a doctor. Before anyone had even begun to approach the stone Sakura placed her hands on the first rock. Except that it was almost four meters high and must have weighed several tons. The kind of rock you could only move with horses and a log system. At this point everyone was dumbfounded, Sakura was doing the unthinkable. With her enhanced chakra and teachings she lifted the huge piece of rock and threw it down. She hadn't dropped it. She had literally thrown it and it landed further down with a huge crash that echoed throughout the valley for a few seconds. Sakura wasted no time in tackling the second problem blocking the road. Because of the landslide another large rock had collapsed onto the road, but it was still embedded in the hillside. So Sakura gathered chakra at the base of her wrist, then in her hand and finally concentrated it in her knuckles before striking the rock. A cracking sound of splitting rock was heard. Barely a second passed before the huge rock exploded into hundreds of smaller rocks. Clearing three quarters of the main road. Everyone was in awe of what they had just seen. A woman. A simple woman had just pulverized a piece of mountain with her bare hands and had lifted another piece as if it were a twig. She was now picking up smaller rocks and throwing them into the void without caring who was watching. What are you waiting for? Go help her. Suzuki ordered after regaining his senses. He had just realized that he might have made an error in judgment by talking to her in that way. If this person could do this kind of thing, what would it be like on a battlefield? Nevertheless, this woman had just saved them at least a day's work. As for the workers, opinions were divided, some were completely afraid of this woman and used the word witchcraft in relation to her. Others, on the contrary, were totally in awe of her achievement. Whatever the opinion of the people present, Sakura left no one indifferent and her name was on everyone's lips for the rest of the day. However, she was left alone because of the order given by Suzuki earlier in the day. 
The rest of the journey was uneventful and by nightfall the caravan had reached the valley floor. We're setting up here. Shouted Suzuki as he dismounted his horse. And from that moment on an unusual spectacle began. The carts were positioned in a wide circle, the mounts unhitched before being driven close to the river a few meters away. Expandable compartments in each wagon were put in place to fill the gaps between each vehicle. Space where horses were normally provided. Gradually, a fortified place was built for the night. Some would say it was perhaps a lot, but there were wild animals, bandits, and nothing to say that a nuknean wasn't walking around. Once the carts and their extension were placed, the occupants of the caravan set about various tasks to prepare for the night. One group went off to chop wood to feed some fires in the center of the facility. Others were busy fetching water and preparing the evening meal to feed everyone. Some were busy relaxing and tending the horses after a long day. Go around for a hundred yards and come back, Suzuki ordered two soldiers, then turned to other men of his. You, I want you, up there, you go up the river three hundred meters and see that we are not followed. Suzuki knew what he was doing and his men had blind faith in his abilities. After all, how many caravans did this kind of installation at night to protect themselves? Finally, after an hour everything was set up. Soldiers could be seen on top of the carts patrolling while the rest were happily eating. Madara sat cross-legged by a small fire with his head bowed. Sakura was beside him crouching in front of the fire, a bowl in one hand and a ladle in the other. A small broth of vegetables and meats was cooking in a small pot prepared by Sakura. Why do we have to travel like this? Sakura asked softly as she filled a bowl with food. Because by doing so, we allowed that man to warn his daimi, Madara replied, grabbing the bowl of food Sakura was holding out to him. It smelled really good, especially since it was the first time in months that he'd eaten anything other than fish. Wouldn't a scroll have been enough? Sakura asked as she helped herself to a steaming bowl of food. Yes, but it would have taken me out of this trip, Madara explained, using his left arm to support his bowl and eating with his right. There was no way he was going to get fed in front of other people. But otherwise, by a happy coincidence we ran into Suzuki, the Daimi's right-hand man, he added after a mouthful of food. Is he someone important? Sakura asked before putting a piece of meat in her mouth. She'd read up on the Sengoku era, but she didn't know all the military ins and outs like Madara. He may not be a shinobi Sakura-san, but as you've seen, he's a strategist worth his weight in gold, the dark-haired man replied as he looked away at the man. The latter was eating and going around the camp. He was asking everyone if everything was going well, he was a person who was close to the people under his responsibility. And Sakura had to admit that the organization for the night was impressive. Besides, showing your abilities today proved that I wasn't kidding about the services we offer in Tano Kuni. From the sound of it, the shinobi arts don't seem to be very common, Sakura remarked more to herself than to Madara. Let's just say that those who could attest to it are no longer of this world, Madara explained as he took a sip of his broth. After a few sips he let out a small sigh of contentment. We shinobi are quite secretive and live only among ourselves. Hence the tales and legends about magical powers, the young woman added. Right, Madara confirmed before extending his arm toward Sakura. Could I have a second helping please? Sakura grabbed the outstretched bowl before going to refill it. By this time, Suzuki had finished making his rounds and was finally in front of them. Is everything going well for you? Suzuki asked. Hi, we thank you, Madara replied, grabbing his second bowl. Sakura-san, I wanted to thank you personally on behalf of the entire convoy for what you did today, Suzuki said with a very slight nod. He hadn't apologized for his manners, but he had come to thank her and above all there was now a little respect for her. Please, Suzuki-sama, she replied, still sitting next to Madara. You look worried. Madara remarked after observing the man for the last few minutes. The man raised his head and looked around a little, as if searching for someone. Let's just say I'd feel better than I did in the capital, Suzuki finally replied. They're not following you anymore. I beg your pardon. The man in armor asked. The leaf shinobi, Madara repeated as he continued to eat, they stopped following you last night. 
The leader of the caravan could not contain a sigh of relief at this news. He felt the pressure leave his limbs and a sense of security slowly began to take hold. Good news. Where have you been to catch the leaf's eye? Madara questioned, though he had a slight idea of what the man's answer would be. Kanoha. Risky, the dark-haired Madara replied, setting his empty food bowl on the ground. I agree, I'll explain all the ins and outs of this destination in a more appropriate place, Suzuki added before turning back with a slightly calmer heart. A pleasant night to you both. Likewise. Day 113. Bring the shipments to the warehouse. Suzuki ordered his men after finally arriving at the capital of Ta no Kuni. He had only one desire, to go home and take a hot bath with a good meal. However, duty came first, and after supervising the unloading of his convoy, Suzuki escorted his last package towards the daimi. It was early afternoon and the sun was shining brightly, but a few clouds had disturbed the autumn day. The trees had slowly begun to color their leaves with yellow, red and brown and it was a beautiful and worrying time. For it heralded the coming of winter and its many difficulties. Follow me, Suzuki said to Madara and Sakura, who stood side by side. The dark-haired man kept his head bowed for most of the ride so as not to be recognized. Fortunately, Sakura drew all the attention to herself, not only because of her hair color but also because she was carrying a weapon on her belt. What was most distressing to Sakura was not the fact of being looked at, she was used to it, but rather the expression expressed by these looks and especially their origin. From curious, suspicious, admiring looks, to the outraged ones coming from the majority of the other women. Indeed, since they were little, they had been told that a woman should never fight. A woman had the obligation to find a respectable husband, she should maintain the house. On the other hand, if a woman had the misfortune to contradict a man, to disappoint him or to stand up to him, it would be a dishonor that would most often lead to death. So for many women to see Sakura in this way was an ignominy and a disgrace to her status as a woman. Sakura didn't need to hear them, their disapproval was more than obvious and it appalled the young woman to no end. She sighed slightly as she realized that she was going to have a lot of work to do to improve the conditions of women and change attitudes. As they walked Sakura remembered a little discussion they'd had with Madara on the way here, let Madara speak first. The dark-haired man had learned to enjoy having Sakura stand up to him, but it wouldn't be conducive during negotiations. After about twenty minutes of walking through the town, they finally arrived at a large building that was richly decorated and stood out from the crowd. Many guards were posted here and there, but none of them seemed to be shinobi. Your weapons, Suzuki demanded as they stood before a massive wooden double door. Madara complied immediately and handed his two swords to a guard at the entrance, Sakura did the same and was not worried. After all, a shinobi was a weapon unto himself. Suzuki pushed open the doors and led the way into a relatively average room. Once the three people were inside, the guards closed the doors behind them and six people were waiting further forward, all standing. There were also four guards posted at each corner of the room. Daimi-sama, Suzuki bowed before joining him on his right. My dearest guest, it is a real pleasure to welcome you to my home Uchihadano, Hashiba said to Madara. Daimi Dano, Madara replied in return with a very slight nod. May I ask why you are bringing this woman to a council of war? The Lord questioned disdainfully, looking Sakura up and down with equal disdain. Daimi Dano, out of respect for you I will disregard that remark. Furthermore, in view of our common plans for the future I would ask you never to disrespect this woman again. You will hold her in the same esteem you hold me, Madara warned forcefully. Hashiba may have been a daimi, but there was no disputing the demands of a man like Madara Uchiha. Head of one of the most powerful clans in the world and considered a shinobi god by history. He was surprised, even a little frightened by the thinly veiled threat his host was making to the woman at his side. Sakura felt her heart pound in her chest as she heard Madara defend her. She never thought it possible that the patriarch of the Uchiha clan would vouch for a woman and demand that she be shown the same respect as a clan leader. It was getting harder and harder not to think about it, but Sakura felt all at once as she watched Madara act in such a protective manner. Hashiba and the entire council turned their gaze once more to the young woman. 
Except this time she adopted a more noble, more domineering posture and her gaze showed only power, showing that she was a dangerous woman. I'll take good note of that, Achihadano, Hashiba replied without apologizing. Before we continue Diamidano, do you have blind faith in everyone in this room? Madara inquired without looking up. Indeed, for the moment he was only named Achihadano, not Madaradano. Hi, they were all handpicked for my protection and Tano Kuni's loyalty, Hashiba confirmed. Pride was visible on the faces of everyone in the room. It was a great honor to hear his daimi say such words, for in those days nothing was more important than honor. Sakura-san. Madara called, turning his head slightly towards the young woman. Hi, she replied, understanding what she had to do. I'll ask you not to panic, it's for our own safety that we're doing this, Madara announced before Sakura made a quick series of seals with her hands and finally slammed them to the ground. Finjutsu, Shuhijimu. The young woman uttered as a long series of lines of writing spread throughout the room, isolating it from the outside. Is that okay Sakura-san? Madara asked after a moment. Hi, she confirmed as she sat back down beside him. What did you just do? Suzuki asked with his hand at his weapon, not quite reassured by what he had just seen. A seal of secrecy, no one outside of those present in this room will be able to hear what is said from now on, Madara informed before removing his straw hat, revealing his person. Some, such as Daiki, the son of the Daimi, and Tanaka, the secretary, let out a small gasp when they saw Achiha Madara alive. So it's true, whispered Ramaji, who had always had a slight doubt of his survival. Chapter 14 He was one of the most powerful beings that ever existed. He was one of those beings with the mention of fleeing on sight in the bingo book. He had changed the face of the world and the way it worked. He had raised cities and armies to the ground and his name was feared by all. So it was normal to feel small in front of this person. Uchihadano, let me introduce you to those who in the future will work for this cause you and I are aiming for, Hashiba began before turning his arm toward Suzuki. I believe you have already met my right-hand man Suzuki. The designated one nodded respectfully in Madara's direction after he was introduced. Indeed, your reputation precedes you Suzuki-san, Madara replied neutrally. It is an honor to know that the great Uchiha Madara has heard of me, Suzuki added with a slight smile on his face. To my left is Ramaji-sama, Hashiba continued, this time pointing to a man wearing a white kimono with yellow stripes down the neck. In his hand was a stick that was probably used as a stand. He is, in my opinion, the wisest person among us and a close friend of the family. Ramaji nodded very slightly, which was understandable given his age. The old man stroked his beard and seemed to be already thinking of a thousand and one possible scenarios because of this meeting with the famous Uchiha. I must admit that I'm still having trouble getting used to the idea that you're still alive, Uchihadano, said the old man, who had done a lot of research on the battle of the shinobi gods at the Valley of the End. Then that makes two of us, Majisama, Madara replied, aware that if it weren't for Sakura he would have been dead long ago. The dark-haired man didn't dwell on this memory as the daimi introduced another member of the council, they were introduced in order of importance. This is Teisho Nakamura, it is thanks to him that we were able to finance the bulk of the expeditions, said the daimi, pointing to a hard-faced man. He was soberly dressed but had the build of someone who worked in business. And he must have been very rich to have started the project without Sakura's funds. I must say you have a most loyal Daimidano here, few men would agree to invest part of their fortune without some guarantee in return. Madara remarked as he stared at the man named Teisho, who greatly appreciated the concealed compliment. For yes, in politics, it was all about manipulation and the use of words. Uchihadano, Teisho bowed. Then we have Riku Koyabashi, who without him we would not have succeeded in establishing the foundations of Tan no Kuni, Hashiba explained, pointing to a man nearing fifty. He had a goatee and half his head was bald. He wore a kimono in shades of green and purple, his posture showed a person of nobility. Tell me Koyabashi, Madara began without using an honorific suffix. What could have caused a man like you to choose Hashiba Shita over another during the Muromachi Wars? It was a hidden accusation, showing that Madara was suspicious of this man. He was a nobleman, and very often nobles were just after power. 
If he was outraged by the accusation he showed nothing and instead remained in control of his emotions. Between three fools, I preferred to join the one who wished to bring prosperity to my homeland, Riku answered wisely, and this answer seemed to suit Madara who inclined his head slightly in his direction. You are not like other nobles I have met in my life Koyabashi-san, the clan leader continued, this time adding a suffix of respect. I'm trying, Uchihadano, the noble bowed his head. This is my son, Daiki Shita, Hashiba pointed to a rather handsome man in his twenties, who bowed lower than his fellows. He might be the son of a daimi, but he was not the daimi himself and had to respect his superiors. He was dressed in a purple and orange kimono. Unfortunately, he did not inherit my talent for fighting, but he knows how to manipulate numbers like no one else. This remark slightly lightened the mood of the room and a slight smile appeared on several faces, including Madara's. Which was a good sign for the council. Uchihadano, the son of the daimi said in a very respectful voice. However, Madara noticed that all along he had been casting discreet glances in Sakura's direction. It was understandable at the same time, if Madara demanded such respect from her, she must be one of a kind, and therefore of interest. This is Tsubasa, he is the biggest rice producer in the country. We owe our neutral status to him and his production, said Hashiba, pointing to a rather strong man. He was dressed in the most basic of clothes, even though he was wearing a kimono you could tell he was a man who was used to working in the fields. Uchi Hadano, Tsubana said, bowing low. He was not a nobleman, he was just a man who was successful in business and stood out from the rest by his success. And this is Tanaka, my personal secretary, said Hashiba, pointing to a man who stood a little way off. It is a great honor to meet you in real Uchihadano, the secretary said, bowing low as well. He seemed very impressed to be in her presence. All the while, Sakura had been analyzing the little political game that was going on. She had taken note of the two people in the room who were not to be insulted and who were to be shown the utmost respect by Madara's use of the suffixes, Dano and Sama. Suzuki also seemed important to Madara, probably because of his past deeds. So did Rika Koyabashi, who after a threat had earned a modicum of respect from Madara. However, this was not the case for Teisho, even though he received a compliment from the dark-haired man. Gentlemen, I present to you Haruno Sakura, Madara pointed his arm in the direction of the young woman who gently bowed her head. Only Suzuki didn't seem surprised by this announcement, he had seen what this woman was capable of. Especially since it had seemed like nothing at all to her. So the great Madara owes his life to a simple woman? Ramaji said skeptically. After all, the clan leader had a reputation for denigrating the female gender. Not just any woman, Ramaji-sama, Suzuki defended Madara. On our return trip, she was able to show extraordinary abilities. This drew even more eyes to Sakura, as well as curiosity. What kind of ability? Daiki asked, never taking his eyes off the young woman's face. He was becoming more and more intrigued by this woman who at first glance was very beautiful. Art Shinobi, Madara answered immediately before Suzuki had time to respond. It was quite disturbing for Sakura to be the center of the conversation and be talked about as if she wasn't there. Nevertheless, could we start this Daimidano meeting? Absolutely. Hashiba agreed, giving everyone permission to sit down. Cushions were set around a low rectangular table. Well, Uchihadano, why don't you tell us in more detail exactly what you are proposing? The unification of the elemental nations under one banner, ours, Madara explained smoothly. That sounds like a plan of conquest by force, Suzuki remarked before pouring himself a large cup of tea. After such a journey, it would do him a world of good. Not exactly, Madara said before turning his face to Sakura. He'd been reluctant to accept Sakura's plan for a long time, but since she'd saved his life, he agreed to bring peace in his own way. For now. Madara held out his hand to the young woman and gave an authorization that had never been given in a war council before. Explained Sakura-san to them. Giving a woman the right to participate in this kind of meeting was very rare, but giving a woman an equal say was unheard of. Arigato Uchihadano, Sakura began, practicing protocol. The era we are living in is only temporary, not everyone has your vision of the Daimidano life, a life of calm and prosperity. 
Because of the newly established system, we are heading for a different kind of war. What could be worse than what we have known? Asked Riku, who had sacrificed a lot for the country to unite. A worldwide war, Koyabashi-san, Sakura answered calmly and seriously. As Uchihadano pointed out to you earlier, you chose Daimidano because you wanted the prosperity of your homeland. But how many people think like you? Hardly any, so how long will it be before the rulers finally take an interest in their neighbors to expand their territory? There was a long silence as everyone absorbed the young woman's words, which were unfortunately full of truth. The leaders of other nations have more than dubious reputations. After all, power is created on the blood of our victims. It is the victors who write history, and many of those victors are far from being choirboys, Sakura added under Madara's watchful gaze as he found her to be an amazing woman in many ways. And unfortunately, the onset of war is closer than we think. Do you have any proof of what you are saying Harunodano? Teisho asked, using the form of respect Madara imposed on this woman, that of clan leader. Like Uchihadano, I am a shinobi and information gathering is one of my specialties, Sakura explained as she looked each council member in the eye. I'm a woman, and a hundred percent of the time, people won't be suspicious of what a woman is capable of. So I managed to get the right information from the right people. Do you mean? Daiki began and immediately thought of sexual methods, but was directly interrupted by Sakura. That I slid a lot of throats to get this information, Sakura cut in with a bit of harshness in her tone. She was making it clear that she was probably of Madara Uchiha's caliber and at the same time she didn't appreciate Daiki's hint. What is this information you have gathered? Ramaji asked, still stroking his beard. Since Hashirama Senju's disappearance, troop movements have been seen in several countries. The excuse of military training has been used to cover our tracks, but exchanges have indeed taken place and the news is slowly beginning to tighten, Sakura said before grabbing the tea set next to her. The young doctor was in a very awkward situation, for in front of her were patriarchal men, they were in this room because they had fought for this honor. They had already proven themselves and to see a woman who had earned the respect of the famous Uchiha Madara was more than a little disconcerting. He himself had a reputation for being uncompromising when it came to women's place in the world. So Sakura had to play a subtle game and put her intelligence to the test. She had to show that she was a dangerous, powerful person, but without appearing superior to them. So, while talking to the others she poured herself a cup of tea in the female way. Which countries will be involved? Suzuki asked before drinking her own cup of hot tea. Probably all the big countries and their vassals, Sakura answered before turning her head towards Madara. Uchihadano tea. Hi, Madara replied. With that simple gesture, Sakura had just shown deference to Madara and supported the fact that he was dominating her. Even if it was just an act, the others around the table didn't need to know about it yet. Do you think we will be affected by this upcoming war? Asked the Daimi this time. If we don't do anything, yes, Madara confirmed, grabbing the cup of tea Sakura had handed him. You must manage to keep your position as a neutral country at all costs, Daimidano, Sakura added. Why is that? Hashiba asked. Because it's this world war that's going to make us powerful, Sakura answered with certainty. How so? Because excuse me Uchihadano, but as powerful as you are, it's not two people that are going to make our country a world power, Suzuki interjected, not seeing how they were going to become powerful by doing nothing. What do you think the victims of the war will do knowing that there is a country where there is no war? Madara asked the assembly. They will come and ask for asylum. Of course we don't intend to wait quietly for them to come to us, Sakura added after Madara. We intend, Uchihadano and I, to scour the battlefields and rally as many people as possible to our cause. Hence the reason to start building so many new residences, Teisho said to himself, stroking his jaw in thought. Right, but it won't just be civilians, we expect to gather shinobi, as well as entire clans, Sakura explained, taking a sip of her tea, which she had to admit was good. Why would they join us? What will make them loyal to us? Asked Rika Koyabashi. Because they will all have something in common, they will be victims of the war. We will have saved them from death, we will have offered them a new home, a place to live, to work, to have a family away from war and misery, 
Sakura said passionately, letting her heart speak. When a human being is at his lowest ebb, he'll grab any hand that's offered to put him out of his misery. It's the same principle as handing a piece of meat to a starving animal, after a while he'll let himself be stroked. And when it's Uchiha Madara himself who comes to protect you, you can only trust him. Buying so many resources from other countries had a double purpose. To weaken them and to allow us to secretly take in people, Madara added, placing his empty cup on the table. That's a dangerously knowledgeable person you have there, Uchihadano, said Hashiba, who couldn't refute the fact that she knew what she was talking about. Oh believe me, she's not only dangerous in that area Daimidano, Madara replied and that simple sentence sparked a soft laughter in the room. Inwardly Sakura was proud of herself, for if the attitude relaxed despite the fact that she was a woman, it was half one. How do you plan to finance such a project Uchihadano? Teisho Nakamura asked, knowing that wars are expensive, very expensive. The information I'm about to give you is vital. Or rather, the knowledge of this information alone is worth a fortune on the scale of the elemental nations, Madara began, suddenly having the attention of everyone in the room. Even the guards posted at each corner had been listening the whole time. It wasn't every day that you witnessed the beginnings of world peace. And if anyone ever mentions this information outside this room, I will kill them without restraint. The end of the sentence was said harshly as Madara let out a little bit of his killing intent into the room. Only Sakura and the Daimi were not affected. We understand, Uchihadano, Hashiba said after a few seconds as he saw the others become uncomfortable. Sakura-san, Madara called as he turned to the woman in question who raised her arm above the table, palm down. Once she had everyone's attention she flashed a steady stream of coins for about ten seconds. She poured a hundred gold coins onto the table without stopping, as the council watched in amazement. I could go on creating money for hours. No. For days, Sakura said, looking at the stunned men, most of whom had their mouths open. I would like to add something else to Uchihadano's threat. Because of this skill, I am the richest person in all the elemental nations, so I will tell you this, if you ever intend to betray Uchihadano and myself for money, know that I will always pay more. Madara wondered once again who this woman by his side really was. He had never met a female person like her. She was showing great intelligence at the moment. She had all the qualities of a woman, beauty, being a housewife, but also the strength and skills of a man. Madara thought that he would probably be the only one to speak during this meeting, thinking that Sakura would be too impressed to react. But no. She was at ease, confident and even managed to make subtle threats. It was as if she had been doing this all her life. Madara could see that her attitude was totally different from when it was just the two of them. He felt very lucky to know the other side of Sakura and couldn't help but find her even more attractive. How? Teisho finally asked with his eyes as big as saucers. I won't reveal that information. Consider it payback for your investment Teisho Nakamura, for blindly supporting your daimi. Upon hearing these words, Tanaka, who had only been writing down the conversation from the beginning, hurriedly got up with an empty box to fill it with the gold coins generated by Sakura. I can see now why you place so much importance on her, Uchihadano, Maji remarked. Madara said nothing at this remark, but after a moment he used his one good arm to shift his kimono. He revealed a small portion of his torso, showing those in front of him two large, slightly pink scars that stood out from the rest of his pale skin. Let's just say that's not the main reason she has my respect, Majisama, Madara admitted, showing everyone why he was still alive. This woman was also a doctor, and probably a very good one at that, given the location of the two scars. After a moment Madara put his kimono back on, hiding both scars. A female doctor. Hi, Daimi Dano, Sakura replied, trying to keep her sense of pride contained. Since the beginning of the meeting, Madara had been nothing but praise for her, defending her and practically putting her on equal footing with him. It's true that with an unlimited investment it changes a lot, Daimi Dano, Tsubasa intervened for the first time. I agree Tsubasa, the possibilities for Ta no Kuni are also endless, Hashiba confirmed, still struggling to manage the news. You keep your commitments, Uchihadano, we have begun ours, what do you advise for the future? Continue what you are doing for the moment, make reserves and above all hide them. 
continue building new homes for the future victims of the war, Madara stated seriously. It won't be long before you'll probably be canvassed to join a camp, you must keep your neutrality at all costs, even if it means paying for it. Convincing the land of fire shouldn't be a problem, Suzuki intervened. Why is that, Suzuki-san? Madara asked. During my expedition to Kanoha no Sato, I used the excuse that our crops had been affected by a disease, drastically reducing our reserves for the coming winter. You understand that with little food, we will not be able to contribute to a war effort, Suzuki explained before pulling out some numbers. Moreover, we have no shinobi forces, our army does not exceed a thousand men for the entire country. Sure, it's still a thousand men, but a well-trained shinobi would make short work of our army. Your argument stands, Suzuki-san, I still say you took a big risk by going directly to Kanoha, the clan leader added. He has always been a risk-taker when it comes to strategy, said Ramaji, remembering the old battle led by Suzuki. A word of advice, Achi Hadano, if you were to face him in the shoji, be careful. Once war is declared, what should we do? Asked Daiki who had remained silent after being gently put in his place by Sakura. Have you made any purchases of wood and stones? Madara asked, turning his gaze to the young man. Yes, thanks to Rumaji sama we managed to get some agreements with the Land of Lightning to have a constant supply of stone and another agreement was also made with a sawmill in the Land of Fire. Daiki answered as he read some scrolls placed in front of him. We will have to start building a great wall for the capital. From what I've seen, your city is strategically located so that it can only be attacked from one side, said Madara, who on his way here had seen that the city was very well positioned. It was on the side of a mountain in a huge valley several kilometers long. There were many hills along this valley and you could only besiege this town from one side. This will not be seen as an aggression because a world war will have broken out. It will only be seen as prevention. You want to make this city a stronghold, right? Suzuki asked. Exactly, because hundreds. Well, thousands of people will be pouring in because of the war, we have to be prepared to defend them in the future, Madara admitted. I think we're going to have to set up a new father administrative system, Daiki said, realizing the workload ahead. Why is that? If thousands of potential workers come in, we'll have to manage them to find out what they're best at. The city will become an ever-changing anthill, Daiki explained seriously. What would normally take us decades to do will probably take us a year at most. The world begets the world, added Rumaji wisely. Now I understand why you have your son as a Daimidano advisor, Madara complimented, unable to take away the fact that his son had a sharp mind. Nevertheless, your son is right and I advise you to put several architects on the project in order to have something impregnable. Do you think that the war will still come here? Suzuki asked more out of confirmation than out of genuine questioning. It's prevention for us and a warning against possible enemies. Because the world will think twice before breaking against a city that can hold its own against entire armies, explained the shinobi, who knew that the more powerful an opponent became, the more alliances were made against him. What will you do if the shinobi come after us? Asked Tsubasa, who had never seen shinobi in action, but had heard the legends about them. A more advanced military system will have to be put in place. Entire clans from the minor countries will flee their homes because of the war. None of them will have the guts to say anything because we will offer them sanctuary, but also because I will be the one to offer that sanctuary. And your reputation precedes you Uchihadano, Hashiba added, having heard of clans being destroyed because they had not kept their commitments to Madara Uchiha. No one thing Daimidano, for the time being my presence will be required in many different places and even more so when war is declared. But take note that we will have to review the way we govern together, Madara blurted out in a crude manner. I'm not talking about removing you from your position as Daimi, quite the opposite, but if we achieve what Sakura-san and I want, a new and more sophisticated system of governance will have to be put in place. For unfortunately, corruption and power scar the mind, and there is no way that I will see all these efforts go to waste for the sake of trifles. Will it endanger our positions? Asked Riku, who, as a noble, was not very fond of giving up his position to anyone. No, it won't. Could you give me an example of the type of hierarchy you would set up, Achihadano, Hashiba demanded curiously. Power divided in two. 
a daimi for all administrative matters, nobility and management of the country. Akage, to manage all that concerns the military aspect, shinobi and their respective clans. These two people would have power over the country, and would in turn be advised by a triumvirate that brings the two parties together, Madara revealed using figurines placed at his disposal on the council table. Two men or even five cannot run an empire as we see it. So this same triumvirate will in turn be advised by a larger council. This will allow for a better balance of power and above all a better control. But this would not only be for the management of such an empire, it is especially that we will not be eternal Daimidano and the next generation will perhaps be venal. So this system allows us to elect internally the future leaders. Those who will have our vision of peace. Sakura could no longer be mistaken as she watched Madara speak with such passion. The Rikid Sinin was right about this man, he wanted world peace more than anything. If she wasn't in such a place, she would shed a tear at the man Madara had become. Unless he had always been like this, but no one had taken the time to really know him. You seem to have given the matter some thought, Achihadano, Maji said with great concentration. Let's just say I'm learning from my mistakes, Maji-sama, Madara replied, lowering his eyes ever so slightly as he thought about his past mistakes. Mistakes? Ramaji asked. Kanoha was a mistake on my part, it cost me my entire clan and almost cost me my life. There was a silence in the council chamber, for Madara very rarely admitted that he had made a mistake. Do you have any demands of me Daimidano? You have already fulfilled it by making a blood signature, Hashiba replied immediately, knowing by now that Madara was serious about his ambitions. I will have one last demand, or rather my friend here will have one, Madara added. We're listening, Hashiba said, looking at the young woman in front of him. If she had asked for something on her own, she would have gotten nothing, but this request also came from Madara. I would like you to set up a building dedicated to medicine and healing. Unfortunately a lot of people die because this path is not developed enough, so I would like to see such a place set up and training offered. Sakura said before conjuring up a small stack of books in a smoking poof and placing them on the table. These books are unique in the world and will change the way lives are saved in your country. Tanaka rose once more to pick up the four stacked books before presenting them to her daimi, who looked at each cover. If I didn't have the evidence before my eyes of what you did to Uchihadano, I would have refused, Hashiba said after a moment. But I am willing to be generous. Erigato Daimidano. Could you allow women to attend this training as well, Sakura thanked, bowing her head. Why? Demanded the daimi, who did not understand why he should include women in such a program. Every living thing is made up of chakra, women by nature have less chakra than a man. The less chakra you have the more precise you are with it, Sakura explained before conjuring a kanai in a puff of smoke. The four guards and Suzuki immediately put their hands to their swords at such a gesture. However, Sakura ignored this and raised her other arm before making a large cut. She placed the bloody weapon back on the table before activating her IRY ninjutsu. With a soft green glow, the wide slash slowly closed before the astonished eyes of the audience. Then after a moment, the wound was gone, the skin was perfectly smooth as if it had never suffered anything. A properly trained person can do what I did. But women, because of their condition of having less chakra will always be better at something like this, Sakura finished as she wiped the blood off her arm. Madara had the answer to one of her questions at the same time, she didn't have Kekiai Genkai, it was just a different chakra manipulation. I take it you don't expect to part with such a rare gem Uchihadano? Hashiba asked after seeing such talent. Having a doctor with that kind of power to survive was very appealing. If you're talking about marrying her off, I'm totally against it, Madara said bluntly, which disappointed Daiki immensely, who was becoming more and more interested in this woman. Well, I think this meeting is over, Hashiba finally concluded. Will you stay for dinner with us tonight? It was an invitation that could not be refused, unless one wanted to insult one's host. I'd love to. Chapter 15 It was late afternoon when the long meeting between the leaders of Ta no Kuni, Madara Uchiha and Sakura Haruno ended. The two shinobi were walking through the corridors of the daimyo's residence guided by a servant. 
Their weapons had been returned once the meeting was over and Madara decided to place a light Jinjutsu on his face so as not to be recognized. He would be seen as he was but no one would be able to put a name to his face. As they walked out of the Diomese meeting room, people they passed would step aside and bow to them, for they could only be important people for having had the privilege of talking to the Lord himself. After five minutes of walking through the corridors, the woman in front of them turned towards the two protagonists. Her head was slightly lowered as she looked down at the floor so as never to meet their eyes. It was an act of submission, to show that she was nothing less than a servant. Both her arms were raised to her sides indicating two rooms with open doors. These are your chambers my lords, began the dark-haired woman. Two people have been placed at your disposal by Daimi Sama to prepare you for tonight's meal. Do you have any special requirements? You may go, Madara said automatically, he was used to this kind of protocol. This simple gesture shocked Sakura inwardly, he had never acted like this with her, or rather. He didn't act like this anymore. He had been an obnoxious character the first few days, but she had put that down to pain. On hearing this answer the maid bowed low. Have a pleasant evening, my lords, the maid added, before continuing on her way. I don't like the idea of having to leave you alone, Sakura said softly once the maid was out of sight. Everything will be fine Sakura-san, Madara said and turned to face her. I want you to know that you've been exceptional during this meeting. At the word Sakura felt herself blush and looked away. Thank you, but I still have the right to dislike the idea. Your physical condition doesn't allow you to be alone, Sakura insisted, worrying greatly about Madara. Sure he could stand again, fight, but he was still easy prey for well-trained ninjas. After a few seconds Sakura felt a hand touch her chin to draw her gaze to Madara's. He had a slight smile on his face, but there was something else in his gaze and it disturbed Sakura so much that she didn't know how to react. Thank you for your concern Sakura-san, but I'm not weak, Madara replied, gently stroking the young woman's chin with his thumb. God she had soft skin. Enjoy Daimidano's offer and relax, you deserve it more than anyone. Even though he wasn't standing next to the daimi, Madara used the honorific suffix when referring to him since there were maids nearby. It was out of the question to create a diplomatic incident over such trifles, as gossip and rumors were rife in such places. Well, don't dip your left arm in the water, Sakura finally relented, still confused. If anything happens, just throw a chakra spike and I'll come running. At these words Madara let go of the young woman's chin before entering the room dedicated to him, then closed the door behind him. Sakura found herself alone in the hallway, staring at the door. All the while, two women had been watching the scene in silence. They were dressed in unusual robes. They might have been servants, but they were in the service of a daimi and his guests, so it was normal that they were well dressed. Nevertheless, both women were completely shocked by what they had just seen. The mere knowledge that this woman had attended a meeting with the entire council was extraordinary. Then, she seemed to be a fighter since she had a katana on her back. Then, she had dared to stand up to a man and had even answered him. For a moment the two women thought she was going to get killed or at least backhanded for daring to answer. But it was not so. Either this woman was special, or the man in front of her was very flexible. They didn't know who he was, but his build, his charisma and his presence, everything about him embodied greatness. In any case, they could not continue their theory as the young woman with pink hair entered the room and closed the door behind her. Ohai Sakura-sama. Both women said at the same time, bowing low. They had been briefed that this woman was somewhat important and that she needed to be taken care of. Moreover, this person had a family name, so she was the daughter of an influential father, a nobleman at least. However, they were once again very surprised when she bowed low as well. Ohai ladies, Sakura said before unhooking her weapon from her back. She had no use for such a weapon, but she had to carry it in order to play her part. She placed it on the rack just to her left before turning to see the two maids waiting to be given orders. How can we please you Sakura-sama? Ask the one who seemed to be the older of the two. Ah. That's not necessary, I assure you, Sakura replied uncomfortably at the situation. She wasn't used to being taken care of and didn't like seeing women in this situation. Yes, she did. A woman should be shown off, 
especially when a man is interested in her, the brunette added with a smile on her lips. Because of her slightly older age, she knew the signs. Yes, except that no man has set his sights on me, Sakura retorted firmly. And I don't belong to any man. Yet we saw, the younger of the two maids tried to say, her blonde hair reminding her of Ino Yamanaka, her former best friend. It's not what you think, Sakura interrupted once more. I'm a free and independent woman. Glancing around the room, Sakura saw that there was a beautiful kimono ready to be worn and a silver basin in the corner from which a slight steam was emanating. She began to undo her mittens around her hands as they talked. This gesture did not go unnoticed by the two maids who immediately came over to help her. Let us help you Sakura-sama, the brunette said. No. I assure you I don't need your help, Sakura insisted as she set her things down near her weapon. Please Sakura-sama, the blonde implored with a pleading look. If Daimi-sama is ever unhappy with us he. Hannah shut up. The brunette abruptly interjected before the aforementioned Hannah could say something she regretted. Forgive me Sakura-sama. Hannah said before prostrating herself on the ground. She seemed to only want to do her job in order to satisfy her lord. We have been ordered to satisfy you as well as prepare you Sakura-sama, added the brunette who now understood why she had been given the task of preparing this lady. She was one of a kind and many would consider her actions a dishonor. Well. Sakura finally relented with a sigh. It was pure compassion that caused Sakura to agree to have the two women take care of her. Straighten up Hana-san. The young blonde sat up carefully, the beginnings of tears were in her eyes, but a smile was on her features. She looked much prettier with a smile on her lips. Arigato Sakura-sama, Hana said before approaching to undress her. I do have one requirement though ladies, Sakura announced as she felt expert hands remove the top of her clothes. Anything you like. Stop with the sama and talk to me without barriers, Sakura demanded, she wanted to be around other women not machines that would laugh at her every sentence and nod at her every remark. Talk to me as if I were. A comrade, a friend. Sakura received a smile in return from the blonde and a nod from the brunette as she stood bare-chested in front of these two women. She was embarrassed to show her body to two complete strangers. What's that? Hannah asked as she saw a lot of symbols drawn on various parts of her body, especially on her forearms. They're called finjutsu seals, Sakura answered as the blonde ran her delicate fingers over the symbols on her wrist. Does it hurt? Hannah asked, she had no idea what finjutsu was. She had been taught to read as women were taught, but all these symbols made no sense to her. No, Sakura replied as the second maid removed her trousers. What is your name? Amaya, the brunette answered automatically as she scrutinized Sakura's body. Sakura was quickly embarrassed and a hand went to cover her chest, but Amaya stopped her. Don't be ashamed of your body madam. It's always been a complex for me, Sakura said as she could see that the two maids were much larger than her. It's true that men like busty women, Amaya said as she took Sakura's hand and led her to the bathtub. Don't forget what you've been taught, madam, if a woman can make her husband come in all the right ways, he won't see her flaws. This angered Sakura to no end. Not because of her, but because of what women were forced to do, they were taught values that made them sex slaves, nothing more, nothing less. I never received those teachings. And I think they are a disgrace to us women, Sakura said forcefully to the dismay of the other two. Madam should not say such things. Madam would get beaten, worse, killed if a man heard her say such things, Amaya retorted, her face showing fear. Fear that a man had heard Sakura's words through the door. Always presentable you shall be. Always helpful you shall be. A good wife to your husband you shall be. Remember that, my daughter, for they will make you a woman who lives. Hannah said as if she were reciting poetry. If you find a husband one day, make him happy and get children. But that's not fair. Sakura protested as she stepped into the bath prepared by the two maids. The water was warm and quickly relaxed Sakura. A maid sat on either side of her before taking sponges and beginning her bath. They were delicate, soft, tender and looked as if they had been doing this all their lives. 
But we're only women, madam, Amaya retorted as she rubbed Sakura's legs. Our purpose in life is to care for our men, to assist them, to relieve them and to perpetuate their descendants. So to stand out from the crowd and find a suitable husband, we have to be talented. We practice dance, learn music, perfect the art of sewing and above all, we learn to be beautiful and desirable, Hannah added with a small smile. I don't agree, you are not just meant to obey men. We are living beings, we have our emotions, we are capable of feeling as well as men, we are capable of rising as much as they do, we are capable of fighting as they do. What for? Asked the blonde who was massaging Sakura's shoulders, who couldn't help but relax at such competence. Are you girls happy in your current life? Sakura finally asked, unable to understand how they couldn't see that the men were exploiting them. Yes, both women said at the same time. There is nothing in the world that could make a woman happier than this kind of life. Hearing that last sentence, Sakura understood that most women of that time had a kind of Stockholm Syndrome. They had been taught all their lives that this life was the best life a woman could dream of having. Even if it was a lie. If you told yourself every morning that you were ugly when it wasn't true, you would end up thinking you were ugly yourself. Sakura felt like crying when she saw what men did to the female gender. Hush, a woman shouldn't cry at the thought of being happy, Hannah whispered in Sakura's ear. I'm so sorry for you, Sakura whispered and let a tear roll down her cheek. The understanding of the female situation in the Sengoku era plus the stress of the afternoon made Sakura cry softly. Don't cry Sakura-sama, Hannah said before wiping the tears from her cheeks. She then smiled brightly. You're so much more beautiful when you smile. Sakura tried to say, but Hannah put her index finger to her lips and politely told her to be quiet. Close your eyes and let us do this, Hannah whispered and Sakura couldn't find the strength to say no, so she closed her eyes. She reluctantly enjoyed the moment, their expert hands roaming over her body. Sakura wondered if Madara was getting the same treatment. She felt herself blush at such thoughts and a twinge of jealousy seized her at the thought of another woman touching him. After about twenty minutes of being washed and massaged Sakura finally got out of the water and was dressed in some sort of dressing gown from that time. Amaya grabbed her hand and directed it to a piece of furniture stuck against the wall. There was a mirror and a lot of hair and makeup tools, this piece of furniture was what was called in the old days, a dressing table. Less used in Sakura's time, it was mostly present in brothels. This time, Amaya brushed her hair while the blonde applied a cream to her body. Why are you doing all this? Sakura asked. The sword-wielding madam has soft skin, but not enough, Amaya replied as she gently ran the brush through Sakura's hair. If madam wishes to seduce her lord, she must be flawless. I have no suitor, Sakura repeated. Does madam allow me to speak without restraint? Amaya asked as she put down the hairbrush and started a bun of sorts. Hi, Sakura replied as she looked at the brunette woman through the mirror in front of her. Why does madam act dishonorably, behaving like a man, with a weapon in her back? When she has a good friend who seems to have eyes only for her. Amaya asked, only to receive an answer about thirty seconds later. Because there is no dishonor in wanting to protect the people you love. Unlike you who see it as a dishonor, I am capable of defending my family against an enemy. I will not cower in the face of adversity and I will be strong for the man I love so I can support and protect him, Sakura said passionately ignoring the second part the brunette stated. Sakura was very different from the women of that time, but that was only because she came from a time when attitudes had changed. Where she had been able to stand out by sheer force of will. Thanks to Tsunade and all those around her who believed in her. Amaya stopped styling Sakura's hair and stood beside her before looking into her eyes. Except that this is useless to you. I don't know who the man is that you were talking to earlier. But I know that I would kill for that kind of attention from a man, Amaya explained, who at the age of thirty had experience with men. He respects you. I've never seen a man be so delicate and kind to a woman and I can't imagine you acting so inappropriately towards him. Sakura couldn't help the blush that appeared on her cheeks at such a revelation. Ayama-chan is right Sakura-sama, Hana confirmed as she was filing Sakura's nails. His lordship who was with you earlier is a very handsome man. 
By his build, charisma and presence he must be someone very important. Hi. He is. Very important, Sakura said and looked away from Amaya. He's important to me. Yes, he was someone important to her and she didn't want to lose him. But to love him? Those were two completely different things. Sakura had spent her life chasing a boy, so she didn't know when a man was interested in the opposite sex. While she was deep in thought, Sakura saw the brunette walk to the door. She opened it and looked left, then right before clapping her hands twice. Ayama-sama? Said a female voice. Bring me some cherry blossoms from the garden. Quickly, quickly. Amaya urged, then Sakura heard hurried footsteps going away down the hallway. The door was closed and the brunette returned to Sakura's side. Believe me madam, after you've been taken care of, he'll be completely under your spell, said the brunette who, while waiting for the cherry blossoms for her hair, started the makeup. But it's not like that between us, Sakura refuted as the thirty-year-old dusted her forehead and cheekbones with a little powder. Suddenly, Hannah and Amaya both stopped what they were doing and looked at each other. After a few seconds of silence they both began to laugh. Why are you laughing? You're innocent Sakura-sama, Hannah said as she massaged the young woman's hands once more. She laughed more and more and a pleasant atmosphere settled in the room where two women were teasing a third who wouldn't admit how she felt about the man in the other room. After about ten minutes someone knocked gently on the door and the brunette hurriedly got up to open it. Amaya-sama, here, a small voice said. Arigato. The brunette replied before closing the door once more. She returned to the dressing table, a basket full of cherry blossoms in her hands. She put the basket down before going over to the kimono lying next to it. It was a beautiful piece of cloth made of silk. It was a very pale pink, close to white, to remind her of the pure side of the woman. The paleness of the pink matched perfectly with Sakura's hair which only accentuated her femininity and the softness of her features. A wide pinkish red belt at the waist was placed to remind the passionate side of the woman. The necklines of the kimono were pure white with very fine embroidery to add a complex side to the wearer. Hannah took Sakura's hand and forced her to get up from her chair and follow her to the kimono. She removed her dressing gown so that she was in her underwear only. And with the help of the two women, Sakura found herself dressed in a sumptuous kimono that she had to admit made her look beautiful. As she looked at her reflection in the mirror, she could hardly recognize herself. Her whole outfit, her makeup, her hands, her eyes, the color of her hair, all worked together perfectly to make her a princess. Once the outfit was on, Amaya accompanied the young woman once more to the chair to do her hair with the help of Hannah. Looking at the two women beside her Sakura couldn't help but see that they both looked very happy doing what they were doing. Sakura resented their situation, but it was only because she had lived a completely different life. Sakura had come from a time when women had almost the same rights as men. She wondered as she saw this happiness, who was she to judge these women and more importantly how could she consider these values wrong when both women claimed to be happy. After all, poor children could be happy by playing ball, while others could not have fun if they did not have the latest game console. Was it not the same in this situation? Who was she to take that happiness away from women who were content with their situation? So, out of tolerance, Sakura accepted for the moment that these women were happy in what she, Sakura, considered unhappiness. She would take as long as it took, but she would open the eyes of all these women and show them what the pleasure of freedom was. You look beautiful Sakura-sama, Hannah said looking at her in the mirror. Sakura was so deep in thought that she didn't realize they had finished preparing her. She put her hand to her mouth not recognizing herself at all. With the cherry blossoms in her hair used as a support to make a bun, her face was clear. Everything showed her off, and she thought she was so beautiful that a tear was forming in the corner of her eye. Don't cry, madam. You're not allowed to cry from now on, Amaya said. Arigato Hanasan, Amaya san, Sakura thanked, still speechless at what the two women had done to her. If you want to thank us, madam. Amaya began as she looked at her in the mirror. Leave behind, at least for this evening, your status as a warrior. Let the beautiful woman you are deep inside express herself. Shine as you really are madam, for a beauty like you must be revealed to all. 
Yes, do that and you will bring honor to us and satisfy our daimi at the same time. Sakura didn't answer and grabbed the small fan the brunette held out to her. Sakura stood up and headed for the door just as the sound of a bell was heard throughout the estate, announcing that it was almost time for dinner. One last thing, the lord I'm with really doesn't appreciate having to cut his own meat, Sakura said turning to the two maids. She knew that Madara could only use one of his arms and he would refuse to look weak in front of everyone. Could you please inform the cooks? It will be done Sakura-sama, the blonde said with a very big smile. The door was opened and Sakura could see that Madara was already in the hallway waiting for her. He was dressed in a black kimono with blood-red necklines that matched his black hair perfectly. His black hair was tied in a high ponytail with a blood-red ribbon. A large lock of his hair fell down the right side of his face, hiding his blind eye in the process. He exuded so much power that it was disturbing and Sakura couldn't help but find him truly beautiful. My dear. Madara greeted and found Sakura most beautiful tonight. I don't think there are enough words to describe your beauty right now. Sakura blushed softly at this most direct compliment from Madara. Usually he was always an extremely discreet and subtle person in his compliments about her beauty. But this time, he had given her a praise that no man had ever given her before. Arigato, Sakura thanked with a thin smile on her lips. I don't think I've ever met a man with as much presence as you. As was the tradition, Madara held out his arm to Sakura so that she could place her arm on it as well and accompany him to the guest room. They walked for about ten minutes. Each person who passed them would step aside before bowing to their presence. It didn't matter who the two people were, they had a royal attitude. So it was with their heads held high that Madara and Sakura arrived in a vast room where a long, wide rectangular table was placed in its center. This table could easily accommodate thirty people. Many people were already in the room, chatting quietly while waiting for the meal to begin. The kimonas of the people went through all the colors and the presence of all these women proved that it was a friendly meal and not a professional one. If it had been, then Sakura would have been the only woman there. However, even though it was a festive meal of joy and fun, the placement of the guests was something very important. And if it was done incorrectly, it could create diplomatic incidents. Many turned their heads when they saw them, whether it was the men who were captivated by Sakura's splendor, or the women who were envious of such a specimen. You leave no one indifferent my dear, Madara whispered as he walked towards the daimyo. I'll return the comment my lord, Sakura replied, making sure not to say her name in front of so many people. Ah, Lord Dano, it pleases me to see you with us tonight, the daimyo began with a broad smile before turning his gaze to Sakura. I must admit that the woman who accompanies you is so beautiful that I am almost jealous. Almost daimyo Dano, Madara retorted gently, looking at his wife beside him. You're not without your rest when you see the delightful creature at your side. Ah, but I am failing in all my commitments. Lord Dano, Sakura Dano, allow me to introduce you to my wife, Yumi Shoda, the daimi introduced, holding the hand of a woman who, at forty years old, was still very beautiful. Her hair was as red as blood, and Madara wondered if she was affiliated with the Uzumaki clan. The two of them gently bowed their heads at Yumi's introduction and she bowed hers in respect. After a few minutes of talking, introducing himself and complimenting most of the council members, the daimi finally clapped his hands, drawing everyone's attention. Let's eat. Hashiba ordered and everyone sat down. The daimi was at the end of the table with Madara, Sakura, his wife Yumi and his main son, Daiki, on his right. And to his left were Suzuki, Rumaji, Teisho, Riku and their respective wives. The rest of the table was occupied by various nobles or important people of Tan no Kuni. The dishes were brought by numerous servants who remained in the shadows watching the guests every move. A hand raised, and a waiter appeared to fill a cup. As soon as the first dishes were served Sakura noticed that Madara was gently placing her left arm on the table. Luckily the chopsticks for eating were one of a kind and didn't need to be cut up. Unless that was only invented in her time. Tell me. How long do you expect to stay with us? Hashiba asked in Madara's direction before taking a bite of his appetizer. We'll probably leave early tomorrow afternoon while we fill your treasury, Madara replied, enjoying his plate full of red tuna sashimi. After all, he had been eating nothing but soup, 
rice and cooked fish for almost three months. Sure, it was still fish, but this one was red, fatty and mixed with a little soy, it melted in his mouth to make a flavor explosion in his taste buds. How long before I see you again? No idea, I'll probably contact you like I did the first time, Madara replied glancing over at Sakura who was having a conversation with the Diomese wife. And if we ever need to contact you? Romaji asked this time from across the street. You'd better not contact us, Romaji-sama, I have no doubt that you are all capable of carrying out our project, Madara reassured him as he finished his plate. Good, Hashiba concluded before turning to Suzuki to discuss something else. Madara took his cup and raised it to his shoulder. Barely a second later, a servant was there filling it. When the servant was the right weight, Madara straightened two of his fingers to make the servant stop. Diamidano, Madara began before taking a sip of his drink. The taste was relatively sweet for a rice alcohol. The strength of it was very low, probably to get the guests through the meal. Yes Lord Dano? Hashiba asked as his plate was cleared away. For our company I think it would be wise to rename your capital. Madara announced before taking a second sip. It wasn't too bad, though he preferred the spirits made in the land of fire. Why is that? Romaji asked this time, dusting his mouth with a napkin. I must admit that I am puzzled by your advice, Lord Dano. You are going to be a neutral country, and for that we will make the world understand, Madara said in a low voice after looking around slightly. His words were overlaid by the din of the meal. Renaming your town would support this even more. Do you have a particular name? Suzuki asked before being interrupted by the arrival of the next dishes. A myriad of hot dishes were served all along the table for the diners to help themselves. Fish, shellfish, rice, vegetables and even kobe were laid out on the table. Madara noticed that all the dishes near him were either already pre-cut or the portions were small. He turned his gaze to Sakura and saw that she had a small, knowing smile on her face. Arigato, Madara said in Sakura's direction as the waiters set down the rest of the dishes. I don't know what you're talking about my lord, Sakura replied with a mischievous smile, then returned to her conversation with the Diomese wife. After the servants had set up everything, Madara spoke again. Yes, I've already thought about it, Haiwa, Madara said before taking a plate of kobe set before him. Haiwa, literally meaning, peace, Hashiba repeated, grabbing a few already opened shellfish. Let's see. Of course, it's not for now, but I think it would be a good thing for the future, Madara insisted, grabbing a tender piece of meat. The evening continued quietly in good spirits. Madara and the Daimi exchanged a few words from time to time, but it was nothing of great importance. As dessert approached Sakura gently placed her hand on Madara's, who had been silent for nearly two minutes. Are you all right? Sakura asked in a soft voice. Hi, Madara replied gently, turning his gaze to the assembly. You seem slightly distracted, Sakura insisted worriedly. Maybe it was the fact that she was relaxed, or maybe it was because Sakura had asked her to, but Madara leaned into her ear. I'm not very fond of this kind of event, I prefer our meals when we were together than when we were at your place, the dark-haired man whispered, not without taking a breath from Sakura's scent. It made the young woman blush a little to know that Madara enjoyed their one-on-one -on -one meal so much. Tell you what, it's almost over, Sakura whispered as the desserts finished being placed on the table. Then one of the guests stood up from the table with a glass in his hand. It was Daiki, the son of the Daimi, who seemed to want to make an announcement. My dear fellow members, ladies, my lords, mother, Daimi Dano, greeted Daiki before bowing his head as he turned to his father. He received a small nod from her, a sign that he accepted the announcement he had to make. It is a pleasure to see you all here together thanks to our Honorable Diami. A round of applause filled the room as all the guests approved of the young lord's words. But I would like to pay special tribute to a person who, without her, would not have made this evening such a success, said Daiki with a huge smile, his cheeks slightly pink, a sign that he had been drinking during the meal. I would like to honor a creature like I've never seen in my life who made me understand what it means to love. Hearing these words, Sakura had a very bad feeling as she watched the young man make a spectacle of himself. Then her fears were confirmed when she saw Daiki turn to her and raise a toast to her. Sakura Dano. 
You are a sight for sore eyes and I would like to toast our meeting, Daiki continued before raising his glass, followed by many at the table. The Daimi, Madara and the council were the last to raise their glasses as they all feared he would cause a diplomatic incident. I thank you Daiki-sama, Sakura replied using the proper politeness and a forced smile. She really didn't like this situation. May I ask that you allow me a walk in the gardens after dinner? Daiki tried to say, unintentionally chilling the atmosphere in the room, especially on Madara Uchiha's side. He felt jealousy creep over him, he was about to get up when he felt Sakura's hand holding him back in his seat. The young woman turned her gaze to Madara and gave him a tender smile, meaning that she was handling the situation. Of course this did not go unnoticed by the council and the daimyo who thought he should have a little chat with his son. Sakura moved her chair back and stood up, showing everyone her beautiful outfit. She flashed a bright smile before addressing Daiki in a melodious voice. At that moment Sakura couldn't help but think that she hated politics. Daiki-sama, your words fill my heart with warmth to know that I was able to make you understand the meaning of the word love, Sakura began as the guests looked on in admiration. However, I'm sorry, but I'm already promised to a suitor. These words surprised the entire assembly, especially Madara who didn't know she had a suitor. After all, she had always said that all suitors had shunned her and now she was saying the opposite. Was she lying to her? Who is he? I will go and challenge him to win the shore of your heart, Daiki said immediately, feeling himself grow wings from the audience and especially from the alcohol in his system. Far be it from me to disappoint you Daiki-sama, but my suitor is a shinobi and I unfortunately know that this is not your field of choice. Sakura said delicately as her sentence was a sort of insult about the fact that he didn't even know how to fight. But, if you feel capable of taking on someone of the caliber of the shinobi gods. Please, feel free to arrange whatever you think is right. This last sentence disturbed Daiki, but also Madara who was confused for other reasons. Was she referring to him as a shinobi god? Did she see him as a potential suitor? Or was he just an excuse to get out of the situation brilliantly? I think you've put yourself forward enough for tonight, son, Hashiba said, looking at her son, who wasn't doing so well. Ah. You're right, Daimyodano, Daiki bowed before sitting back down followed by Sakura. Then the Daimi clapped his hands again so that the meal could resume and the atmosphere around the table could relax. Dessert. Said Hashiba. I apologize, Sakura-sama, Yumi, Daiki's mother, whispered. I don't know what possessed my son to make such a statement. Don't worry Yumi-sama, it's not serious, Sakura replied with a smile before eating some grapes. I have no doubt that your son will one day find the woman who will fulfill him. Like any self-respecting mother, the red-haired woman added. I must say that the suitor you are destined for is very lucky. I don't know, Sakura laughed, imagining the man who would have the courage to conquer her heart. He'd better hold on tight to support her. The mother laughed with her, gently warming up the mood of the evening. Then, after a while, the Daimi finally announced the end of the meal, freeing all the guests for the evening. Daimi Dano, Sakura and Madara said at the same time. Good night to you both, the Daimi replied before leaving with his wife. The two shinobi walked quietly towards their flat. The corridors were silent as the night was already well underway and the majority of the residents of the Daimi's home were already asleep. After a few minutes they finally arrived at their two rooms. Have a good night Sakura-san, Madara said as he opened the door to his room. Who said you'd be sleeping alone in this room Madara-san? Sakura whispered before entering. Don't forget you haven't had your day's care. Madara followed the young woman into his room. From the outside it looked like a couple about to spend the evening together. The young woman approached the dark-haired man to help him remove his kimono. After a few moments, he found himself shirtless. Lie down, Sakura said pointing to the bed which was quite large. This was a lord's room, so it was only natural that the furniture was substantial. Once Madara was settled on the bed, Sakura joined him to begin their medical ritual under his watchful eye. Stop staring at me like that, Sakura whispered, feeling Madara's intense gaze on her for the past few minutes. Why? Madara whispered back as she found Sakura most beautiful tonight. It wasn't the same beauty as usual. 
She was always beautiful, but tonight she was overflowing with grace, with femininity that was mesmerizing to Madara. Because I'm embarrassed by it, Sakura said with a blush as she applied her IRY ninjutsu to the dark-haired man's arms. You shouldn't be ashamed of being a beautiful woman Sakura-san, Madara persisted as he loved to see the young woman blush in the candlelight. I didn't know you had a suitor. I lied and you know it, Sakura retorted as she finished her treatments. When she was done she stood up and walked to the screen in the room. She took off her kimono before making a poof of smoke appear in more comfortable clothes to spend the night. So it was in a pair of black silk pajamas that Sakura lay down beside Madara, exhausted. This day has drained me. Is it true what you told the daimi? Madara asked as the room was pitch black from the moment Sakura blew out the candle. What was that? Sakura asked not knowing what he was talking about. About women being more competent than a man in this medical art? Madara rephrased very curiously. Hi, you yourself could do what I do, but not at my level. Why not? Because you have huge reserves of chakra inside you, and to do irio ninjutsu you must have extraordinary chakra control. Control that is much easier to acquire by starting with little chakra. Also, this type of manipulation requires calmness and many men are prone to anger, Sakura explained. I understand better. Madara heard the young woman next to him yawn, a sign that she was really tired. Madara didn't know what was wrong with her, but he put his arm under the back of her neck to pull her closer to him. Without understanding what was happening to her Sakura found herself against Madara's chest in confusion. Good night. Sakura-san. Madara whispered before slowly falling asleep. Sakura didn't know what to do. She was in Madara's arms, her heart was racing as this was the first time she had been in this situation. But she couldn't deny the fact that she felt good in his arms. Safe. So she didn't struggle, she just made herself more comfortable and let Morpheus take her away. Good night. Chapter 16 Day 116 A feeling of warmth, of well-being, of security, that was what Sakura was feeling right now. She was asleep, and for some reason that was completely unclear to her, she hadn't slept this well since the time she was with her parents in Kanoha. In fact, it was a small repetitive noise that gently woke her from her sweet slumber. She blinked softly, the day was just beginning to dawn and several questions assailed her. Where was she? What had happened to her? Why did she feel so good? Then the pleasant sensation of warmth was answered in her head when she felt a torso she was leaning on rise with a breath. A tiny blush settled on her cheeks at the realization of where she was. She who had been chasing a one-sided love all her life, waking up in the arms of a man disturbed her. So it was half awake that Sakura heard a small, steady noise again. She didn't move, her brain hadn't yet analyzed the source of the noise. Normally, as a shinobi, Sakura would have reacted quickly to this abnormal noise. But she was fine in this position, she didn't want to move. This embrace made her feel good. It reminded her of the feeling of hugging her parents, plus the feeling of when she'd had the opportunity to hug Sasuke. Security. Love. Acceptance. Oneness. She had no idea, but for the first time since she had arrived in the Sengoku era, she felt peace in her soul. Then the noise started again, and she looked around and realized that it was the common sound of someone knocking on the door. Turning her gaze around the room she recognized the room provided for them at the Diomis. Ah yes, the Diomi. The thoughts returned to Sakura, the trip to the capital of Ta no Kuni, the meeting with the Diomi, the conversation with the maids, the meal, Madara's gesture just before falling asleep. Thinking back on this action, she wondered what it meant to Madara. Had he done this under the influence of alcohol? No, he had hardly had anything to drink that evening he had even refused to drink sake at the end of the meal. So Madara was in complete control of his emotions as he took Sakura in his arms. She was brought out of her thoughts when she heard the gentle tap on the bedroom door once again. She decided to stand up, but found herself restrained by a strong grip. Let them go Sakura-san. Madara whispered in a still sleepy voice, his eyes still closed. Maybe it's important, Sakura retorted softly. More important than resting? Madara asked. 
Maybe it's the Daimi, Sakura replied before finally getting up despite Madara's complaints about keeping Sakura pressed up against him. He had loved spending the night with this woman pressed up against him. In the past he had had many conquests that he only used for the pleasures of the flesh. And this was the first time Madara had slept with a woman, knowing that he hadn't even slept with her the night before. So it was a Sakura still dressed in her black silk pajamas who quietly made her way to the door. As she concentrated she felt two people with a very minimal chakra reserve. Either they were civilians or they were ninjas who were properly hiding their chakra. For safety Sakura conjured up a kanai in her right hand before yanking the door open. It was Hana and Amaya who gasped as the door opened to see Sakura wearing a cold stare. That look only lasted a second before it turned soft and pleasant, but it was enough for the two maids to see another side of Sakura, a killer. Gomen, Sakura said before she made her kanai disappear. Ohai Hana-san, Amaya-san. Ohai Sakura-sama. The two maids bowed with a small smile on their lips. After all Sakura was in the lord's room having designs on her. What can I do for you? Asked Sakura who was now awake. We were sent to prepare you for your day, Amaya replied quietly as she didn't want to wake the lord of the room who was probably still sleeping. For what? Sakura asked. Let's just say that yesterday's makeup ran a bit overnight, Hana smiled shyly as she hinted at a potential night of sex with Madara. Hana-san. Sakura snapped in a low voice as she took the hint. She glanced behind her and saw Madara still lying there. I'll be back in a moment. Take your time, Madara said as he slowly woke up in turn. So it was an embarrassed Sakura who closed the door behind her before being pulled by Hana and Amaya into the room opposite. A room that was supposed to be her bedroom at first. So. The blonde exclaimed a little too loudly for Sakura's taste, she was already embarrassed enough as it was. So what? Sakura asked as Amaya pulled her towards the dressing table. Her lord made his declaration after Daiki-sama declared himself at dinner. Hana asked before receiving a glare from Amaya. Hana. You can't ask that. Ah, uh, don't worry Amaya-san, I don't mind, Sakura quickly reassured her not wanting Hana to be punished for being nosy. And no, my lord hasn't declared himself to me in any way and as I said yesterday, it's not like that between us. Yet you spent the night with him, Hana retorted as she took a glove and dipped it in a container of water. Hi, Sakura confirmed as the blonde gently ran the wrung out glove over her face. She was gently removing the previous day's makeup that had run a little bit from being stuck to Madara's chest. But it's mostly because it's easier for me to protect him by being close to him. My lord doesn't seem like someone who needs protecting, Amaya retorted as she brushed Sakura's hair. I'm not just a warrior Amaya-san, I'm also a doctor, Sakura added, looking at the brunette in the mirror. A doctor? That's something very rare, Amaya said, she had never seen a doctor before, but had heard of them. People who could heal wounds with ointments and other medicines. Hi, my lord has had an injury and I must take care of him. In any case, madam was very beautiful yesterday and made an impact, said Amaya, recalling the events of the previous day. I owe it to you girls. Again, thank you, Sakura thanked as Hannah finished removing her makeup. Sakura-sama, I have a delicate question for you. I'm listening Hana-san, don't be ashamed, Sakura encouraged, but she realized she wished she had never asked that question. How do you feel about the man you spent the night with? Sakura tried but failed. She didn't know how she felt about the man in the other room. She wanted to say that she hated him because he was a bloodthirsty killer and a psychopath. But that would be a lie because he was not the man she had come to know. Every day the hatred she felt for him grew less and less until she saw less of this horrible man who started the Fourth Great Shinobi War. She had gradually learned to see him as a human being with values, dreams and a great destiny. He just needed guidance. I don't know, Hana-san. Do you love him? Hana continued. Did she love him? She didn't know, she had thought she had loved someone all her life, but from her teachings she didn't even know if it had been a real love. Although it was, it was a child's love, a teenager's love. What is love Hana-san? Sakura asked in return. Love? 
It's when you feel your stomach being filled with butterflies when you see your loved one, it's when you have a smug smile appear on your mouth whenever you think of them. It's when you can't stop thinking about him and his well-being, Hannah explained before being interrupted. I think she gets it, Hannah Chan, Amaya interjected, seeing that if she wasn't stopped, she was going to continue like this for a long time. But uh. Hannah pouted, which made Sakura laugh heartily. It felt so good to be among women and laugh like that. I once felt that way Hannah-san. But for my lord. I don't know, Sakura admitted, finally able to open her heart about her feelings to someone who wouldn't necessarily judge her. Why didn't it work? The blonde asked and automatically Sakura put her hand to her heart. The spot where Sasuke had stabbed her with his rinnegan. He. Let's just say he played with my feelings, Sakura said, lowering her eyes. I think that's why I can't love anymore. And I don't know where I stand. Gomen Sakura-sama, Hana said as she grabbed Sakura's hands. I'm sure one day you'll find a man who will turn your heart upside down and make you happy. We'll see, Sakura said with a small smile. The young woman sat up straight before removing her pajamas. Her belongings from the night before were laid out near the weapons rack. She walked over to the bed to put her pajamas down. Under the questioning eyes of the two maids, Sakura conjured up a new outfit in a puff of smoke. Magic! Amaya exclaimed in awe. Finjutsu Amaya-san, Sakura corrected as she took the time to get dressed. The tattoos I have on my forearms allow me to carry a lot of stuff around. What exactly is Finjutsu Sakura-sama? Hana asked genuinely curious and interested in what she had just seen. It's a shinobi art, said Sakura who knew that this art was very secret in the Sengoku era. Only ninjas knew about the shinobi arts. Can anyone do it? The blonde asked as Sakura walked over to the base to pick up her katana and strap it to her back. Yes and no Hana-san, it's more complicated than that, Sakura said before sealing all of her things in one of those seals. Once everything was put away she turned to the two maids. Again, thank you for all the girls. Sakura-sama. Do you mind if I give you a hug? Hana asked shyly. With a wide smile Sakura granted her request and hugged her. I'm going to miss you both, Sakura confessed as she held the blonde in her arms. I know we haven't talked much, but I've really enjoyed our time together. That's what friends are for, Hana said smiling. Friends? Sakura said foolishly, who, apart from Hitomi, had no friends at all. Hi. The blonde confirmed as she stepped aside to make room for Amaya. It was a pleasure to serve you ma'am, the more reserved brunette bowed. The pleasure is mine Amaya-san, Sakura smiled as she headed for the door. Take care of yourself. So it was with a light heart that Sakura left the room. She felt like she may have gained two new friends in the capital of Ta no Kuni. She opened the second door and saw Madara getting dressed in his fighter outfit. He seemed to be having some difficulty putting on the top of the kimono because of his half-assed left arm. Let me help you, Sakura said quickly as she approached. Ohai Sakura-san, Madara said as the pink-haired young woman slipped her arm inside his brown kimono. Did you sleep well? Ohai, Sakura replied, blushing at the memory of their night's sleep. Hi, I slept well, though I prefer the comfort of my bed. After all, as the saying goes, you sleep well in the king's house, but you never sleep as well as you do at home. After helping Madara put on his kimono and his two swords at his belt, they headed for the council chamber. On the way Sakura wondered what Madara was thinking. He didn't seem to be affected by last night at all, he was acting as if nothing had happened. Or maybe he was a better person than she was at dealing with his emotions. My lords, said one of the two guards in front of the large solid wood door. Your weapons please. As was protocol, they handed over their weapons to meet the daimi. The daimi was having breakfast with Suzuki and Rumaji. The three of them were up very early after a rather drunken evening. Daimi Dano, Ramaji-sama, Suzuki-san, Madara recited, bowing his head gently. Ah, Uchiha Dano, Hashiba greeted the three of them in turn. Did you two have a pleasant night? Restful, Madara replied before settling down at the table with Sakura. Great, Hashiba replied before eating a piece of fruit. 
Plates were already laid out on the table allowing Madara and Sakura to help themselves to fresh fruit for breakfast. Dayami Dano, is the person who teaches Finjutsu in your class competent? Sakura asked before eating a grape. They were very fresh and ripe to perfection, a sweet taste invaded Sakura's taste buds. He knows the basics, replied Ramaji who was sipping tea while reading a scroll. Upon hearing this answer, Sakura waved her hand to activate one of the seals, causing two scrolls to appear in a puff of smoke. This scroll Rumaji-sama is fireproof and will resist water. I advise you to put a lot of reserves inside it. However, keep an eye on it so that it doesn't get stolen. Then this one is an example that he can copy to allow you to make parcel post. Parcel post? Ramaji asked, looking up from his reading, suddenly intrigued. Hi, if you ever need to send a container, he can seal it in this little parchment that a carrier pigeon can carry. In the event that Daimidano has to pay for his neutrality, this will ensure the safety of the transport, Sakura explained as the two council members and Daimi looked on in awe. I thank you, said Ramaji as Sakura pushed the two scrolls towards the old man. Chests were brought in this morning for you to fill Sakura Dano. Arigato, Sakura said before standing up and walking over to the chests that lay against the wall. There were a dozen of them, quite large, that could only be carried by the strength of four men once filled. So it was under the gaze of four guards and the four people at the table that Sakura poured a stream of money into the first chest. She set her seal to flow quickly, wasting as little time as possible. The unmistakable sound of silver clashing filled the room, it was a beautiful and dangerous sight. For money could drive one mad, especially in large quantities. Men have gone mad to get more wealth and even killed people to take their property. After about thirty minutes, Sakura finished the task of filling the coffers making the nation of Ta no Kuni extremely rich. This had barely affected Sakura's reserves, for in almost a century, the elemental nations had expanded their wealth. Sakura turned to the daimi and held out her hand to him. Your ring please daimi Dano, Sakura asked. The daimi looked at Sakura for a moment before turning his gaze to Madara who nodded slightly in trust. So he removed his ring before giving it to the woman who turned back with one of his most prized possessions. He felt naked without it, for this ring was proof of his standing in the world. Sakura conjured up a new scroll and unrolled it on the floor. It was a rather intricate finjutsu seal that had a large circle in the center. She placed the ring in the center before making another series of seals. Finjutsu, Shringuk, Sakura intoned causing all the symbols on the scroll to disappear into the ring. She then turned to the chests and drew a kanji on each one. Once she had drawn all ten kanji, Sakura picked up the ring and put it on one of her fingers. She held out her fist, the seal of the ring pointing at the seal of one of the chests while her other hand was positioned in the ram's hand. Fin. Sakura sealed as she activated the finjutsu on the first chest. When she did so, a chakra connection was made between the ring and the chest. By doing this, no one could open the chests without having the diamese ring on their finger. Sakura repeated the action for the other nine chests, and then walked towards the diami. Returning the ring to its rightful owner, Sakura leaned over to Hashiba and whispered a few words. The chests can only be opened in the presence of your diami dano ring. This sentence shocked Hashiba, who had not expected it at all. This woman was becoming more and more surprising and he understood why Madara cared so much about her. Good. Daimi Dano, I have proven myself to be a competent person, will you allow me to give you one more gift that may save your life one day? Sakura asked. What is it? Hashiba asked, unable to deny that the young woman was more than competent in her field. I would like to apply a finjutsu seal to your skin. What for? Hashiba asked and Sakura moved closer to his ear again so that only he could hear. It may save you from death. Go ahead, the daimi agreed as the young woman conjured up some ink and a brush. Roll up your sleeve opposite your daimi dano ring. Once he had rolled up his sleeve, Sakura grabbed her brush and began to trace symbols and curves on the skin of his forearm in a series of intricate movements worse than calligraphy on parchment. Totally focused on her work, for she must not make any mistakes, Sakura did not notice that everyone present was following what she was doing with intense attention. 
Madara himself was also watching silently and very intrigued as they hadn't discussed the subject at all before. However, the dark-haired man knew that if she had decided to do this she had a good reason, he had to admit that he liked this kind of initiative from her. After thirty minutes, Sakura picked up her brush, stepped back for a moment to make sure she hadn't forgotten anything, and a slight satisfied smile stretched across her face. She looked Hashiba in the eye and announced. This may hurt a little, my lord, but it is so that it will not fade with time. The daimi nodded positively, encouraging Sakura to continue her work. Finn. Sakura sealed as she activated her IRY ninjutsu. The intricate patterns on the skin of her forearm began to move as they absorbed Sakura's healing chakra, effectively causing a small tickle, before gradually becoming an increasingly sharp pain. The daimi kept his jaws clenched to control the unpleasant sensation he felt as the ink penetrated his skin like a tattoo. The technique Sakura applied was different from what she did for Madara. The ones she applied to the Uchiha were temporary because they were not to conflict with the Tenketsu she was restoring at the same time. For five more minutes she remained silent and concentrated before judging that her work was sufficient. Is it done? Asked the daimi after this moment of silence. Hi, the day you're in a situation where you should die, the seal I drew will work, Sakura whispered before getting up to return to Madara's side and finish her breakfast. One last piece of advice Daimi Dano, Madara began as he finished eating a pear. Think big, don't make the mistake of underestimating what you're doing. When you're planning something, always think bigger than what you've planned. I will, Uchiha Dano, Hashiba agreed before breakfast continued in religious silence. A few hours later, Madara and Sakura were outside the capital. They had walked down the main road so that if anyone was following them they would be able to spot them. When they saw that they weren't, they went the shinobi way, with chakra. Very little chakra Madara-san, you just put in the necessary impulse. I'd rather we take more time than see you damage your legs, Sakura ordered Madara. Hi, the dark-haired man replied before he concentrated chakra into his legs, then directed it to his feet and particularly to the arches of his feet. In a second the two ninjas were no longer visible on the road. Because of their skills they had just moved very quickly in a good way and it would be like that for the rest of the day. Five days of travel compacted into one day in shinobi fashion. Low level, but ninja method nonetheless. Madara-san, now that we're out of the capital, Sakura began, watching Madara's expression for pain. What do you think of the daimi and the council members? The daimi will honor his commitments, he's a man who has lost a lot to get where he is, and he really wants peace, Madara explained as he jumped from tree to tree. Ramaji is the one who is most suspicious of me. Why is that? Sakura asked in surprise. He's old, so he's experienced, and he's seen a lot of coups, rebellions, and betrayals. So I can't blame him for being suspicious of me, the dark-haired man argued. Even though I made a blood seal, he's wary. He would have made an excellent shinobi. Because of his paranoia. I agree with you 100% Sakura-san, I don't think he'll go behind our backs, he has too much to lose, Madara reflected as he ran through a valley due to the lack of trees. He was putting chakra into his legs this time so as not to damage them from the fast movement. What makes you so confident that he won't betray us? He is old, very few people reach his age. I agree, old wolves can still bite, but an old wolf like him is usually loyal to his pack. So he will be loyal to his daimi. So if we keep our promises, he'll keep his, Sakura concluded after Madara's argument. That's right, he's a key player for the daimi. From what I understand, he seems to have a lot of connections in Tano Kuni and around the world, even though I'd never heard of him before. Some people are good at not talking about themselves, Sakura said, referring to her and her mother, though technically that was a semi-lie because they didn't exist at that time before her time travel. As for Teisho Nakamura, your threat was perfect to ensure his complete loyalty. Saying that you'll always pay more couldn't have worked better for a man who lives only for money. Sakura felt a surge of pride that she had had a good idea, but Madara had also complimented her. And this man very rarely gave compliments, especially to a woman. What about Rika Koyabashi? Sakura asked as he approached a cliff. Sakura quickened her pace slightly so that she could pick Madara up in her arms, just before she jumped off. 
It was nearly 20 meters high. She landed after a few seconds of falling below, making a crater on the landing which she easily cushioned with her chakra. She immediately put Madara down and they resumed their journey. Riku already proved his loyalty to the Daimi when he chose Hashiba during the Muromachi Wars, Madara explained, jumping back onto the branches of a tree and propelling herself. Then Tsubasa. That's special. Why is that? He's just a farmer who's made his mark in business. Do you think he could be a problem? Sakura anticipated, knowing that traitors could be found anywhere and especially where they were least expected. I don't know, he's a simple man, but you never really know people, Madara said and he thought of Sakura as he said this. He had spent months with her from morning to night, but she was still a mystery to him. She had a lot of secrets and her past was really hazy. To be watched. As for Daiki. He's a jerk. Madara said matter-of-factly, she hadn't appreciated the statement he had made toward Sakura. If he almost risks a diplomatic incident like yesterday, I can't imagine what he might inadvertently do in the future. He is young. Youth has nothing to do with it. You're practically the same age and you've got more gumption than he does, you've even got more balls than that weirdo, Madara said forcefully, not realizing the compliment he'd just paid. I hope he doesn't think with his trousers on in the future. Sakura couldn't think of anything to complain about, and she didn't want to either. The hours passed in silence and dusk approached as they finally arrived home. They both went into the house and Sakura busied herself preparing dinner while Madara lit candles in the main room. He'd gotten his bearings since living in this house. As Sakura set up her equipment to prepare dinner, Madara came and sat at the center table in the kitchen. He had been in the habit for some time, he enjoyed spending time with the woman so much that he even came to watch her cook. When do you think we'll be able to start real training? Madara asked as Sakura put rice in boiling water. Shinobi training. Sakura asked to make sure what the dark-haired man was asking. Did you have any pain on the trip? Sakura asked as she peeled off a unsealed fish. God she loved the finjutsu. No, I think you saved me from the only part where I could have hurt myself, Madara replied, remembering the cliff where Sakura had hugged him. Damn, he could hate that feeling of weakness. Probably within a fortnight, I expect to have you doing chakra exercises, Sakura replied and this drew a very slight smile from Madara. Who taught you the finjutsu? Madara asked as he saw this woman using it daily. Whether it was for medicine, transportation, even cooking she used it. My mother taught me medical finjutsu, but as for the rest I was alone and self-taught, Sakura admitted with pride. Thanks to her intelligence, she was able to understand finjutsu in a way that few people could boast. Only the Uzumaki or Minato Namikes would be above her, but only because they were virtuosos. But in time, Sakura knew she would become someone renowned in the art. Are you sure your mother wasn't affiliated with the Uzumakis for you to have this affinity with Finjutsu? Because after all, it is known that Finjutsu was like an extension of their body for the Uzumaki. I'm sure it was. Who was that woman at the end? Chapter 17 Day 130 Training is the activity that every self-respecting shinobi does in almost all his free time. He trains in order to keep his body in shape, both physically and mentally. He develops his body to go beyond its limits, to push his body to the extreme, so that it knows how to react when it is exhausted. Because it's easy to anticipate an enemy when you're fresh. But when you've been fighting for hours, your chakra reserves are at their lowest and your weaponry is only a few weapons, you only have your mind and your intelligence to get through. So the shinobi trains, so that his body reacts automatically, he trains his eyes to see what the common mortal would not see, he works his vision to deduce and see the next movements of his opponent. Because training is not only physical, of course, your body needs a muscle memory in order to follow the orders of your brain. But it is your brain that will make your physical training useful. With a visual memory, you will be better able to dodge projectiles, you will more easily analyze your opponent's style to counter it. All your hard work is for one thing only, to kill as quickly as possible so that you live. Because once you are dead, you are useless. So Madara was getting tougher, he had spent his life doing this, so it was normal for him to constantly improve. Under Sakura's supervision they had been training for a few hours now. 
They had started with warm-up exercises, then physical exercises, without the use of chakra with the intention of strengthening his body like anyone else. Madara was someone who had fought all his life, trained since he was a kid to be one of the best, but he never thought he would ever meet someone as crazy as he was. Sakura Haruno was the epitome of what one could call a torturer in her demands. She knew when to make him stop so he wouldn't get hurt, but she knew moves and placements that worked his muscles more effectively than his old routines. It was painful, but he could feel his body working twice. No, three times as hard because of what Sakura was teaching him. Her understanding of the human body was a real advantage in developing himself. The first few days they'd been running together she'd agreed to keep up with him because he'd only just come out of recovery, but that was over now. Doing a set of squats, stopping in the middle to gain muscle before moving on to an abdominal exercise. It was something unorthodox, but it had the merit of working his whole body to prepare him for any situation. But there was something that infuriated Madara during these exercises. She was doing them at the same time as him and he felt like a fool against her. They were doing a series of push-ups, she was going lower than him and while he was using both arms, she was only using one. They placed a rock in each of their hands and held them at arm's length for as long as they could. Except Sakura's were twice as heavy as hers. All the exercises they performed were better than his. By her position, by her sheathing, by her load, by her suppleness, by her agility but also because of her arrogant smiles doubled by her remarks. For Sakura had understood that Madara was a very proud person, so what better way to motivate such an energetic person than to make him feel weak. It worked, he didn't give up and gave it his all, but his self-esteem took a hit. I bet I can outlast you Madara-san, Sakura taunted in a sheathing position with Madara in front of her. Both of them were covered in sweat from the exertion. We'll see about that, Madara growled back. This was what training was all about, but that was only because she was in great shape while he had to regain everything he had lost from all that time in bed. However, Madara recognized that there were some things he couldn't match, her strength and flexibility. Sakura even surprised him at times, leaving him speechless at some of her demonstrations. Then the time for chakra training began. He was forbidden to use the chakra in his left arm, as it was not fully healed. He could do physical exercises with it, but no channeling was allowed. He began with the exercise of climbing trees with his chakra. Compared to their journey home where he used a simple propulsion of his energy, here he had to maintain it. It was however very easy for him to manage to climb the tree, it was second nature to him. He let the chakra invade his legs before transferring it to his feet in a continuous manner. He climbed quietly before finding himself upside down, he looked at the young woman who strangely enough had a smile on her face. Here are the rules of the game Madara-san, Sakura announced before pulling out some kunai. She also picked up a stone from the ground. No parrying the projectiles, you must only dodge, but. But? Madara continued, looking at the young woman who threw her stone in the air before retrieving it several times. You are not allowed to move your feet from where they are. If you manage to do so, I agree to answer one of your questions. Whatever it is. Sakura announced, knowing that Madara would do anything to get this opportunity. And indeed, she wasn't wrong as a look of pure determination crept across his features. Sakura threw her stone next to Madara, only she put a lot of chakra into her shot, making the stone very difficult to dodge. A loud crash was heard behind Madara who turned his head. The stone had gone through a trunk behind him and his eyes widened slightly. This woman was out of her mind. Ready? Sakura asked before starting to throw stones. And Madara did his best to avoid the projectiles. The young shinobi was a totally unpredictable person and thankfully he had experience. She sent projectiles of varying degrees of power, from several angles, several at a time forcing him to take sometimes crazy positions. She's a total sadist. Madara grumbled to himself after about 30 minutes of dodging everything. He was sweating and thankfully he was using his chakra to enhance and support his body physically. He would occasionally use his Sharingan for a second to read the trajectory of the stones. After a while Sakura was running out of ammunition and Madara realized that he had potentially won. 
A smile played on his lips but quickly faded as he saw Sakura pick up a rock that was literally his size before throwing it in his direction. What a bitch! Madara swore as she saw the rock. She had no intention of letting him win. This piece of cliff was in no way dodgeable, it was destined to make him lose. It was too big and even with complex placement it would hit. But that was not knowing Madara. Especially when he was motivated to get what he wanted. The Uchiha clan leader quickly channeled wind chakra into his right hand so that it became as sharp as a weapon. He struck the branch on which he had been hanging from the beginning. The branch did not resist under the power of the strike and fell, attracted by gravity, Madara included. No sooner had he fallen towards the ground than he saw the rock pass over him at the very spot where he had been standing. As he landed on solid ground, he did a somersault to catch himself. Then a huge crashing sound was heard, a sign that the rock had broken against an obstacle. Madara walked toward Sakura, who didn't seem to be very happy that he had succeeded. So with a cocky smile Madara stood right in front of her. This was his first victory over the young woman since they had been training and he intended to enjoy it. The young woman crossed her arms and looked away in annoyance. The dark-haired man brought Sakura's face up to look at him as he placed his hand on her chin, it was a gesture he'd been making relatively often lately. Even if your pout is the most adorable. You owe me an answer. Madara said with a smile. Humph. Well. But the training isn't over yet. Sakura pouted. Then without warning Sakura started to run again. Either she was a workaholic, or her teachers were bullies to get her used to such a level of intensity. But he wasn't someone who was going to complain, especially when it came to training. They left Sakura's garden and headed into the valley, but not without saying hello to the people working in the rice fields. After a while they reached the bottom of the valley where there was a lake. Once at the edge Sakura didn't slow down and continued to channel her chakra under her feet to run across the water followed by the brunette. How are you feeling? Sakura asked as she turned back to the Uchiha. I feel fine, Madara answered immediately, though he felt his body trembling slightly after the exercises he had done, and Sakura didn't miss it. When you channel your chakra into your feet consistently, do you feel every muscle as it passes through? Sakura asked. What do you mean by that? Madara questioned, he had never asked himself that question. When you focus on your coils, you feel your energy flowing through your body, right? Sakura explained in a different way. Our chakra is connected to our bloodstream, to our muscles, so I'd like you to focus on your legs, Sakura asked before seeing the dark-haired man close his eyes and concentrate. In order to work properly, our muscles need energy which is provided by the food we eat every day. However, as a scientist has shown, nothing is created, nothing is lost, everything is transformed, Sakura explained as Madara concentrated. And our muscles do the same thing, the energy they use to make them work turns into waste. And that's why your body is shaking right now. Because your muscles have almost reached their limit. I am not. Weak. I know, Madara-san. Sakura anticipated as she got to know the Uchiha. Nevertheless, to counteract this, we shinobi are taught to support our muscles with our chakra system, thus slowing the process. Except that from my point of view, this is a waste of chakra. What would you do then? Madara questioned, he had done this all his life, even everyone he knew had always done it the same way. All you have to do is use a tiny amount of chakra to get rid of the waste produced by your muscles. That way you'll save energy, but you'll still be 100% physically, Sakura explained, and thanks to Tsunade she had discovered a new way to fight. That's interesting, Madara admitted, managing to understand what Sakura meant. Anyone of standard intelligence wouldn't have understood, but Madara wasn't just anyone, he was a virtuoso, with an unusual intelligence and an ability to retain and analyze information. He then sent chakra into his muscles to clean them as the young woman had advised. Soon he felt better, his muscles stopped shaking and a feeling of rest came over him. Chakra is amazing, everything can be done with chakra. Strengthen our muscles, support them, regulate our body temperature and so much more, the young woman nodded, still in the middle of the lake. Can we increase the source of his chakra tenfold? Madara asked suddenly. Sakura didn't answer right away, 
because that would force her to talk about the Hashman gates, the heavenly gates of the human body. But after a moment's thought Sakura decided to tell him. Hi, focus on your chakra again, but this time on where it comes from, Sakura guided. Can you feel it? Hi, I can feel it coming from several places in my body, Madara confirmed as he felt it coming from eight separate points. These sources of chakra are what I call gates, our system is regulated by these sources, Sakura explained as she felt the brown man play with the flow of his energy. Can we increase these sources tenfold? Madara asked interestedly. Yes. Opening these gates increases the flow of chakra in the body tenfold, allowing the user to access a colossal amount of physical energy and overcome the limitations of their body. Sakura elaborated, remembering how Meido Jie and Rock Lee had used them against Madara during the Fourth Great Shinobi War. But there is a but. Madara realized, opening his eyes. There is indeed a but. A downside. The user suffers a backlash that results in extreme fatigue and wear and tear. Furthermore, if the opening of the doors is not properly mastered, it can cost the user their life, Sakura replied, remembering Meido Ga who after two years was still in a wheelchair for opening the eight heavenly doors. Have you ever seen anyone use them, am I right? Madara asked, seeing the look on her face made him realize that this was indeed the case. Is that your question Madara-san? Sakura asked. He thought for a moment, did he really want her to answer that question when the answer was completely obvious? No, he didn't. Good, Sakura finally cut in before moving into a taijutsu stance as the Uchiha looked on in amazement. With her right hand positioned forward she motioned for the brunette to approach. Show me what the legendary Uchiha Madara is worth. Madara hated war, he only wanted peace, but a lifetime of training, fighting, battles and wars, after a while, you like fighting. With a smile on his face, the Uchiha charged the young woman to get a glimpse of her skills after all this time. Once in range, Madara jumped forward. Seeing this, Sakura jumped back and deflected with her hands, one, two, three, for quick kicks directed at her chest. By the time he landed on the ground Sakura guided her right fist towards Madara's face who tilted his trunk backwards, dodging the blow. As he ducked backwards the experienced eye of the shinobi saw the young woman's leg move to sweep him off his feet. He took advantage of the momentum of her swing to finally do a back somersault not without kicking Sakura twice in the chest as she recoiled from the impact. He landed on all fours, channeling chakra into his hands to keep from sinking into the water. He used the momentum of his bent legs to close the gap between them. Madara aimed his right arm at Sakura's face and she swung it downwards. He coupled the momentum of his body and the one given by the young woman to put both hands on the ground and do a cartwheel. His right foot parried, but the second one hit Sakura's cheek and she toppled over under the power. She cursed Madara and the Uchiha clan style that relied on the strength of the opponent and the strength given by the enemy's blows. Sakura charged back, once again targeting the Uchiha's head, which once again flew backwards. To prevent him from doing a somersault again, she struck with her other fist right into his thigh. Unable to do any acrobatics, Madara used his free leg to strike the young shinobi's face as she leaned forward while bending her legs. In a crouch, she used the strength of her legs to direct her fist at Madara's chin in hopes of landing an uppercut. Damn Sharingan! She saw that it was activated for a second, allowing his to dodge her hook. Nevertheless, she took advantage of the propulsion her legs gave her to leap into the air and place both feet towards Madara's torso, who stepped back a meter. He didn't waste a moment and attacked Sakura's upper body again, she bent over once more. Unfortunately for him, Sakura never seemed to do the same thing twice and she penetrated his guard to strike at his right pectoral. Madara saw the second fist coming straight for his stomach and decided to use his strength to stop it. The two fists collided and Madara immediately regretted his choice. She was stronger than he was and he felt the vibrations of the blow through his entire arm. He didn't dwell on the sensation and took advantage of their proximity to strike once at Sakura's stomach, a second time towards her chest. Before landing a quick blow to her left forearm, followed by her triceps before hitting her stomach again with his knee. The blow to her stomach sent her reeling forward, he was about to continue when Sakura grabbed his right arm at the wrist and struck his torso with her flat chakra-laden palm. 
the force of the blow propelled him several feet away from her. She caught her breath and saw during this short exchange that Madara was better than her in pure taijutsu. If she could use her chakra she would be very dangerous, but for today, in this friendly confrontation where only pure skill was being used, he was dominating her. Despite her speed and flexibility, he was definitely better than her. As the dark-haired man did a salto to break his fall, Sakura applied her IRY ninjutsu to her stomach. This last blow had been violent and she hadn't expected it. Madara walked quietly closer to the young woman. He had loved this fight, the blows exchanged, the adrenaline coursing through his body, all his senses heightened by the fight. He hadn't fought for very long, but it was enough for Madara to understand a few things about this woman, she was dangerous and not to be taken lightly. Yes he had dominated her, but this was just a small taijutsu match and he was looking forward to the day when she would give it her all. Using then the whole range of shinobi, weapons, ninjutsu, taijutsu, genjutsu, finjutsu. Is everything alright Sakura-san? Madara asked slightly worried as she saw her healing. Hi, your last blow was pretty nasty, Sakura said before covering her stomach with her red top. What should I say about your last strike? That'll teach you to use your Sharingan to cheat. I have no idea what you're talking about, Madara feigned with a small smile on his face. Sakura tapped him on the shoulder for cheating, nothing aggressive, in fact it was a friendly gesture. Come on, that'll do for today Madara-san, Sakura said, also smiling. No pain to report. My right arm, you hit hard, Madara remarked as the young woman applied her IRY ninjutsu to detect any sign of injury. I warned you never to use force against me, Sakura replied, seeing what the problem was. HN. All the while, the villagers who were working in the rice fields had all stopped their activities to watch the two shinobi fight. It was fabulous and at the same time so frightening. To know that someone could walk on water, fight with such ease, hit so hard that you felt like an insect facing the moon. When I grow up I will be like Lord Sama. Said a little boy, watching the two protagonists move on the water. I'll be like Sasukura Sama. She's so strong. Said a little girl with blonde hair. But she's not as strong as Lord Sama, retorted the little boy. That's not true. You saw how Sakura-sama pushed Lord Sama away from her. The girl defended. Both had stars in their eyes as they watched the two shinobi disappear from their sight. The day passed without any other significant events for the villagers, who returned to their work as dusk approached. After a good bath each, the two protagonists lit the candles in the house in anticipation of the night that would soon fall. Afterwards, Sakura put a vinyl record on the gramophone before heading to the kitchen to prepare dinner. She was dressed once again in white trousers, but had decided to put on a turquoise jumper that left her shoulders clear. After all, it was autumn, the leaves on the trees were many different colors and the temperature had dropped as well. As for Madara, he had on his usual black kimono with a white neckline and sat down at the kitchen counter, as he had been doing for some time. He was enjoying his time with the young shinobi more and more. She was easy to talk to and every topic she discussed with him was informative. She was open-minded, intelligent and also took the time to listen to his views on every subject. He couldn't cook, he'd never learned, he didn't see the point anyway. There had always been someone to cook for him. Whether it was a cook, a maid, a woman or even his mother, it had never been his role to do housework and that was not going to change tomorrow. But he loved Sakura's company, so he watched her prepare the meal while he remembered one of his mother's phrases. It will be hard for you to think of any other woman but her when you find her. While Sakura was preparing the meal, Madara was deep in thought. He was thinking of what question to ask the young woman. There were so many topics he wanted to discuss with her, but she was so secretive that he had to choose. He could understand that her past was painful for not wanting to talk to her about it, but it was so frustrating. Should he ask a question about her mother's origins and thus get the missing elements of her knowledge? For if it was true, Tsunade Haruno came from a continent other than the elemental nations. Should he ask a more detailed question about who her sensei had been? For someone who trained someone of Sakura's caliber could only be known, but he didn't know any Kakashi. Then he found. I have my question, Madara announced, interrupting Sakura's gesture for a moment. 
She had hoped he would forget about the bet, but she had only one word. Fine, but I reserve the right to refuse once if the question is too difficult for me, Sakura demanded, not wanting to bring up certain topics. The name of the one who destroyed those you love, Madara asked as he saw the pain in the young woman's eyes. He didn't want to hurt her, but he wanted to know so badly, he wanted to know the name of this Uchiha who had dared to do this. Sakura looked into his eyes for a few seconds, before they became a long minute. Another question. Please, Sakura begged, she wasn't ready to answer this question. When she looked at Madara she couldn't bring herself to tell him that it was actually him. Madara didn't say anything and went back into his thoughts once more to find another question. Perhaps knowing where she got the knowledge of the Kage Bunshin would be a good question. Or maybe ask her if she had belonged to a clan. Or maybe. My question is, where exactly did you come from to seek asylum? And I want a precise and detailed answer. Madara announced, remembering his conversation with Hitomi. She had told him that Sakura had come to Ta no Kuni seeking asylum. Sakura continued to cut her piece of red tuna into fine sashimi, then placed them on a small wooden plate. She placed a ballonet on the plate and took out two pairs of chopsticks. She placed everything in the center of the counter before heading for a cupboard. She returned with two small glasses and a white bottle before settling down. As soon as she opened the bottle Madara knew what it was, alcohol. She poured the clear liquid into the two glasses and placed one in front of Madara. She didn't even wait for him to take it before she gulped hers down before making a face. God she loved the burning sensation in her throat, as well as the taste that assaulted her taste buds. As Madara brought the glass up to his nostrils Sakura poured herself a second glass, then set the bottle down. She looked into Madara's eyes, her gaze was heavy with pain at what she was about to reveal. At least that's what Madara understood, for Sakura was thinking of a plausible lie that would be a half-truth. I'm from Hai no Kuni, Sakura began as the Uchiha took a sip of the drink. It was good, it was even excellent, he had never had such delicious sake in his life. This bottle must have cost a fortune, but that shouldn't be a concern for this woman. Where exactly? Madara asked as he dipped his chopsticks into the soy sauce before grabbing a piece of sashimi. About twenty kilometers from Hai no Terra Temple, Sakura continued before grabbing a piece of sashimi herself. It was a small, mundane village. My parents were people who traveled constantly to learn new things. They. When mother got pregnant with me, it became too dangerous to travel and it would become even more so when I was born. The war. Madara remarked as the young woman poured herself a third drink and drank it down once more. Hi, having a child during the provincial wars is not the most advisable thing to do. So they decided to settle in isolation from the rest of the world. The land of Hai no Terra was a neutral place that every ninja respected. So, settling close to this place was perfect for my parents, Sakura said before getting up to watch the rest of the dinner slowly cooking. But. During their journey, mother and father made friends, but also enemies. Was your sensei Kakashi one of them? Madara asked as he finished his cup of sake. Hi, he was a close friend. Sakura replied, thinking back on her relationship with Kakashi, the four of them had become great friends, Naruto, Sasuke, Kakashi and herself. So even though they had been hiding out in the middle of nowhere, they found them. Black Zetsu and that other Uchiha? Madara asked, already knowing the answer, but not the name of this Uchiha. Hi, Sakura whispered and picked up the empty wooden plate and put it in the sink. She stood there, looking at the sink as she thought of her loved ones who no longer existed, and the tears rolled down her cheeks once more. The fatigue of the day, the half-truths, the daily stress of knowing that the future was in her hands, the loss of her loved ones, all of which was heightened by the alcohol, made her break down. Madara was not an expert at showing affection or comforting people. But seeing the young woman tremble slightly with sadness made him react without realizing it. He stood up and walked towards the young woman. He gently turned her towards him before taking her in his arms. And she cried. Against him, silently. Chapter 18 At that moment Sakura didn't know what to do. She was cracking under the accumulation of everything that was happening to her. 
she had lost everyone she cared about, she had to live in a patriarchal era, she had to change the world and its future to bring true peace. But the worst part of it all. She had to look into the eyes of the person responsible for her pain every day, to care for him, to support him, to teach him to walk again and to guide him to fulfill his destiny. Having to put aside all his crimes, all his future folly, while having to get to know him. Sakura was smart, but so was Madara, and one day he might figure out her little trick, he'd find out that she'd been lying to him all along, that she'd somehow manipulated him into doing what she wanted. And by extension, what the wicked Sennin wanted. Hating the man viscerally, she was sure it would have been hard to get anything good out of him while knowing what he had done in her future. But. That was before she knew the man behind the psychopath, he was obviously a completely different person. As Sakura lay in Madara's powerful arms, she let herself feel the pain. She was tired of holding it all in, she needed to get it out. He could judge her, criticize her, but she needed to let her pain flow. So it was with her head buried in Madara's black kimono that Sakura wept with all her being. Her body was shaking, her hands were gripping the garment tightly, causing it to crumple slightly. Every now and then, out of desperation, she gave Madara's chest a little tap. Why? Sakura whispered between sobs. She wasn't asking Madara in particular, but rather the universe. Why her? Why did this all have to fall on her and not someone else? Why? Sakura asked and suddenly began to scream in despair. The Uchiha didn't move, he was completely paralyzed by the situation. He had seen fellow shinobi break down under the pressure of being a shinobi before, but he had never had to comfort anyone. He didn't know what to do, he didn't know what to say either. So he did what his mother always did for his father when he came home from a battle, he held her tightly to him. He had never cried, not even when his father was killed in front of his eyes, nor when his mother died of illness, nor when Tobarama killed his brother. He had never cried with sadness. But he had cried with rage. For months ago he would have thought Sakura's attitude was totally weak and that it was related to her being a woman, but that was before he knew her. She was a strong woman, who didn't let herself be defeated and who, like him, had to know the hard reality of life. So he said nothing and let the young woman cry out in despair in his arms. He made those gestures that his mother used to make, he gently stroked her back with one hand and gently ran the fingers of his other hand through her hair. He gradually spread his chakra around him to calm and comfort her. He understood that she needed to somehow empty what was inside her, so he didn't burst his chakra like last time, he gave her time. Why me? Sakura shouted and Madara felt his heart clench with so much pain. Why was her condition affecting him so much? Why did he feel the need to help her so much? Why did he want to know the reason for her grief and pain so badly? Why did he want to get the people responsible so badly? Because life is a bitch, Madara whispered, holding her a little tighter to him. Somehow he understood Sakura's question. Why does she always have to take away the people who are close to us? Why does she always have to take away the people we love? It's not fair. Sakura said with a broken voice. Hi, agreed Madara, who was one of the people best placed to understand her. But it's because life is unfair that we fight. I'm tired. Of. Fighting, Sakura cried, she couldn't take the pressure, the loneliness anymore. She wanted to see all the people she loved again, to hold them close. Do you want to make the sacrifice of your loved ones so much more futile? Madara asked in Sakura's ear. No. But what's the point of fighting? When you have nothing left, Sakura continued. Life is a bitch, Sakura-san, it puts us through many trials throughout our lives, Madara explained, still stroking the young woman's back. And it's up to us to overcome them. And. Sakura was slowly calming down thanks to Madara's chakra and presence. It was ironic to tell you that the person responsible for your suffering was also responsible for your well-being. And. Sakura whispered as she slowly loosened her fists and began to enjoy the shinobi's proximity. And you're not alone. Madara admitted after a short moment. What? What do you mean? Sakura asked confused. However, she got no answer, except for a more comforting hug. Something different than just a friendly hug. 
even without words, it seemed to have a deeper meaning. Indeed, he would have liked to tell her that she had him, that he would avenge her on those who had hurt her, but he had too much pride to express it openly. Close your eyes. They remained in this position for many minutes. Madara gradually increased his presence with his energy allowing the young woman to pull herself together. She forgot for a moment who he was and concentrated on the feeling of well-being that was gradually invading her. She had again that feeling of protection that only her father could provide, accompanied by a wave of love. Goman. She pulled herself out of his embrace before wiping her cheeks with her opaline green jumper. She was somehow ashamed of having fallen for him, so she didn't look him in the eye and returned to her kitchen. The poppy yotes she had prepared were almost ready. Please, Madara replied, wanting to continue the embrace. He returned to his seat and poured himself another glass of sake. He enjoyed the smell of it once more before drinking it straight down like Sakura had done. Usually he preferred to savor the alcohol, but with his thoughts completely messed up he needed a pick-me-up. It'll be ready soon Madara-san, Sakura said with the occasional sniff. Sakura-san. Hi. Said the concerned girl without turning from her preparation. Who taught you to drink like that? Asked Madara who was very surprised to see a woman with such an easy way down. Have you never seen a woman drink? Sakura retorted with a touch of humor. This had the desired effect, as the dark-haired man laughed, which made the young woman smile. Yes, I've seen women drink before, but not this much, Madara said delighted to see her smile. Mother. Sakura said thinking back to all her evenings with Tsunade Senju. She was an alcoholic and could bed anyone when it came to alcohol. The number of times she had seen Tsunade drunk dead. Whether it was from overwork, the loss of Jiraiya or just for fun. These memories brought a delicate smile to her face. She would have gotten along well with my brother. Did he drink a lot? Sakura asked as she opened the poppy yotes and poured them onto two plates. Once he was so drunk I caught him courting a flower, Madara laughed as he recalled the memory. He missed his brother terribly, but these pleasant moments had a way of making him smile. In fact, Sakura laughed. I can't imagine an Uchiha seducing a flower. It must be worth its weight in gold, Sakura imagined, she was actually feeling better because of what Madara was doing, making her laugh. I'll admit I blackmailed him and laughed at him for a long time, Madara laughed as he watched the young woman place a plate in front of his eyes and sit down next to him. It was a plate of vegetables with white fish. How is your brother Madara-san? Sakura asked as she picked up her pair of chopsticks. Itadakimasu. Itadakimasu, Madara said in turn before picking at his plate. God she could cook well. Was. He's no longer of this world. Goman. Let's just say my brother was the smilliest of the five of us, Madara confessed. Five? Mother gave birth to five brothers, Madara explained, and then went back to her memories. A slight pall of sadness settled in his eyes before he buried the feeling deep inside. Since I'm the oldest and he's the youngest, he may have taken it upon himself to support me, and he couldn't think of anything better than to make me smile in every situation. He seemed like a good person, Sakura remarked as she popped a piece of carrot in her mouth. Yes and no, he could be a complete idiot at times, Madara replied, remembering his many foolishness. I guess it runs in the family then, Sakura added sarcastically. H.N. Saki. Madara said before pouring himself another cup of sake. Please, Sakura nodded as the dark-haired man filled her cup. Did you have any siblings? Madara asked before savoring his glass of alcohol as opposed to Sakura who swallowed it in one gulp. I'm an only child and I think it's for the best. Father had enough problems with two women in the house, Sakura said, causing Madara to laugh again. I can't imagine the poor man having to put up with two women like you, the dark-haired man joked as he slowly felt the alcohol relax him. He wasn't someone who drank often, as it altered the mind and as a ninja he had to be on top of his game at all times. But the situation meant that he could afford a little drink. He never complained about it anyway. How were your other brothers Madara-san? Sakura continued, her face slowly starting to heat up. I don't remember much. The war took them away from us too quickly, 
the Uchiha replied, remembering the conflict against the Senju clan. What were your parents like? Sakura questioned, very interested in learning about these aspects of the man's life beside her. You seem very curious Sakura-san. Let's just say I'd like to know the people who made you who you are today. His parents? It was a subject he hadn't discussed in many years. His father had died on the field of honor defending the ideals of the Uchiha clan, and his mother was taken by disease. He still remembered what his father had said to him just before he died, you only become an adult when your parents are gone. He would have preferred to be proud of his sons, but no, he always did everything to toughen them up or lecture them, even at the point of death. His father had done everything to make his children powerful in order to protect those who would be dear to them. But what was the point? Madara was now alone, his parents and brothers were dead. And the members of his clan turned their backs on him despite his warnings and those of his brother Izuna. Recalling all these memories Madara poured himself another glass of sake and drank it down for the second time, he needed it. Father was. Madara began before sighing as he refilled his glass. A very proud man. Honor and family came before everything else. His whole life was about the clan and its safety. At the same time, he was the leader. Like many clan leaders. Father and Butsuma Senju, Hashirama's father, were both fanatics. Their clans were borderline religious to them, so much so that any friendship I might have had with Hashirama was considered heresy, the clan leader recounted before toasting his new drink with Sakura. I'll remember for the rest of my life the right I took for not killing Hashirama when I was younger. I think your childhood was more difficult than mine, Sakura admitted as she recalled her childhood which was in a time of peace and covered in love. She had lived in the security and tenderness of a family. I didn't really have a childhood Sakura-san. Being the son of a clan leader imposes certain responsibilities. Having a front row seat to the cruelty of the world makes you grow up fast. And that's why I decided to bring peace, the dark-haired man admitted under the influence of alcohol. They had both finished their meal and were slowly finishing the bottle in front of them. Maybe, but that's what made you the man you are today. Well. Not such a great success, Madara retorted sarcastically, he's practically failed at everything he's done. Don't say that, Sakura tried to comfort him. What do you know? Madara snarled through grief and alcohol. Did you see your entire family exterminated in front of you? Did you have to look into the whites of your mother's eyes and tell her that three of her children were dead? Did you see your mother die slowly with the despair of not being able to do anything but watch her die? Did you see your brother sacrifice himself for the sake of your clan? Did you fail your brother and father's last wish? No. But I did see my family, my friends, my village, and everyone who mattered disappear before my eyes. Because of the war, Sakura replied softly, staring at the table. They were both the same, shattered and bruised by the cycle of hatred. You, unlike me, still have family. God, I can't believe I'm having a contest to see who suffered the most with you. What were your parents like? Madara sighed, trying to calm down. Unlike you, I was lucky to have loving parents. They were always there for me, especially my mother, Sakura began, thinking of her real mother. Father was afraid of her in a way. If you got your strength from her, I can understand why, Madara laughed gently. And I never said mother wasn't loving, I just didn't see her often. Did your parents love each other? Sakura dared to ask. I don't know what you mean by loving. But I do know that mother was 100% devoted to father, Madara reflected, remembering the rare moments with his mother. Yes, I think mother loved my father from her many speeches. And you, what do you think? Sakura asked, letting the alcohol do the talking for her. The bottle they had drunk was quite strong and at the rate they drank it, it was normal for tongues to wag and boldness to take place. What do you mean? The Uchiha questioned, not understanding. What do you think about what your mother was feeling? I've already answered you. I'm talking about now. Not a month ago, Sakura whispered with an intense look. Madara turned his gaze to the young woman who was slightly red. I'm not blind Madara-san. Madara did not respond to the shinobi's hint. Yes, he had been feeling different for some time, he had sensations he couldn't explain, 
thoughts that puzzled him and urges that he repressed. But was that sentence an invitation? Or was it the alcohol talking for him? The fact remains that both protagonists were having difficulty thinking straight. The contradictions, mixed with what their hearts desired, were driving both people crazy. After all the confessions, discoveries, Madara and Sakura stared at each other and you could see the desire in their eyes. Their breaths were slightly jerky and Sakura's hair was slightly disheveled. With his second arm almost healed, the dark-haired man gave in to his impulses. He was tired of containing himself, of keeping it all inside. He didn't know what it was, but he wanted to find out. He stood up and grabbed Sakura by the waist and pinned her against the wall behind her. He supported her with his strength alone, his pelvis pressed against hers. Her feet barely touched the ground. Madara held one of his hands in hers while the other was on her cheek, caressing her. He could see her eyes flicker slightly at the touch. She wanted it as much as he wanted it. He could feel the softness of her skin as she placed her hand on his chest to caress him hungrily. He brought his lips close to her face, his jet-black gaze almost drowning in an ocean of turquoise, but he stopped short, they were only an inch apart. They could both feel each other's heartbeat, the hot breath with each breath, and above all, the blazing desire in their eyes. No matter how long it takes, no matter what I have to do, you. Madara began, not quite believing his own words, his eyes burning. You'll be mine Sakura-san. So. What are you waiting for? Sakura provoked, she only wanted to feel his warm lips on hers. To drown in all this passion, to feel wanted and perhaps loved. That's all I can think of and has been for a long time. But. So make me your. What's holding you back? Sakura interrupted, unable to take it anymore. Madara moved a little closer, their lips brushing together, but he finally moved to her ear, not without brushing her cheek in the process. She could feel a chill run through her body at the mere touch. I don't want that Sakura. I don't want someone who's under the influence of alcohol. Madara whispered before taking the time to articulate each word. The one I want. Is. My. Sakura. Madara was pulling away, but Sakura wasn't hearing it that way. She was tired of being constantly pushed away. All her life the man she had loved had refused her advances and now that she was offering herself to someone else she was once again rejected. Anger filled Sakura as she grabbed Madara by the collar and pulled him closer to her face. You should be happy. I'm offering you my body without reluctance. Isn't that the only way you see women? Just good at spreading their thighs to satisfy you. Sakura spat resentfully, she was after all only asking for a little love in her world. The Uchiha placed both hands on Sakura's to gently make her let go. I may be a man with base instincts. Madara defended himself as he loosened his grip on the young woman. But I'm not a rapist. Madara turned his back on her and walked with difficulty towards his bed, he leaned against the wall and the furniture. Sakura slid back against the wall and once again began to cry, this time in anger and frustration. Day 131 Pain, those were Sakura's first thoughts as she woke up. She had a horrible headache without understanding why. The slightest sound echoed in her head, the light assaulted her eyes and all she wanted to do was bury her head in a pillow and go back to sleep. She tried to think of what could have caused such a situation, but it wasn't easy with her skull drumming. Then after a moment she remembered drinking alcohol with Madara Uchiha after he had asked his question. But she had the feeling that she was forgetting something, she had the feeling that she was missing something important, but what? So after a long hour of waking up, going back to sleep, and finally waking up with the same headache and fatigue, Sakura decided to get out of bed. Hun, my head. My kingdom for an aspirin, Sakura complained to herself as she got up. Except that the transition to standing was too quick and a dizziness overcame her, forcing her to sit down again. Oh dear. I don't know what I consumed yesterday, but never again. Then, after about ten minutes, Sakura reached her kitchen to fill a large glass of water. She put an aspirin in the glass and tried to recall the events of last night as the tablet slowly dissolved with the effervescence caused by the water's contact with it. She glanced at the table, two bottles of sake. No wonder she had such a headache. 
Then, little by little, memories of the previous day came flooding back to her in fits and starts. The more she remembered of the evening, the more she hoped she hadn't revealed anything too incriminating about the future. It would seem not, but she felt as if she had forgotten something. Something embarrassing, but what? She swallowed her medicine before rubbing her temples with her IRY ninjutsu to speed up the process. Then suddenly, a part of what she had done came back to her memory. Oh no. I didn't dare to do that. Sakura realized, not quite believing it herself. She hadn't remembered the part where Madara had confessed, but the part where she offered herself to him was crystal clear. Probably because of the effect of the anger she felt at that moment. How am I going to look him in the eye? As she wondered how she was going to face him, another thought occurred to her, he had refused her advances. Why had he refused her advances? Why hadn't he taken advantage of her? Any self-respecting man would have jumped at the chance to sleep with a woman, but not him. Was she not attractive to him? No, she had seen his looks, his blushes, his hidden compliments, he should have and could have taken advantage of her. Stop thinking Sakura. You're hurting yourself more than anything else, the young woman reassured herself. Talking to yourself is the first sign of insanity, Madara said as he leaned in the kitchen doorway with his arms crossed. At the sound of his voice, Sakura jerked her head up to make sure she wasn't dreaming. But as soon as she saw him she immediately lowered her head again. From your current state, I don't think you inherited your mother's tolerance for alcohol. A simple grunt came from Sakura's throat and she didn't dare look him in the eye. She was so ashamed of her actions, especially since by Madara's tone he seemed to be quite cold. Please Madara-san, no sarcasm when I feel like I've had a mountain dropped on my head, Sakura said and walked towards the living room without glancing at Madara, too embarrassed. Please sit in your usual place. The Uchiha wanted to confront her, to know if she remembered everything they had said the day before. But did he really want to know that the alcohol was no longer there to encourage him? So it was with his mouth closed that the dark-haired man went to his usual place to continue the restoration of his left arm. Roll up your sleeve, Sakura explained and then rolled up her own. She glanced down at her plans on the easel. Okay, get ready, in three, two, one. The pain was still there, but it wasn't as bad as it had been at first, it was much more bearable. Probably because the tenketsus that Sakura was now targeting were smaller than the first ones. Once the tenketsu regenerated, Sakura turned to her plans to check it off. She was almost done, another ten or so and Madara's arm would be fully restored. After the fourth point of chakra was restored, Madara was getting tired of the heavy silence and the evasive look the young woman gave him. He grabbed Sakura's chin between his fingers and forced her to look him in the eye. However, even though he had placed his face towards hers, her gaze was still evasive, she was ashamed. What's done is done Sakura-san, Madara said coldly with a hard look on his face. There are two things in life that you can't take back, the kunai thrown and the word spoken. It's obvious that you weren't the one making a fool of yourself yesterday. Look at me. Madara ordered. Perhaps it was the shame of her actions, or the imposing presence of the dark-haired man, but Sakura obeyed and looked into his eyes. The only thing you can do after these two things is face the consequences. But. Do you think my brother Izuna was proud of himself the next day when he found out he'd made a fool of himself by courting a flower? No, he was ashamed and that's normal, Madara comforted, inwardly disappointed that she made no reference to his confession. Yesterday you were weak, fragile, distressed, so don't be ashamed and own your actions. Gomen, Sakura whispered and felt like hiding in a mouse hole. I don't want your excuses Sakura-san. As much as I enjoyed some of the things I did last night, I didn't like seeing Sakura acting like a prostitute, Madara added and received a hard look from the young woman. You don't have to give me the stink eye, that's what you were last night. And if I didn't have the respect I have for you, I would have abused you without hesitation. The truth was always hard to hear, especially when it was thrown in your face. But in all that truth, Madara had just stated a second time that he respected her, but also that he would have gladly slept with her and this revelation made Sakura blush. Now Sakura-san. Act like the woman I've grown to love and get that pitiful look off your face. Madara ordered as he let go of the young woman's face. Chapter 19 
From the first time he had laid eyes on this woman when he was on the verge of death, Madara Uchiha had been asking himself questions. And the more time he spent by her side, the more the questions he had took up space in his mind. Doubt, that was what had been plaguing him for a while. As a shinobi, he was used to this world of deception and information gathering towards others. It was even indispensable, to know the other in order to be able to classify him as either an ally or an enemy. And from the moment that the slightest doubt was planted in someone's mind, it could be dangerous. For another feeling then surfaced, suspicion. Stronger than a simple doubt, suspicion led to mistrust. And Madara was currently in this situation, he had doubts and at the same time suspicion towards Sakura Haruno. For a normal person, the situation Madara was in would have been very simple. He had lost a fight, he had been rescued and healed by another shinobi, full stop, and that would be that. But Madara Uchiha wasn't just anyone, he was a very intelligent and logical person. So when something didn't make sense, he did everything in his power to make it rational and irrefutable. Since meeting Sakura Haruno, there were so many illogical things in his brain, so many pieces that he couldn't place correctly. He was missing elements, too many elements. So he tried to analyze, to make patterns in his head, he thought of plots, of totally abracadabratic theories, but without success. For the moment, he had no sufficiently solid leads to form a precise idea of the young woman, thus returning to the same questions of the beginning, who? Why? And for what purpose? Why would someone like her save a shinobi like him? Sure, she had told him she wanted to bring peace. But then why had she had that look of visceral hatred for him when she had appeared out of nowhere to finally save him from certain death? She had justified her desire for peace because the Uchiha clan had always tried to hurt him. Assuming this was true. There was still a problem with this reason. Madara, as clan leader, knew all the members of his lineage. And yet, he had never heard of a Sasuke Uchiha. So, just by that fact alone, the relentlessly logical shinobi wondered, was she lying to him? Or had a member of his clan pretended to be dead in the past? Moreover, the young woman's knowledge of the Sharingan gave weight to this other theory. One had to be close to an Uchiha to know what she knew about the clan's dojitsu, assuming that she knew more than she had deigned to show and reveal to him so far. This series of reflections and analyses led the man to establish this first double question. One had a member of his clan deserted and fathered this Sasuke Uchiha or was Sakura lying to him about the existence of this Uchiha? Then Madara couldn't help but turn his thoughts to this first point, the origin of her skills. Who? Who in all the elemental nations could have such skills and no one knew about it? No one in the entire ninja world had ever mentioned IRY ninjutsu, no one had ever mentioned a woman with legendary strength who could break through cliffs. He had also never heard of a doctor by the name of Tsunade who from what Sakura had said seemed better than her. Such a woman would have been the talk of the town. And even if she was a woman, her abilities could not have remained hidden it would have come to light and one thing led to another and a nobleman or even a daimi would have hired her services. And by extension, the shinobi world would have known about it and would certainly not have let such potential go free. But according to Sakura, her mother Tsunade was a very discreet person, capable of being forgotten like a shinobi. Another troubling point was that the only person he knew by the name of Tsunade was Hashirama's offspring, and it couldn't be the Senju's offspring because she was still far too young. Nevertheless, even if he hadn't heard of Sakura's mother, to have such knowledge one had to experiment, practice. Or else. Madara came to think that Sakura's mother might have come from another, previously unknown continent. A hypothesis that could explain the material inventions in Sakura's house. This led the Uchiha to ask the second question. 2. Where did Tsunade Haruno come from and why had no one ever heard of her? Still immersed in his analysis of the few elements in his possession, the Uchiha was doubtful. One other thing didn't add up, her sensei. From what little he had seen of her, Sakura Haruno was a dangerous person. She had been very well trained in the manipulation of the shinobi arts. During their training he had made this observation, she was a person based mainly on dodging, which was understandable after reading her book. And just as the jeweler knew how to shape a rough diamond to make it valuable, it took a quality teacher to train a quality ninja. So why had he never heard of this Kakashi? Furthermore, 
This one seemed to be friends with Sakura's parents, so could it be that they had been childhood friends? Or if he considered the hypothesis that they came from another continent, perhaps they came from the same place. These questions led to the third question. 3. Who was Kakashi and where did he come from? Once the questions about the young woman's origins were clear in his mind, Madara wondered again, and the subject that had caught his attention was the frontal seal of Mito Uzumaki. Sakura had told him that the Uzumaki weren't the only ones who mastered the art of Finjutsu. But Madara still remembered how proud Mito had been when she had completed the design of her frontal seal. She hadn't wanted to tell him what the effects were, but knowing Mito's reputation for Finjutsu, it could only be great. So how could Sakura Hirono have such a seal of Finjutsu? Especially since it seemed more powerful than Mito's. No, it didn't seem, it was much more powerful. He had used his Sharingan to memorize the image of her seal. Had Sakura been inspired by Mito's seal? Or the other way around? Sakura had told him that she had traveled a lot, she could have left some work about the Finjutsu seal on one of her trips and Mito would have found it and been inspired to create his own. Looking through Sakura's library, he found numerous Finjutsu manuals, attesting that she had really taught herself the discipline and above all proving that she had not lied to him about this detail. So she was an autodidact. Madara was very impressed. For that meant that she was probably a virtuoso in this field, just as Mito was too. But if the creation of the Finjutsu seal was the result of stolen knowledge, regardless of whether it was practiced by one or the other, another question jumped out at Madara, Kage Bunshin. How could Sakura even know of the existence of this jutsu created by Toborama Senju? He was reputed to be one of the most secretive people in regards to the creation of his jutsu. And Madara was definite. There was no way to be mistaken, the condensation of chakra, the release of the flows, the cloud of smoke, everything matched. Sakura had used the Kage Bunshin technique. This led to the fourth question. For was Sakura from Kanoha no Sato and was she secretly affiliated with the Senju? This theory of Senju affiliation was slightly reinforced by his suspicion of her political knowledge. She was acting like a leader while being subtle. Normally a woman was not supposed to have this ease with words to stand up to politicians, let alone a daimi and a clan leader. Only princesses in the style of Mito Uzumaki were trained in this way, as they were destined to sit alongside very influential people. Yet Sakura claimed to come from a backwater, but her words, her gestures, her vocabulary, her way of speaking, her handling of words and subtleties, all these little details were worthy of seasoned politicians, even clan leaders or Akage. She must have been in the business to know so much and to be so comfortable. Madara came to this conclusion she had too much experience in this field to be just a normal citizen and even more so than just a first-rate shinobi. So, assuming the young woman came from Kanoha, would she be as good as the elite ninja? As young and as high-ranking? All of these elements, assembled into the beginnings of a tangible logic and because of or thanks to his paranoia, Madara immediately came to this thought, that Sakura was manipulating him. Manipulation was an almost commonplace phenomenon, everyone manipulated everyone else. What remained was to find out why Sakura was manipulating him. To bring peace? A likely hypothesis. But what else? What other reason could push the young woman to use this stratagem with him? He had this deep intuition that she was manipulating him, but he couldn't quite figure out the reason. And the more the Uchiha thought about it, the more things came to his mind, did he really want to dig deeper and find out the young woman's objectives? And if he continued along this path, what would he discover? These last questions formed the ultimate suspicion in Madara's mind, so much so that he frowned slightly as his mind formulated this. 5. Is Sakura Haruno manipulating me? If so, is she doing it? He was missing a lot of elements, there were too many unanswered questions, but little by little he was getting information. Madara was confident. Patience was one of his qualities, for it allowed him to analyze the data he would continue to collect on the young woman. And when the time came, he would finally know everything he needed to know about her. It was only a matter of time. Give it time. Day 178. It had been almost six months since Madara had been treated and he was almost completely recovered. Sakura's training combined with her daily care had done wonders. The only thing he didn't have anymore was his right eye, destroyed by the Izanagi. 
Speaking of his right eye, Madara was currently lying on the floor, his head resting in the middle of Sakura's legs, who was positioned cross-legged. She had put a pillow over her legs making the position more comfortable for her patient. A book was open at her side and she had tied her hair back so that her face was clear. Are you sure you can do this? Madara asked in a not so reassuring tone before receiving a septic look from Sakura. Are you really having doubts after all the things I did to your body? Need I remind you that I performed open heart surgery, made you walk again and regenerated the chakra system in your left arm? Then yes, I'm sure I can do that, Sakura retorted, she didn't like people doubting her abilities. Don't blame me for having doubts when it comes to restoring Jutsu, Madara defended himself. It's complicated to explain, Sakura said as she took one last look at her book on ocular anatomy. Try as you might, it's not like I'm the last of the idiots, Madara encouraged, he was far from being a mindless idiot. What do you want to know? How do I regenerate an eye? Or a jutsu? The young woman asked as she stared at Madara's able pupil. I already know you're able to restore. By what miracle I don't know, but how do you recreate a non-existent jutsu? Madara questioned, for after all, Sakura had told him that his Sharingan was simply gone. Ah. I see what your fear is. You're afraid that if I'm able to restore the Sharingan to you, what's to stop me from doing it to anyone? The young woman concluded, and it was quite understandable. After a slight nod from the clan leader Sakura continued. So, I'll go into pure theory Madara-san and I'll ask you not to ask me any questions about the origin of this knowledge. I'll do my best, Madara agreed reluctantly. In studying the human body, chakra and finjutsu, I realized one thing, everything is connected, Sakura began as she searched for a way to explain the principle of DNA without clearly telling him what it was. Let's take the example of a woman who gets pregnant. Apart from living her life, eating a lot more, having constraints during most of her pregnancy and hormones completely out of whack, what does this woman do to conceive the child? Absolutely nothing. But then again. It is the human body that conceives the child, not the woman herself. Her body does it by itself, just as your heart beats without you having to command it, you also breathe unconsciously. Because the body does it by itself, Sakura continued, once again loving to share her knowledge. Why is that? Madara asked, not seeing any connection at the moment. That's right Madara-san, Sakura said with a smile, you asked the right question, why? Because the human body is designed in the same way as a formula of finjutsu. Every living thing is a formula of design that makes a cat a cat, a tree a tree. And in the case of the Uchiha clan, you have in your formula of finjutsu, a part that allows you to have the Sharingan and it is this part that I will just have to restore. The clan leader was once again stunned by what he was hearing. This woman's intelligence was truly frightening and so was her knowledge. And to reassure you, I never said anything about creation, I am using your formula as a medium to restore itself. I am unable to make the Sharingan for a third party, Sakura reassured her as she saw the dark-haired man let out a slight sigh of contentment, but. Transplantation is feasible. What is transplantation? Taking a diseased organ and replacing it with a healthy one. Basically, if I wanted to I could take out your blind eye and put one of mine in its place and you'd be able to see perfectly, Sakura said, remembering Madara ripping out Kakashi's eye and transplanting it into himself in an instant. It made her think that during his 80-year stay in a cave, Madara must have studied a lot. The same thing can be done in reverse, she added slowly. I'd like you to make me a promise, Sakura-san, Madara asked intently. I'm listening, the young woman said without really accepting. Don't reveal this information to anyone. There are unfortunately many things I know that the world is not ready to hear. Don't worry about it, I'm discussing it with you because the opportunity is there and you're a concerned person, Sakura concluded before gently placing both her hands near her patient's right eye. Let me concentrate now. She concentrated her IRY ninjutsu and prepared to activate her new technique on Madara's pupil. She had already repaired the retina as well as the chakra flow within the organ. Now she had to repair everything that was destroyed, the pupil, the iris, the lens, and the hyaloid membrane. All these elements that allowed his to see, but also to have the Sharingan. 
so that Madara would not feel any pain during the regeneration, she decided to stop the flow of nerve impulses between the optic nerve and the brain during her procedure, without causing any damage to the optic nerve. Then she closed her eyes and remained like that for many minutes, which turned into an hour in total silence. Madara took the opportunity to look at her and appreciate her facial features. He loved to see that face so much in concentration. And in his silent contemplation, a question appeared in his mind, what did he feel for this woman? Until he met Sakura, he had never been in contact and relationship with a person of the female sex for long. But since he had met the pink-haired woman, he had had time to get to know her, or at least to learn to do so. He had discovered a woman with many facets and skills that reminded him a little of himself. However, they were two opposites, when he was intransigent, she was more conciliatory. When he was cold and impassive towards others, she was gentle and compassionate towards the human race. When he wished to use brute force to subdue the world, she wished to take a more subtle approach to bring the world to see as she did. These examples of opposites between the two protagonists proved to the Uchiha that Sakura remained a woman like any other, by nature, she favored benevolent and altruistic methods. But the dark-haired man knew that she could act just as differently depending on the circumstances, especially when it came to protecting her loved ones. He had seen it in action, Sakura had not hesitated to kill. Whether it was during the attack on the bandits who wanted to harm the people of the village, or when she eradicated Black Zetsu at the Valley of the End without an ounce of hesitation. But still, if they were so opposite in their ways, how could they tolerate each other, or even like each other? Madara didn't know what love meant, he simply hadn't learned to love. However, as time went on with the young woman, the man had remembered some of his mother's teachings on the subject, and they now made sense to him. It had led him to tell Sakura that she would be his, though she couldn't remember. She was the first woman who matched him, who equaled him, and who had confronted him with sensations he still found hard to understand. So, despite his doubts and suspicions, Madara asked himself this question, is this what loving someone is all about? All his thoughts were interrupted when he felt a pain in his right eye. Then Sakura sighed and opened her eyes as well. Tell me when the pain in your eye goes away, Sakura asked. Why does it only hurt now? Madara questioned as he kept his eyelid closed from the pain. Because I've restored the flow of nerve impulses to your optic nerve. It is processing the information it receives and sending it back to the brain, which analyses it. That's why you're in pain now, the young woman explained. The pain is starting to disappear, the Uchiha said after a good minute, still impressed by the young woman's explanation. Once it's completely gone, open it gently. After another minute, Madara finally opened his right eye and his heart was overwhelmed with emotion. The darkness was gone, the light, though bright, entered his eye again, and a smile came to his lips. From your reaction, it seems that you have regained some of your sight Madara-san, Sakura expressed pleased with herself. Hi, though it's very strange, nothing is clear. I feel like I have a veil like I'm trying to open my eyes in murky water, explained the dark-haired man who remembered this sensation perfectly as he had become almost blind after the excessive use of his Manjiki Sharingan. Your vision is blurry. Close your left eye and look in my direction, Sakura said and put her IRY ninjutsu laden hand down once more. And now? A little bit better, Madara admitted. Well, it'll be a while before you can see again. Of course you're forbidden to channel chakra into this eye or you'll ruin any progress, the young woman warned. I understand. Day 180 Autumn was almost over and winter was fast approaching. The crops had been harvested for many weeks in many countries. The trees had lost all their leaves, but no snow had fallen yet. Madara was currently standing next to a brazier looking out, deep in thought. He was thinking about what to do while waiting for the war and what to do to give them strategic advantages. Sakura-san, Madara announced, turning his gaze to the young woman. She was sitting at her desk, all the papers seemed to have been put away and many kanai had taken their place. The desk was literally covered with weapons, an inkwell and a brush. Yes Madara-san. Sakura asked as she traced seals on one of the kanai before sealing it in a small burst of blue chakra. We've already discussed this with the Daimi and with each other, but I really think we need to act before this war breaks out, Madara announced as he watched one kanai disappear, sealed in another. 
Why is that? Because we need to contact the most vulnerable countries, the weakest. And we need to get the civilians, even the ninjas, to start coming to Haiwa. Or at least, let them hear about it, so they can come by themselves when they're in despair, Madara explained as he saw a new kunai disappear as well, sealed in the same kunai. Especially with winter approaching, that still gives us some time to act. Very few people are stupid enough to declare a war in winter. It would be counterproductive. Wouldn't it be dangerous to go to vassals? They'll probably be quick to report to their superiors what we're doing, contra Sakura, who couldn't see any other way than what the man was proposing. I didn't say to reveal my identity, I said to plant the idea in all of them, Madara replied as she watched Sakura set aside the weapon she had sealed five other weapons in. I don't know Madara-san. The young woman said as she stopped what she was doing. Sakura-san. Do you trust me? Madara was currently standing in front of her desk with his arms crossed. No, I don't. Good answer, but if you save me to bring peace on the premise that that was my basic goal, you should trust me on this, the dark-haired man retorted before taking a seat and settling right in front of her. Just as I trusted you to take care of me, I'd like you to trust me with the war. Sakura couldn't deny that he was right about that. She had never been a born leader, she had never led a team in her life. Sure, she'd always been on the front lines supporting her comrades, but strategizing for war was something else entirely. Knowing how to give orders in any situation, knowing what to do at the right time, is a complicated thing and Madara had been raised to do just that. Well. I'm listening, Sakura finally relented. Seeing the young woman finally agree, Madara got up to fetch a scroll from the bookcase. He placed it on the desk and took the brush gently from Sakura's hands. He quickly drew a map of the elemental lands from his memories of six months ago. The Uchiha clan and the Senju clan stood out from the rest of the world because of our abilities. From these two clans came four game-changing individuals that many fear throughout the world, Madara explained as he added more details to the map under Sakura's watchful eye. Hashirama and Tobarama on the Senju side, then Izuna and myself on the Uchiha side. The four of us used to shake the world, but with only Tobarama alive in the eyes of the world that is changing. Tobarama isn't the invading type is he? Sakura asked, referring to what was in the history books. But she had also learned with time and experience, history is written by the victors. Tobarama's a first-class asshole who I'd gladly slit his throat if I had the chance, but he's not a conflict maker, Madara ranted angrily as she remembered him killing his brother. So we're going to assume that a potential alliance between the other four great countries will be made against the Land of Fire. Don't you think the Land of Fire might have an ally in all this? Amina gently Sakura who knew who would be against whom in this first war. Besides Yuzushio? I don't see. The Land of Water has no strategic advantage in attacking the Land of Fire, in fact it would be the opposite, it would be in their best interest to form an alliance with Kanoha to create trade agreements. Besides, what's to stop the other three big countries from attacking them once the land of fire has fallen, the young woman explained, pointing to the map with her index finger. Your arguments are valid, but it's only a hypothesis. In any case, we can expect clandestine guerrilla raids in all the small countries surrounding the land of fire. Apart from our country and the samurai, who have a neutral status, the others will pay the price, Madara continued, we'll have to act like the other countries to start recruiting here. Make the enemy believe that his target is aware of his actions. This will create doubt and buy us time at the same time. I am sure that small villages are already being targeted by attacks in the greatest secrecy. This is one of the reasons why I want us to act on the ground from now on. But we'll kill two birds with one stone, we'll also loot, create situations to our advantage and cause havoc on all sides, he said clearly. I don't like this. This is not the time to have scruples Sakura-san, you and I both know the horrors of war and if my method of force didn't work. We have to use other means, and there's nothing like ruining a country from the inside, Madara explained showing one of his unscrupulous sides. Unlike Sakura who wanted to save mankind, Madara was a being devoid of emotion and pity when it came to winning a war. He did what had to be done to accomplish his goals. The young woman remained silent, allowing the brunette to continue. Remember who I am Sakura-san, if I had to kill a man to save my comrades I would. 
If I had to kill one woman to save ten I would. If I had to kill a child to stop a disease, I would. If I have to raise an entire country to the ground to bring peace. I will do it without remorse. Unveiled Madara, and in that moment Sakura thought she saw a piece of the Madara of her time. And it was as she heard him speak that she wondered if she had succeeded in changing him at all or not at all. But I owe you, he added in a calm voice. Which means? Sakura asked hopefully the man would change for the better. That I won't lump everyone together. Because you didn't do it with me. Maybe you manipulated me, but in a way you reached out to me and made me understand certain things, Madara explained, and after six months of thinking, his thinking was bound to change. Every self-respecting person evolves through life because of the events they go through. I'll be more accommodating. But don't forget that it takes men like me to do the dirty work, Sakura-san. I thank you. Finish what you have to do, we'll leave tomorrow, Madara said before standing up and walking back to the window door to look out. He then turned his gaze to his armor lying in the corner with his gun by attached to a comma. Sakura-san, Madara called as he saw his armor. Yes, he said. Could you make me a storage seal on my forearm so I can seal my weapons in? This weapon is too recognizable and I do not wish to part with it, explained the dark-haired man who had a great affection for this instrument of death. It was a family heirloom that was passed down from father to son. Of course, come here, the shinobi replied before Madara came back to her with his sleeve rolled up. She grabbed her brush and ink and set about executing the brunette's request, his storage seal. As she drew, Madara felt a new sense of purpose come over her for some time. He had lost all hope when he discovered that he could no longer walk and fight. Then hope had taken the place of despair thanks to Sakura and her care, and now a new motivation had come to him, the opportunity to succeed in bringing peace.